Book Two, Chapter Nine of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Search of the Castaways or the Children of Captain Grant by Jules Verne. Book Two, Chapter Nine: A Country of Paradoxes. It was the twenty-third of December, eighteen sixty-four. A dull, damp, dreary month in the northern hemisphere, but on the Australian continent it might be called June. The hottest season of the year had already commenced, and the sun's rays were almost tropical when Lord Glenarvan started on his new expedition. Most fortunately, the thirty-seventh parallel did not cross the immense deserts, inaccessible regions, which have cost many martyrs to science already. Glenarvan could never have encountered them. He had only to do with the southern part of Australia, that is, with the narrow portion of the province of Adelaide, with the whole of Victoria, and with the top of the reverse triangle which forms New South Wales. It is scarcely sixty-two miles from Cape Bernoulli to the frontiers of Victoria. It was not above two days' march, and Ireton reckoned on their sleeping next night at Apsley, the most westerly town of Victoria. The commencement of a journey is always marked by ardor, both in the horses and the horsemen. This is well enough in the horsemen, but if the horses are to go far, their speed must be moderated and their strength husbanded. It was therefore fixed that the average journey every day should not be more than from twenty-five to thirty miles. Besides, the pace of the horses must be regulated by the slower pace of the bullocks, truly mechanical engines. Which lose in time what they gain in power. The wagon, with its passengers and provisions, was the very centre of the caravan, the moving fortress. The horsemen might act as scouts, but must never be far away from it. As no special marching order had been agreed upon, everybody was at liberty to follow his inclinations within certain limits. The hunters could scour the plain. Amiable folks could talk to the fair occupants of the wagon, and philosophers could philosophize. Paganel, who was all three combined, had to be and was everywhere at once. The march across Adelaide presented nothing of any particular interest. A succession of low hills, rich in dust, a long stretch of what they call in Australia bush, several prairies covered with small prickly bush, considered a great dainty by the ovine tribe. Embraced many miles, here and there they noticed a species of sheep peculiar to New Holland, sheep with pigs' heads, feeding between the posts of the telegraph line recently made between Adelaide and the coast. Up to this time, there had been a singular resemblance in the country to the monotonous plains of the Argentine pampas. There was the same grassy flat soil, the same sharply defined horizon against the sky. McNabs declared that they had never changed countries, but Paganel told him to wait, and he would soon see a difference. And on the faith of this assurance, marvelous things were expected by the whole party. In this fashion, after a march of sixty miles in two days, the caravan reached the parish of Apsley, the first town in the province of Victoria, in the Wimmera district. The wagon was put up at the Crown Inn. Supper was soon smoking on the table. It consisted solely of mutton served up in various ways. They all ate heartily, but talked more than they ate, eagerly asking Paganel questions about the wonders of the country they were just beginning to traverse. The amiable geographer needed no pressing and told them first that this part of it was called Australia Felix. Wrongly named, he continued. It had better have been called rich, for it is true of countries as individuals that riches do not make happiness. Thanks to her gold mines, Australia has been abandoned to wild, devastating adventurers. You will come across them when we reach the gold fields. Is not the colony of Victoria of but a recent origin? Asked Lady Glenarvan. Yes, ma'am. It only numbers thirty years of existence. It was on the sixth of June, eighteen thirty-five, on a Tuesday. At a quarter past seven in the evening, put in the major, who delighted in teasing the Frenchman about his precise dates. No, at ten minutes past seven, 
replied the geographer gravely, that Batman and Falkner first began a settlement at Fort Philip, the bay on which the large city of Melbourne now stands. For fifteen years the colony was part of New South Wales, and recognized Sydney as the capital. But in 1851 she was declared independent, and took the name of Victoria. "'And has greatly increased in prosperity since then, I believe,' said Glenarvan. "'Judge for yourself, my noble friend,' replied Paganel. "'Here are the numbers given by the last statistics, and let McNabbs say as he likes I know nothing more eloquent than statistics.' "'Go on,' said the Major. "'Well, then, in 1836, the colony of Port Phillips had 222 inhabitants. "'Today the province of Victoria numbers 550,000. Seven millions of vines produce annually 121,000 gallons of wine. "'There are 103,000 horses spreading over the plains, "'and 675,272 horned cattle graze in her wide-stretching pastures.' "'Is there not also a certain number of pigs?' inquired McNabbs. "'Yes, Major, seventy-nine thousand six hundred and twenty-five. "'And how many sheep?' Seven million one hundred and fifteen thousand nine hundred and forty-three, McNabbs.' "'Including the one we are eating at this moment?' "'No, without counting that, since it is three parts devoured.' "'Bravo, Monsieur Paganel!' exclaimed Lady Helena, laughing heartily. "'It must be owned you are posted up in geographical questions, "'and my cousin McNabbs need not try and find you tripping. "'It is my calling, ma'am, to know this sort of thing, "'and to give you the benefit of my information when you please. "'You may therefore believe me when I tell you "'that wonderful things are in store for you in this strange country.' "'It does not look like it at present,' said McNabbs, "'on purpose to tease Paganel.' "'Just you wait, impatient Major,' was his rejoinder. "'You have hardly put your foot on the frontier, when you turn round and abuse it. "'Well, I say, and I say again, and will always maintain, "'that this is the most curious country on the earth. "'Its formation and nature, and products and climate, "'and even its future disappearance, have amazed, "'and are now amazing, and will amaze, all the savants in the world. "'Think, my friends, of a continent, the margin of which— instead of the centre, rose out of the waters originally like a gigantic ring, which encloses, perhaps, in its centre, a sea partly evaporated, the waves of which are drying up daily, where humidity does not exist, either in the air or in the soil, where the trees lose their bark every year instead of their leaves, where the leaves present their sides to the sun and not their face, and consequently give no shade, where the wood is often incombustible where good-sized stones are dissolved by the rain, where forests are low, and the grasses gigantic, where the animals are strange, where quadrupeds have beaks, like the echinada or ornithornicus, and naturalists have been obliged to create a special order for them, called monotremes, where the kangaroos leap on unequal legs, and sheep have pigs' heads, where foxes fly about from tree to tree, where swans are black, where rats make nests, where the bower-bird opens her reception-rooms to receive visits from her feathered friends, where the birds astonish the imagination by the variety of their notes and their aptness, where one bird serves for a clock and another makes a sound like a postulan cracking of a whip, and a third imitates a knife-grinder, and a fourth the motion of a pendulum, where one laughs when the sun rises, and another cries when the sun sets. Oh, strange, illogical country, land of paradoxes and anomalies! If ever there was one on earth, the learned botanist Grimard was right when he said, There is that Australia, a sort of parody, or rather a defiance of universal laws, in the face of the rest of the world. Paganel's tirade was poured forth in the most impetuous manner, and seemed as if it were never coming to an end. The eloquent secretary of the Geographical Society was no longer master of himself. He went on and on, gesticulating furiously, and brandishing his fork to the imminent danger of his neighbours. But at last his voice was drowned in a thunder of applause, and he managed to stop. 
Certainly, after such an enumeration of Australian peculiarities, he might have been left in peace, but the Major said in the coolest tone possible, "'And is that all, Paganel?' "'No, indeed not,' rejoined the Frenchman, with renewed vehemence. "'What?' exclaimed Lady Helena. "'There are more wonders still in Australia?' "'Yes, madam, it's climate. It is even stranger than its productions.' "'Is it possible?' they all said. "'I am not speaking of the hygienic qualities of the climate,' continued Paganel, "'rich as it is in oxygen and poor in azote. "'There are no damp winds, because the trade winds blow regularly on the coasts, "'and most diseases are unknown, from typhus to measles and chronic affections. "'Still, that is no small advantage,' said Glenarvan. "'No doubt, but I am not referring to that.' but to one quality it has which is incomparable. And what is that? You will never believe me. Yes, we will, exclaimed his auditors, their curiosity aroused by this preamble. Well, it is... It is what? It is a moral regeneration. A moral regeneration? Yes, replied the savant, in a tone of conviction. Here metals do not get rust on them by exposure to the air, nor men. Here the pure, dry atmosphere whitens everything rapidly, both linen and soles. The virtue of the climate must have been well known in England when they determined to send their criminals here to be reformed. "'What? Do you mean to say the climate has really any such influence?' said Lady Helena. "'Yes, madam, both on animals and men.' "'You are not joking, Monsieur Paganel?' "'I am not, madam.' The horses and the cattle here are of incomparable docility. You see it? It is impossible, but it is a fact. And the convicts, transported into this reviving, salubrious air, become regenerated in a few years. Philanthropists know this. In Australia, all natures grow better. But what is to become of you, then, Monsieur Paganel? In this privileged country, you, who are so good already said Lady Helena. What will you turn out? Excellent, madame, just excellent, and that's all. End of Book Two, Chapter Nine Book Two, Chapter Ten of In Search of the Castaways This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Search of the Castaways, or the Children of Captain Grant, by Jules Verne, Book Two, Chapter Ten, An Accident. The next day, the 24th of December, they started at daybreak. The heat was already considerable, but not unbearable and the road was smooth and good, and allowed the cavalcade to make speedy progress. In the evening they camped on the banks of the White Lake, the waters of which are brackish and undrinkable. Jacques Paganel was obliged to own that the name of this lake was a complete misnomer, for the waters were no more white than the Black Sea is black, or the Red Sea red, or the Yellow River yellow, or the Blue Mountains blue. However, he argued and disputed the point with all the amir propre of a geographer, but his reasoning made no impression. Mr. Oblinet prepared the evening meal with his accustomed punctuality, and after this was dispatched the travellers disposed themselves for the night in the wagon and in the tent, and were soon sleeping soundly, notwithstanding the melancholy howl of the dingoes, the jackals of Australia. A magnificent plain, thickly covered with chrysanthemums, stretched out beyond the lake, and Glenarvan and his friends would gladly have explored its beauties when they awoke next morning, but they had to start. As far as the eye could reach, nothing was visible but one stretch of prairie enameled with flower in all the freshness and abundance of spring. The blue flowers of the slender-leaved flax, combined with the bright hues of the scarlet acanthus, a flower peculiar to the country. A few cassowaries were bounding over the plain, but it was impossible to get near them. The Major was fortunate enough, though, however, to hit one very rare animal with a ball in the leg. This was the jabiru, a species which is fast disappearing, the gigantic crane of the English colonies. This winged creature was five feet high, and his wide, conical 
extremely pointed beak measured eighteen inches in length. The violet and purple tints of his head contrasted vividly with the glossy green of his neck and the dazzling whiteness of his throat and the bright red of his long legs. Nature seemed to have exhausted in its favor all the primitive colors on her palette. Great admiration was bestowed on this bird, and the major spoil would have borne the honors of the day had not Robert come across an animal a few miles further on and bravely killed it. It was a shapeless creature, half porcupine, half anteater, a sort of unfinished animal belonging to the first stage of creation. A long, glutinous, extensible tongue hung out of his jaws in search of the ants which formed its principal food. "'It is an echidna,' said Paganel. "'Have you ever seen such a creature?' "'It is horrible,' replied Glenarvan. "'Horrible enough, but curious, and, what's more, peculiar to Australia. One might search for it in vain in any other part of the world.' Naturally enough, the geographer wished to preserve this interesting species of monotremata, and wanted to stow it away in the luggage, but M. Oblinet resented the idea so indignantly that the savant was obliged to abandon his project. About four o'clock in the afternoon, John Mangles descried an enormous column of smoke about three miles off, gradually overspreading the whole horizon. What could be the cause of this phenomenon? Paganel was inclined to think it was some description of meteor, and his lively imagination was already in search of an explanation, when Ayrton cut short all his conjectures summarily by announcing that the cloud of dust was caused by a drove of cattle on the road. The quartermaster proved right, for as the cloud came nearer, quite a chorus of bleedings and neighings and bellowings escaped from it, mingled with the loud tones of a human voice in the shape of cries, whistles, and vociferations. Presently a man came out of the cloud. This was the leader-in-chief of the four-footed army. Glenarvan advanced toward him. The friendly relations were speedily established between them. The leader, or to give him his proper designation, the stock-keeper, was part owner of the drove. His name was Sam Mashall, and he was on his way from the eastern provinces to Portland Bay. The drove numbered twelve thousand seventy-five head in all, or one thousand bullocks, eleven thousand sheep, and seventy-five horses. All these had been bought in the Blue Mountains in a poor, lean condition, and were going to be fatted up on the rich pasture-lands of southern Australia, and sold again at a great profit. Sam Matchell expected to get pounds, two on each bullock, and ten shilling on every sheep which would bring him in pounds three thousand seven hundred and fifty this was doing good business but what patience and energy were required to conduct such a restive stubborn lot to their destination and what fatigues must have to be endured truly the gain was hardly earned sam matchell told his history in a few words while the drove continued their march among the groves of mimosas lady helena and mary and the rest of the party seated themselves under the shade of a wide-spreading gum-tree and listened to his recital it was seven months since sam metchell had started he had gone at the rate of ten miles a day and his interminable journey would last three months longer his assistants in the laborious task comprised twenty dogs and thirty men five of whom were blacks and very serviceable in tracking up any stray beasts Six wagons made up the rear guard. All the men were armed with stock whips, the handles of which are eighteen inches long, and the lash nine feet, and they move about among the ranks, bringing refractory animals back into order, while the dogs, the light cavalry of the regiment, preserved discipline in the wings. The travellers were struck with the admirable arrangement of the drove. The different stock were kept apart, for wild sheep and bullocks would not have got on together at all. The bullocks would never have grazed where the sheep had passed along, and consequently they had to go first, divided into two battalions. Five regiment of sheep followed, in charge of twenty men, and last of all came the horses. Sam Matchell drew the attention of his auditors to the fact that the real guides of the drove were neither the men nor the dogs, but the oxen themselves, beasts of superior intelligence, recognized as leaders by their congenitors. They advanced in front with perfect gravity, choosing the best route by instinct, and fully alive to their claim to respect. 
Indeed, they were obliged to be studied and humoured in everything, for the whole drove obeyed them implicitly. If they took it into their heads to stop, it was a matter of necessity to yield to their good pleasure, for not a single animal would move a step till these leaders gave the signal to set off. Sundry details added by the stock-keeper completed the history of this expedition, worthy of being written, if not commended, by Xenophon himself. As long as the troop marched over the plains, it was well enough. There was little difficulty or fatigue. The animals fed as they went along, and slaked their thirst at the numerous creeks that watered the plains, sleeping at night and making good progress in the day, always obedient and tractable to the dogs. But when they had to go through great forests and groves of eucalyptus and mimosas, the difficulties increased. Platoons, battalions, and regiments got all mixed together or scattered, and it was work of time to collect them again. Should a leader unfortunately go astray, he had to be found, cost what it might, on pain of general disbandment, and the blacks were often long days in quest of him, before their search was successful. During the heavy rains the lazy beasts refused to stir, and when violent storms chanced to occur, the creatures became almost mad with terror, and were seized with wild, disorderly panic. However, by dint of energy and ambition, the stock-keeper triumphed over these difficulties, incessantly renewed though they were. He kept steadily on, mile after mile, of plains and woods and mountains, lay behind. But in addition to all his other qualities, there was one higher than all that he specially needed when they came to rivers. This was patience, patience that could stand any trial, and not only could hold out for hours and days but for weeks. The stock-keeper would be himself forced to wait on the banks of a stream that might have been crossed at once. There was nothing to hinder but the obstinacy of the herd. The bullocks would taste the water and turn back. The sheep fled in all directions, afraid to brave the liquid element. The stock-keeper hoped when night came he might manage them better, but they still refused to go forward. The rams were dragged in by force, but the sheep would not follow. They tried what thirst they could, by keeping them without drink for several days, but when they were brought to the river again they simply quenched their thirst, and declined a more intimate acquaintance with the water. The next expedient employed was to carry all the lambs over, hoping the mothers would be drawn after them, moved by their cries, but the lambs might bleat as pitifully as they liked, the mothers never stirred. Sometimes this state of affairs would last a whole month, and the stock-keeper would be driven to his wit's end by his bleeding, bellowing, neighing army. Then all of a sudden one fine day, without rhyme or reason, a detachment would take it to their heads to make a start across, and the only difficulty now was to keep the whole herd from rushing helter-skelter after them. The wildest confusion set in among the ranks, and numbers of the animals were drowned in the passage. Such was the narrative of Sam Matchell. During its recital a considerable part of the troop had filed past in good order. It was time for him to return to his place at their head, that he might be able to choose the best pasturage. Taking leave of Lord Glenarvan, he sprang on a capital horse of the native breed, that one of his men held waiting for him, and after shaking hands cordially with everybody all round, took his departure. A few minutes later nothing was visible of the stock-keeper and his troop but a cloud of dust. The wagon resumed its course in the opposite direction, and did not stop again till they halted for the night at the foot of Mount Talbot. Paganel made the judicious observation that it was the 25th of December, the Christmas day so dear to English hearts. But the steward had not forgotten it, and an appetizing meal was soon ready under the tent, for which he deserved and received warm compliments from the guests. Indeed, M. Oblanet had quite excelled himself on this occasion. He produced from his stores such an array of European dishes as is seldom seen in the Australian desert. Reindeer hams, slices of salt beef, smoked salmon, oat cakes and barley meal scones, tea ad libitum, and whisky in abundance, and several bottles of port, composed this astonishing meal. The little party might have thought themselves in the grand dining-hall of Malcolm Castle in the heart of the highlands of Scotland. The next day, at eleven a.m., the wagon reached the banks of the Wimera, on the 143rd meridian. 
the river half a mile in width wound its limpid course between tall rows of gum trees and acacias magnificent specimens of the myrtacea among others the metroside ross speciosa fifteen feet high with long drooping branches adorned with red flowers thousands of birds the lories and greenfinches and gold-winged pigeons not to speak of the noisy parroquets flew about in the green branches below on the bosom of the water were a couple of shy and unapproachable black swans this rara avis of the australian rivers soon disappeared among the windings of the wimmera which water the charming landscape in the most capricious manner the wagon stopped on a grassy bank the long fringes of which dipped in the rapid current there was neither raft nor bridge but cross over they must ayrton looked about for a practicable ford about a quarter of a mile up the water seemed shallower and it was here they determined to try and pass over the soundings in different parts showed a depth of three feet only so that the wagon might safely enough venture i suppose there is no other way of fording the river said glenarvan to the quartermaster no my lord but the passage does not seem dangerous we shall manage it shall lady glenarvan and miss grant get out of the wagon not at all my bullocks are sure-footed and you may rely on me for keeping them straight very well ayrton i can trust you the horsemen surrounded the ponderous vehicle and all stepped boldly into the current generally when wagons have to ford rivers they have empty casks slung all round them to keep them floating on the water but they had no such swimming belt with them on this occasion and they could only depend on the sagacity of the animals and the prudence of ayrton who directed the team the major and the two sailors were some feet in advance glenarvan and john mangles went at the sides of the wagon ready to lend any assistance the fair travellers might require and paganel and robert brought up the rear all went well until they reached the middle of the wimmera but then the hollow deepened and the water rose to the middle of the wheels the bullocks were in danger of losing their footing and dragging with them the oscillating vehicle ayrton devoted himself to his task courageously he jumped into the water and hanging on by the bullocks horns dragged them back into the right course suddenly the wagon made a jolt that it was impossible to prevent a crack was heard and the vehicle began to lean over it in a most precarious manner the water now rose to the lady's feet the whole concern began to float though john mangles and lord glenarvan hung on to the side it was an anxious moment fortunately a vigorous effort drove the wagon toward the opposite shore and the bank began to slope upward so that the horses and bullocks were able to regain their footing and soon the whole party found themselves on the other side glad enough though wet enough too the fore part of the wagon however was broken by the jolt and glenarvan's horse had lost a shoe this was an accident that needed to be promptly repaired they looked at each other hardly knowing what to do till ayrton proposed he should go to black point station twenty miles further north and bring a blacksmith with him yes go my good fellow said glenarvan how long will it take you to get there and back about fifteen hours replied ayrton but no longer start at once then and we will camp here on the banks of the wimmera till you return End of Book 2, Chapter 10。Book 2, Chapter 11 of In Search of the Castaways。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Search of the Castaways or the Children of Captain Grant by Jules Verne. Book 2, Chapter 11 Crime or Calamity. It was not without apprehension that the Major saw Ayrton quit the Wimmera camp to go and look for a blacksmith at the Point Black station. But he did not breathe a word of his private misgivings, and contented himself with watching the neighborhood of the river. Nothing disturbed the repose of those tranquil glades, and after a short night the sun reappeared on the horizon. As to Glenarvan, his only fear was lest Ayrton should return alone. If they failed to find a workman, the wagon could not resume the journey this might end in a delay of many days and glenarvan impatient to succeed could brook no delay 
in his eagerness to attain his object. Ayrton, luckily, had lost neither his time nor his trouble. He appeared next morning at daybreak, accompanied by a man who gave himself out as the blacksmith from Black Point Station. He was a powerful fellow and tall, but his features were of a low, brutal type, which did not prepossess any one in his favour. But that was nothing, provided he knew his business. He scarcely spoke, and certainly he did not waste his breath in useless words. "'Is he a good workman?' said John Mangles to the quartermaster. "'I know no more about him than you do, Captain,' said Ayrton. "'But we shall see.' The blacksmith set to work. Evidently that was his trade, as they could plainly see from the way he set about repairing the forepart of the wagon. He worked skilfully and with uncommon energy. The Major observed that the flesh of his wrists was deeply furrowed, showing a ring of extravated blood. It was the mark of a recent injury, which the sleeve of an old woollen shirt could not conceal. McNabbs questioned the blacksmith about those sores which looked so painful. The man continued his work without answering. Two hours more, and the damage the carriage had sustained was made good. As to Glenarvan's horse, it was soon disposed of. The blacksmith had had the foresight to bring the shoes with him. These shoes had a peculiarity which did not escape the major. It was a trefoil clumsily cut on the back part. McNabbs pointed it out to Ayrton. "'It is the Black Point brand,' said the quartermaster. "'That enables them to track any horses that may stray from the station, and prevents their being mixed with the other herds.' The horse was soon shod. The blacksmith claimed his wage, and went off without uttering four words. Half an hour later the travellers were on the road. Beyond the grove of mimosas was a stretch of sparsely timbered country, which quite deserved its name of Open Plain. Some fragments of quartz and ferungious rock lay among the scrub in the tall grass, where numerous flocks were feeding. Some miles farther the wheels of the wagon ploughed deep into the alluvial soil, where irregular creeks murmured in their beds, half hidden among giant reeds. By and by they skirted vast salt lakes, rapidly evaporating. The journey was accomplished without trouble, and indeed without fatigue. Lady Helena invited the horsemen of the party to pay her a visit in turns, as her reception-room was but small, and in pleasant converse with this amiable woman they forgot about the fatigue of their day's ride. Lady Helena, seconded by Miss Mary, did the honours of their ambulatory house with perfect grace. John Mangles was not forgotten in these daily invitations, and his somewhat serious conversation was not unpleasing. The party crossed, in a diagonal direction, the mail-coach road from Crowland to Horsham, which was a very dusty one, and little used by pedestrians. The spurs of some low hills were skirted at the boundary of Talbot County, and in the evening the travellers reached a point about three miles from Maryborough. The fine rain was falling, which in any other country would have soaked the ground, but here the air absorbed the moisture so wonderfully that the camp did not suffer in the least. Next day, the twenty-ninth of December, the march was delayed somewhat by a succession of little hills, resembling a miniature Switzerland. It was a constant repetition of up and down hill, and many a jolt besides, all of which were scarcely pleasant. The travellers walked part of the way, and thought it no hardship. At eleven o'clock they arrived at Carisbrook, rather an important municipality. Ayrton was for passing outside the town without going through it, in order, he said, to save time. Glenarvan concurred with him, but Paganel, always eager for novelties, was for visiting Carisbrook. They gave him his way, and the wagon went on slowly. Paganel, as was his custom, took Robert with him. His visit to the town was very short, but it sufficed to give him an exact idea of Australian towns. There was a bank, a courthouse, a market, a church, and a hundred or so of brick houses, all exactly alike. The whole town was laid out in squares, crossed with parallel streets in the English fashion. Nothing could be more simple, nothing less attractive. As the town grows, they lengthen the streets as we lengthen the trousers of a growing child, and thus the original symmetry is undisturbed. Carisbrook was full of activity, a remarkable feature in these towns of yesterday. It seems in Australia as if towns shot up like trees, owing to the heat of the sun. Men of business were hurrying along the streets, gold buyers were hastening to meet the incoming escort, the precious metal, guarded by the local police, was coming from the mines at Bendigo and Mount Alexander. All the little world was so absorbed in its own interests that the strangers passed unobserved amid the laborious inhabitants. After an hour devoted to visiting Carisbrook, the two visitors rejoined their companions, and crossed a high cultivated district. Long stretches of prairie, known as the low-level plains, next met their gaze, dotted with countless sheep and shepherd's huts. And then came a sandy tract, 
without any transition, but with the abruptness of change so characteristic of Australian scenery. Mount Simpson and Mount Terengower marked the southern point where the boundary of the Loden district cuts the 144th meridian. As yet they had not met with any of the aboriginal tribes living in the savage state. Glenarvan wondered if the Australians were wanting in Australia, as the Indians had been wanting in the Pampas of the Argentine district, but Paganel told him that, in that latitude, the natives frequented chiefly the Murray Plains, about one hundred miles to the eastward. "'We are now approaching the gold district,' said he. "'In a day or two we shall cross the rich region of Mount Alexander. It was here that the swarm of diggers alighted in 1852. The natives had to fly to the interior. We are in civilized districts without seeing any sign of it, but our road will, before the day is over, cross the railway which connects the Murray with the sea. Well, I must confess, a railway in Australia does seem to me an astonishing thing. And pray, why, Paganel, said Glenarvan, why, because it jars on one's ideas. Oh, I know you English are so used to colonizing distant possessions. You, who have electric telegraphs and universal exhibitions in New Zealand, you think it is all quite natural. But it dumbfounders the mind of a Frenchman like myself, and confuses all one's notions of Australia. Because you look at the past and not at the present, said John Mangles. A loud whistle interrupted the discussion. The party were within a mile of the railway. Quite a number of persons were hastening toward the railway bridge. The people from the neighboring stations left their houses, and the shepherds their flocks, and crowded the approaches to the railway. Every now and then there was a shout, "'The railway! The railway!' Something serious must have occurred to produce such an agitation, perhaps some terrible accident. Glenarvan, followed by the rest, urged his horse. In a few minutes he arrived at Camden Bridge, and then he became aware of the cause of such an excitement. A fearful accident had occurred, not a collision, but a train had gone off the line, and then there had been a fall. The affair recalled the worst disasters of American railways. The river crossed by the railway was full of broken carriages and the engine. Whether the weight of the train had been too much for the bridge, or whether the train had gone off the rails, the fact remained that five carriages out of six fell into the bed of the Loden, dragged down by the locomotive. The sixth carriage, miraculously preserved by the breaking of the coupling chain, remained on the rails, six feet from the abyss. Below nothing was discernible but a melancholy heap of twisted and blackened axles, shattered wagons, bent rails, charred sleepers, the boiler, burst by the shock, had scattered its plates to enormous distances. From this shapeless mass of ruins, flames and black smoke still rose. After the fearful fall came fire, more fearful still. Great tracks of blood, scattered limbs, charred trunks of bodies, showed here and there. None could guess how many victims lay dead and mangled under those ruins. Glenarvan, Paganel, the Major, Mangles, mixing with the crowd, heard the current talk. Every one tried to account for the accident, while doing his utmost to save what could be saved. "'The bridge must have broken,' said one. "'Not a bit of it. The bridge is whole enough. They must have forgotten to close it to let the train pass. That is all.' It was, in fact, a swing-bridge, which opened for the convenience of the boats. Had the guard, by an unpardonable oversight, omitted to close it for the passage of the train, so that the train, coming on at full speed, was precipitated into the Loden? This hypothesis seemed very admissible, for although one half of the bridge lay beneath the ruins of the train, the other half, drawn up to the opposite shore, hung, still unharmed, by its chains. No one could doubt that an oversight on the part of the guard had caused the catastrophe. The accident had occurred in the night, to the express train which left Melbourne at 11.45 in the evening. About a quarter past three in the morning, twenty-five minutes after leaving Castlemaine, it arrived at Camden Bridge, where the terrible disaster befell. The passengers and guards of the last and only remaining carriage at once tried to obtain help. But the telegraph, whose posts were lying on the ground, could not be worked. It was three hours before the authorities from Castlemaine reached the scene of the accident, and it was six o'clock in the morning when the salvage party was organized, under the direction of Mr. Mitchell, the surveyor-general of the colony, and a detachment of police, commanded by an inspector. The squatters and their hands lent their aid, and directed their efforts first to extinguishing the fire which raged in the ruined heap with unconquerable violence. A few unrecognizable bodies lay on the slope of the embankment, but from that blazing mass no living thing could be saved. The fire had done its work too speedily. Of the passengers ten only survived, those in the last carriage. The railway authorities sent a locomotive to bring them back to Castlemaine. 
Lord Glenarvan, having introduced himself to the surveyor-general, entered into conversation with him and the inspector of police. The latter was a tall, thin man, imperturbably cool, and, whatever he may have felt, allowed no trace of it to appear on his features. He contemplated this calamity as a mathematician does a problem. He was seeking to solve it, and to find the unknown, and when Glenarvan observed, This is a great misfortune, he quietly replied, Better than that, my lord. Better than that, cried Glenarvan. I do not understand you. It is better than misfortune. It is a crime, he replied, in the same quiet tone. Glenarvan looked inquiringly at Mr. Mitchell for a solution. Yes, my lord, replied the surveyor general. Our inquiries have resulted in the conclusion that the catastrophe is the result of a crime. The last luggage van has been robbed. The surviving passengers were attacked by a gang of five or six villains. The bridge was intentionally opened, and not left opened by the neglect of the guard, and connecting with this fact the guard's disappearance, we may conclude that the wretched fellow was an accomplice of these ruffians. The police officer shook his head at this inference. "'You do not agree with me?' said Mr. Mitchell. "'No, not as to the complicity of the guard. Well, but granting that complicity, we may attribute the crime to the natives who haunt the Murray. Without him the blacks could never have opened a swing bridge. They know nothing of its mechanism.' "'Exactly so,' said the police inspector. "'Well,' added Mr. Mitchell, "'we have evidence of a boatman whose boat passed Camden Bridge at 11.40 p.m., that the bridge was properly shut after he passed.' "'True. Well, after that I cannot see any doubt as to the complicity of the guard.' The police officer shook his head gently, but continued, "'Then you don't attribute the crime to the natives?' "'Not at all. To whom, then?' Just at this moment a noise was heard from about half a mile up the river. A crowd had gathered, and quickly increased. They soon reached the station, and in their midst were two men carrying a corpse. It was the body of the guard, quite cold, stabbed to the heart. The murderers had no doubt hoped, by dragging their victim to a distance, that the police would be put on a wrong scent in their first inquiries. Their discovery, at any rate, justified the doubts of the police inspector. The poor blacks had had no hand in the matter. Those who dealt that blow, said he, were already well used to this little instrument, and so saying he produced a pair of darbies, a kind of handcuff made of a double ring of iron secured by a lock. I shall soon have the pleasure of presenting them with these bracelets as a New Year's gift. Then you suspect? Some folks who came out free in Her Majesty's ships. What? Convicts? cried Paganel, who recognized the formula employed in the Australian colonies. I thought, said Glenarvan, convicts had no right in the province of Victoria. Bah! said the inspector. If they have no right, they take it. They escape sometimes, and, if I am not greatly mistaken, this lot have come straight from Perth, and, take my word for it, they will soon be there again. Mr. Mitchell nodded acquiescence in the words of the police inspector. At this moment the wagon arrived at the level crossing of the railway. Glenarvan wished to spare the ladies the horrible spectacle at Camden Bridge. He took courteous leave of the surveyor-general, and made a sign to the rest to follow him. "'There is no reason,' said he, "'for delaying our journey.' Glenarvan merely mentioned to Lady Helena that there had been a railway accident, without a hint of the crime that had played so great a part in it. Neither did he make mention of the presence of a band of convicts in the neighborhood, reserving that piece of information slowly for Ayrton's ear. The little procession now crossed the railway some two hundred yards below the bridge, and then resumed their eastward course. End of Book Two, Chapter Eleven Book Two, Chapter Twelve, In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Gray. In Search of the Castaways, or The Children of Captain Grant by Jules Verne. Book Two, Chapter Twelve, Toline of the Lachlan. About two miles from the railway, the plain terminated in a range of low hills, and it was not long before the wagon entered a succession of narrow gorges and capricious windings, out of which it emerged into a most charming region, where grand trees, not closely planted, but in scattered groups, were growing with absolute tropical luxuriance. As the party drove on, they stumbled upon a little native boy, lying fast asleep beneath the shade of a magnificent banksia. He was dressed in European garb, 
and seemed about eight years of age. There was no mistaking the characteristic features of his race, the crisp hair, the nearly black skin, the flattened nose, the thick lips, the unusual length of the arms, immediately classed him among the aborigines of the interior. But a degree of intelligence appeared in his face that showed some educational influence must have been a work on his savage, untamed nature. Lady Helena, whose interest was greatly excited by this spectacle, got out of the wagon, followed by Mary, and presently the whole company surrounded the peaceful little sleeper. Poor child, said Mary Grant. Is he lost? I wonder. In this desert? I suppose, said Lady Helena. He has come a long way to visit this part. No doubt some he loves are here. But he can't be left alone, added Robert. We must... His compassionate sentence remained unfinished, for, just at that moment, the child turned over in his sleep, and to the extreme surprise of everybody, there was a large label on his shoulders, on which the following was written. Toline, to be conducted to Utrecht, care of Geoffrey Smith, railway porter, prepaid. That's the English all over, exclaimed Paganel. They send off a child just as they would luggage, and book em like a parcel. I heard it was done, certainly, but I could not believe it before. Poor child, said Lady Helena, could he have been in the train that got off the line in Camden Bridge? Perhaps his parents were killed, and he is left alone in the world. I don't think so, madame, replied John Mangles. The card rather goes to prove he was traveling alone. He is waking up, said Mary. And so he was. His eyes slowly opened, and they closed again, pained by the glare of the light. But Lady Helena took his hand, and he jumped at once, and looked about him in bewilderment at the sight of so many strangers. He seemed half frightened at first, but the presence of Lady Helena reassured him. Do you understand English, my little man? asked the young lady. I understand it and speak it, replied the child in fluent enough English, but with a marked accent. His pronunciation was like a Frenchman's. What is your name? asked Lady Helena. Toline, replied the little native. Toline? exclaimed Paganel. Ah, I think that means bark of a tree in Australian. Toline nodded and looked again at the travelers. Where do you come from? inquired Lady Helena. From Melbourne, by way of rail from Sandhurst. Were you in the accident at Camden Bridge? asked Glenarvan. Yes, sir, was Trolline's reply, but the God of the Bible protected me. Are you traveling alone? Yes, alone. The Reverend Paxton put me in charge of Geoffrey Smith, but unfortunately, the poor man was killed. And you did not know anyone else on the train? No one, ma'am. But God watches over children and never forsakes them. Toline added this in a soft, quiet tones, which went to her heart. When he mentioned the name of God, his voice was grave, and his eyes beamed with all the fervor that animated his young soul. This religious enthusiasm at so tender an age was easily explained. The child was one of the aborigines baptized by the English missionaries, and trained by them in all the rigid principles of the Methodist Church. His calm replies, proper behavior, and even his somber garb made him look like a little reverend already. But where was he going all alone in these solitudes, and why had he left Camden Bridge? Lady Helena asked him about this. I was returning to my tribe in Lachlan, he replied. I wish to see my family again. Are they Australians? inquired John Mangles. Yes, Australians of the Lachlan, replied Toline. Have you a father and mother? said Robert Grant. Yes, my brother, replied Toline, holding out his hand to little Grant. Robert was so touched by the word brother that he kissed the black child and they were friends forthwith. The whole party were so interested in these replies of the little Australian savage that they all sat around him in a listening group. But the sun had meantime sunk behind the tall trees, and as a few miles would not greatly retard their progress, 
and the spot they were in would be suitable for a halt. Glenavan gave orders to prepare for camp for the night at once. Arton unfastened the bullocks and turned them out to feed at will. The tent was pitched, and Ulbrick got the supper ready. Toline consented, after some difficulty, to share it. Though he was hungry enough, he took his seat beside Robert, who chose out all the tidbits for his new friend. Toline accepted them with a shy grace that was very charming. The conversation with him, however, was still kept up, for everyone felt an interest in the child and wanted to talk to him and hear his history. It was simple enough. He was one of the poor native children confined to the care of charitable societies by the neighboring tribe. The Australian Aborigines are gentle and inoffensive, never exhibiting the fierce hatred toward their conquerors, which characterizes the New Zealanders and possibly a few of the races of northern Australia. They often go to the large towns such as Adelaide, Sydney, and Melbourne to walk about in very primitive costume. They go to barter their few articles of industry, hunting and fishing implements, weapons, etc., and some of the chiefs, from culinary motives, no doubt, willingly leave their children to profit by the advantages of gratuitous education in English. This was how Toline's parents had acted. They were true Australian savages living in the Lachlan, a vast region lying beyond the Murray. The child had been in Melbourne five years, and during that time he had never once seen any of his own people, and yet the imperishable feeling of kindred was still so strong in his heart that he had dared to brave his journey over the wilds to visit his tribe once more. Scattered throughout perchance it might be, and his family, even sh should he find it, be decimated. And after you have kissed your parents, are you coming back to Melbourne? asked Lady Glenavan. Yes, madame, replied Tolaine, looking at the lady with loving expression. And what are you going to do? be some day she continued i am going to snatch my brothers from misery and ignorance and i am going to teach them to bring them to know and love god i am going to be a missionary words like those spoken with such animation from a child of only eight years might have provoked a smile in light scoffing auditors but they understood and appreciated by the grave scotch who admired the courage of the young disciple already armed for the battle. Even Paganel, who stirred in the depths of his heart and felt his warmer sympathy awakened for the poor child. To speak the truth, up to the moment he did not care much for a savage in European attire. He had not come to Australia to see Australians in coats and trousers. He preferred them simply tattooed, and this conventional dress jarred on his preconceived notions but the child's genuine religious fever won him over completely. Indeed, the wind-up of the conversation converted the worthy geographer into his best friend. It was in reply to a question Lady Helena had asked that Toline said he was studying at the normal school in Melbourne, and that the principal was Reverend Mr. Paxton. And what do they teach you? she went on to say. They teach me the Bible and mathematics, and geography. Paganel pricked up his ears at this, and said, Indeed, geography? Yes, sir, said Toline, and I had the first prize for geography before the Christmas holidays. You had the first prize for geography, my boy? Yes, sir, here it is, returned Toline, pulling a book out of his pocket. It was a Bible, thirty-two mo size, and well bound. On the first page was written the words, Normal School, Melbourne. First prize for geography. Toline of the Lachlan. Paganel was beside himself. An Australian well-versed in geography. This was marvelous, and he could not help kissing Toline on both cheeks, just as if he had been the Reverend Mr. Paxton himself on the day of the distribution of prizes. Paganel need not have been so amazed at this circumstance, however, for it is frequent enough in Australian schools. The little savages are very quick in learning geography. They learn it eagerly, and on the other hand, are perfectly averse to the science of arithmetic. Toline could not understand this outburst of affection on the part of the Frenchman. He looked so puzzled that Lady Helena thought she had 
better inform him that Paganel was a celebrated geographer and a distinguished professor on occasion. A professor of geography? cried Toline. Oh, sir, do question me. Question you? Well, I'd like nothing better, indeed. I was going to do it without your leave. I should very much like to see how they teach geography in the normal school of Melbourne. And suppose Toline trips you up, Paganel, said McNabbs. What a likely idea, exclaimed the geographer. Trip up the secretary of the Geographical Society of France. Their examination then commenced. After Paganel had settled his spectacles firmly on his nose, drawn himself up to his full height, and put on a solemn voice, becoming the professor. Pupil Toline, stand up. As Toline was already standing, he could not get any higher, but he waited modestly for the geographer's question. Pupil Toline, what are the five divisions of the globe? Oceania, Asia, Africa, America, and Europe. Perfectly so. Now, we'll take Oceania first. Where are we at this moment? What are the principal divisions? Australia, belonging to the English, New Zealand, belonging to the English, Tasmania, belonging to the English, the islands of Chatham, Auckland, Macquarie, Kermadec, Macon, Marikai, are also belonging to the English. Very good. And New Caledonia, the Sandwich Islands, the Mendana, and the Pompatou? They are islands under the protectorate of Great Britain. What? cried Paganel. Under the protectorate of Great Britain? I rather think the contrary, that France. France, said the child with an astonished look. Well, well, said Paganel. Is that what they teach you in the Melbourne Normal School? Yes, sir. Isn't it right? Oh, yes, yes, perfectly right. All Oceania belongs to the English. That's an understood thing. Go on. Paganel's face betrayed both surprise and annoyance, to the great delight of the Major. Let us go on to Asia, said the geographer. Asia, replied Toline. It's an immense country. Capital, Calcutta. Chief towns, Bombay, Madras, Calcutta, Aden, Malacca, Singapore, Pegu, Colombo, the Lake Dive Islands, the Maladives, the, the Chagos, etc., belong to the English. Very good, pupil Toline. And now for Africa. Africa comprises the two chief colonies, the Cape on the south, capital Cape Town, and on the west, the English settlement's chief city, Sierra Leone. Capital, said Paganel, beginning to enter into his perfectly taught but Anglo-colored fanciful geography. As to Algeria, Morocco, Egypt, they are all struck out of the Britannic cities. Let us pass on, pray to America. It is divided, said Toline promptly, into North and South America. The former belongs to the English in Canada, New Brunswick, New Scotland, and the United States, under the government of President Johnson. President Johnson, cried Paganel, the successor of the great and good Lincoln, assassinated by a mad fanatic of the slave party? Capital! Nothing could be better. And as to South America, with its Guiana, its archipelago of South Shelton, its Georgia, Jamaica, Trinidad, etc., that belongs to the English, too. Well, I'm not to be the one to dispute that point, but Toline, I should like to know your opinion of Europe, or rather, your professors. Europe? said Toline, not at all understanding Paganel's excitement. Yes, Europe. Who does Europe belong to? Why, to the English, replied Toline, as if the fact was quite settled. I much doubt it, returned Paganel. But how's that, Toline, for I want to know that. England, Ireland, Scotland, Malta, Jersey, and Guernsey, the Ionian Islands, the Hebrides, the Shetlands, and the Orncase. Yes, yes, my lad, but there are other states you forgot to mention. What are they, replied the child not the least concerted. Spain, Russia, Austria, Persia, France, answered Paganel. They are provinces, not states, said Toline. Well, that beats all, exclaimed Paganel, tearing off his spectacles. 
Yes, continued the child. Spain, capital, Gibraltar. Admiral, perfect, sublime. And France, for I am French, and I should know to whom I belong. France, said Toline quietly, is an English province. Chief city, Calais. Callous, cried Paganel. So you think Callous still belongs to the English? Certainly, and that is the capital of France. Yes, sir, and it is there that the governor, Lord Napoleon, lives. This was too much for Paganel's risable faculties. He burst out laughing. Toline did not know what to make of him. He had done his best to answer every question put to him, but the singularity of the answers were not his blame. Indeed, he never imagined anything singular about them. However, he took it all quietly and waited for the professor to recover himself. These peals of laughter were quite incomprehensible to him. You see, said Major McNabbs, laughing, I was right. The pupil could enlighten you after all. Most assuredly, friend Major, replied the geographer. So that's the way they teach geography in Melbourne. They do it well. These professors in the normal school, Europe, Asia, Africa, America, Oceania, the whole world belongs to English. My consensus, with such an ingenious education, it is no wonder the natives submit. Oh, well, Toline, my boy, does the moon belong to England, too? She will some day, replied the young savage gravely. This was the climax. Paganel could not stand any more. He was obligated to go away and take his laugh out, for he was actually exploding with mirth, and he went fully a quarter of a mile from the encampment before his equilibrium was restored. Meanwhile, Glenarvan looked up a geography they had brought among their books. It was Richardson's Compendium, a work of great repute in England, and more in argument with modern science than the manual in use in the normal school in Melbourne. Here, my child, he said to Toline, take this book and keep it. You have a few wrong ideas about geography, which it would be well for you to rectify. I will give you this as a keepsake from me. Toline took the book silently, but, after examining it attentively, he shook his head with an air of incredulity. He could not even make up his mind to put it in his pocket. By this time, night had closed in. It was 10 p.m., and time to think of rest if they were to start betimes next day. Robert offered his friend Toline half his bed, and the little fellow accepted it. Lady Helena and Mary Grant withdrew to the wagon, and the others lay down in the tent. Paganel's merry peals still mingled with the low, sweet song of the wild magpie. But in the morning, at six o'clock, when the sunshine wakened the sleepers, they looked in vain for the little Australian. Toline had disappeared. Was he in haste to get to Lachlan district, or was he hurt by Paganel's laughter? No one could say. But when Lady Helena opened her eyes, she discovered a fresh branch of mimosa leaves laying across her, and Paganel found a book in his vest pocket, which turned out to be Richardson's Geography. End of Book 2, Chapter 12 Recording by Michael Gray, Tacoma, Washington Book Two, Chapter Thirteen of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Search of the Castaways, or the Children of Captain Grant, by Jules Verne. Book Two, Chapter Thirteen: A Warning. On the second of January at sunrise the travellers forded the Colben and the Calpespe rivers. The half of their journey was now accomplished. In fifteen days more, should their journey continue to be prosperous, the little party would reach Twofold Bay. They were all in good health. All that Paganel said of the hygienic qualities of the climate was realized. There was little or no humidity, and the heat was quite bearable. Neither horses nor bullocks could complain of it any more than human beings. The order of the march had been changed in one respect since the affair of Camden Bridge. That criminal catastrophe on the railway made Ayrton take sundry precautions, which had hitherto been unnecessary. 
the hunters never lost sight of the wagon, and whenever they camped, one was always placed on watch. Morning and evening the firearms were primed afresh. It was certain that a gang of ruffians was prowling about the country, and though there was no cause for actual fear, it was well to be ready for whatever might happen. It need hardly be said that these precautions were adopted without the knowledge of Lady Helena and Mary Grant, as Lord Glenarvan did not wish to alarm them. They were by no means unnecessary, however, for any imprudence or carelessness might have cost the travellers dear. Others besides Glenarvan were on their guard. In lonely settlements and on stations, the inhabitants and the squatters prepared carefully against any attack or surprise. Houses are closed at nightfall. The dogs let loose inside the fences, barked at the slightest sound. Not a single shepherd on horseback gathered his numerous flocks together at close of day, without having a carbine slung from his saddle. The outrage at Camden Bridge was the reason for all this, and many a colonist fastened himself in with bolts and bars now at dusk, who used to sleep with open doors and windows. The government itself displayed zeal and prudence, especially in the post-office department. On this very day, just as Glenarvan and his party were on their way from Kilmore to Heathcote, the mail dashed by at full speed, but though the horses were at a gallop, Glenarvan caught sight of the glittering weapons of the mounted police that rode by its side, as they swept past in a cloud of dust. The travellers might have fancied themselves back in those lawless times when the discovery of the first gold-fields deluged the Australian continent with the scum of Europe. A mile beyond the road to Kilmore, the wagon, for the first time since leaving Cape Bernoulli, struck into one of those forests of gigantic trees which extend over a superficies of several degrees. A cry of admiration escaped the travellers at the sight of the eucalyptus trees, two hundred feet high, with tough bark five inches thick, the trunks measuring twenty feet round and furrowed with foamy streaks of an odorous resin, rose one hundred and fifty feet above the soil. Not a branch, not a twig, not a stray shoot, not even a knot spoiled the regularity of their outline. They could not have come out smoother from the hands of a turner. They stood like pillars, all moulded exactly alike, and could be counted by hundreds. At an enormous height they spread out in chaplets of branches, rounded and adorned at their extremity with alternate leaves. At the axle of these leaves solitary flowers drooped down, the calyx of which resembles an inverted urn. Under this leafy dome, which never lost its greenness, the air circulated freely, and dried up the dampness of the ground. Horses, cattle, and wagon could easily pass between the trees, for they were standing in wide rows, and parcelled out like a wood that was being felled. This was neither like the densely packed woods, choked with brambles, nor the virgin forest barricaded with trunks of fallen trees, and overgrown with inextricable tangles of creepers where only iron and fire could open up a track. A grassy carpet at the foot of the trees, and a canopy of verdure above, long perspectives of bold colours, little shade, little freshness at all, a peculiar light, as if the rays came through a thin veil, dappled lights and shades, sharply reflected on the ground, made up a whole, and constituted a peculiar spectacle, rich in novel effects." the forests of the oceanic continent do not in the least resemble the forests of the new world, and the eucalyptus, the terra of the aborigines, belonging to the family of Martatia, the different varieties of which can hardly be enumerated, is the tree par excellence of the Australian flora. The reason of the shade not being deep, nor the darkness profound under these domes of verdure, was that these trees presented a curious anomaly in the disposition of the leaves. Instead of presenting their broad surface to the sunlight, only the side is turned. Only the profile of the leaves is seen in this singular foliage. Consequently the sun's rays slant down them to the earth, as if through the open slats of a Venetian blind. Glenarvan expressed his surprise at this circumstance, and wondered what could be the cause of it. Paganel, who was never at a loss for an answer, immediately replied, "'What astonishes me is not the caprice of nature. She knows what she is about. 
but botanists don't always know what they are saying. Nature made no mistake in giving this peculiar foliage to the tree, but men have erred in calling them eucalyptus. What does the word mean? asked Mary Grant. It comes from a Greek word meaning, I cover well. They took care to commit the mistake in Greek, that it might not be so self-evident, for any one can see that the eucalyptus covers badly. I agree with you there, said Glenarvan, but now tell us, Paganel, how is it that the leaves grow in this fashion? From a purely physical cause, friends, said Paganel, and one that you will easily understand. In this country, where the air is dry and rain seldom falls, the ground is parched, the trees have no need of wind or sun. Moisture lacking, sap is lacking also. Hence these narrow leaves, which seek to defend themselves against the light and prevent too great evaporation. This is why they present the profile and not the face to the sun's rays. There is nothing more intelligent than a leaf. And nothing more selfish added the Major. These only thought of themselves, and not at all of travellers. Everyone inclined to the opinion of McNabbs except Paganel, who congratulated himself on walking under shadeless trees, though all the time he was whipping the perspiration from his forehead. However, this disposition of foliage was certainly to be regretted, for the journey through the forest was often long and painful, as the traveller had no protection whatever against the sun's fierce rays. The whole of this day the wagon continued to roll along through interminable rows of eucalyptus, without meeting either quadruped or native. A few cockatoos lived in the top of the trees, but at such a height they could scarcely be distinguished, and their noisy chatter was changed into an imperceptible murmur. Occasionally a swarm of parakeets flew along a distant path, and lighting it up for an instant with gay colours, but otherwise solemn silence reigned in this vast green temple, and the tramp of the horses, a few words exchanged with each other by the riders, the grinding noise of the wheels, and from time to time a cry from Ayrton to stir up his lazy team, were the only sounds which disturbed this immense solitude. When night came, they camped at the foot of some eucalyptus, which bore marks of a comparatively recent fire. They looked like tall factory chimneys, for the flame had completely hollowed them out their whole length. With the thick bark still covering them, they looked none the worse. However, this bad habit of squatters or natives will end in the destruction of these magnificent trees, and they will disappear like the cedars of Lebanon, those world monuments burnt by unlucky campfires. Oblinette, acting on Paganel's advice, lighted his fire to prepare supper in one of these tubular trunks. He found it drew capitably, and the smoke was lost in the dark foliage above. The requisite precautions were taken for the night, and Ayrton, Mulready, Wilson, and John Mangles undertook in turn to keep watch until sunrise. On the 3rd of January, all day long, they came to nothing but the same symmetrical avenues of trees. It seemed as if they were never going to end. However, toward the evening, the ranks of trees began to thin, and on a little plain a few miles off, an assemblage of regular houses. Seymour, cried Paganel, that is the last town we come to in the province of Victoria. Is it an important one? asked Lady Helena. It is a mere village, madam, but on the way to becoming a municipality. Shall we find a respectable hotel there? asked Glenarvan. I hope so, replied Paganel. Very well, let us go on to the town, for our fair travellers, with all their courage, will not be sorry, I fancy, to have a good night's rest. My dear Edward, Mary and I will accept it gladly, but only on the condition that it will cause no delay, or take us the least out of the road. It will do neither, replied Lord Glenarvan. Besides, our bullocks are fatigued, and we will start to-morrow at daybreak. It was now nine o'clock. The moon was just beginning to rise, but her rays only slanting yet, and lost in the mist. It was gradually getting dark when the little party entered the wide streets of Seymour, under Paganel's guidance, who seemed always to know what he had never seen, but his instinct led him right, and he walked straight to Campbell's North British Hotel. The Major, without even leaving the hotel, was soon aware that fear absorbed the inhabitants of the little town. Ten minutes' conversation with Dixon 
the loquacious landlord made him completely acquainted with the actual state of affairs, but he never breathed a word to any one. When supper was over, though, and Lady Glenarvan and Mary and Robert had retired, the Major detained his companions a little, and said, "'They have found out the perpetrators of the crime on the Sandhurst Railroad.' "'And are they arrested?' asked Ayrton eagerly. "'No,' replied McNabbs, without apparently noticing the impressment of the quartermaster, an impressment which, moreover, was reasonable enough under the circumstances. "'So much the worse,' replied Ayrton. "'Well,' said Glenarvan, "'who are the authors of the crime?' "'Read,' replied the Major, offering Glenarvan a copy of the Australian and New Zealand Gazette. "'And you will see that the inspector of the police was not mistaken.' Glenarvan read aloud the following message. Sydney, January 2, 1866. It will be remembered that on the night of the 29th or 30th of last December there was an accident at Camden Bridge, five miles beyond the station at Castlemaine, on the railway from Melbourne to Sandhurst. The night express, 11.45, dashing along at full speed, was precipitated into the Loddon River. Camden Bridge had been left open, the numerous robberies committed after the accident, the body of the guard, picked up about half a mile from Camden Bridge, proved that this catastrophe was the result of a crime. Indeed, the coroner's inquest decided that the crime must be attributed to the band of convicts which escaped six months ago from the penitentiary at Perth, Western Australia, just as they were about to be transferred to Norfolk Island. The gang numbers twenty-nine men. They are under the command of a certain Ben Joyce, a criminal of the most dangerous class, who arrived in Australia a few months ago, by what ship is not known, and who has hitherto succeeded in evading the hands of justice. The inhabitants of towns, colonists, and squatters at stations are hereby cautioned to be on their guard, and to communicate to the Surveyor-General any information that may aid his search. J. P. Mitchell S. G. When Glenarvan had finished reading this article, McNabbs turned to the geographer and said, "'You see, Paganel, there can be convicts in Australia.' "'Escaped convicts, that is evident,' replied Paganel, "'but not regularly transported criminals. Those fellows have no business here.' "'Well, they are here at any rate,' said Glenarvan. "'But I don't suppose the fact need materially alter our arrangements. What do you think, John?' John Mangles did not reply immediately. He hesitated between the sorrow it would cause the two children to give up the search, and the fear of compromising the expedition. "'If Lady Glenarvan and Miss Grant were not with us,' he said, "'I should not give myself much concern about these wretches.' Glenarvan understood him, and added, "'Of course I need not say that it is not a question of giving up our task.' but would it perhaps be prudent for the sake of our companions to rejoin the Duncan at Melbourne and proceed with our search for traces of the Henry Grant on the eastern side? What do you think of it, McNabbs? Before I give my opinion, replied the Major, I should like to hear Ireton's. At this direct appeal, the quartermaster looked at Glenarvan and said, I think we are two hundred miles from Melbourne, and that the danger, if it exists, is as great on the route to the south as on the route to the east. Both are little frequented, and both will serve us. Besides, I do not think that thirty scoundrels can frighten eight well-armed, determined men. My advice, then, is to go forward. And good advice, too, Ayrton, replied Paganel. By going on, we may come across the traces of Captain Grant. In returning south, on the contrary, we turn our backs to them. I think with you, then." and I don't care a snap for these escaped fellows. A brave man wouldn't care a bit for them. Upon this they agreed with one voice to follow their original programme. "'Just one thing, my lord,' said Ayrton, when they were about to separate. "'Say on, Ayrton. Wouldn't it be advisable to send orders to the Duncan to be at the coast?' "'What good would that be?' replied John Mangles. "'When we reach Twofold Bay it will be time enough for that.' If any unexpected event should oblige us to go to Melbourne, we might be sorry not to find the Duncan there. Besides, her injuries cannot be repaired yet. For these reasons, then, I think it would be better to wait. All right, said Ayrton, and forbore to press the matter further. 
End of Book Two, Chapter Thirteen. Book Two, Chapter Fourteen of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine. In the Search of the Castaways or The Children of the Captain Grant by Jules Verne. Book Two, Chapter Thirteen. Wealth in the Wilderness. On January the sixth at seven a.m., after a tranquil night passed in the longitude one hundred and forty-six degrees fifteen minutes, the travelers continued their journey across the vast district. They directed their course steadily toward the rising sun, and made a straight line across the plain. Twice over they came upon the traces of squatters going toward the north, and their different footprints became confused, and Glenarvan's horse no longer left on the dust the black point mark, recognizable by its double shamrock. The plain was furrowed in some places by fantastic winding creeks rounded by box, and whose waters were rather temporary than permanent. They originated in the slopes of the Buffalo Ranges, a chain of mountains of moderate height, the undulating line of which was visible on the horizon. It was resolved to camp there the same night. Ayrton goaded on his team, and after a journey of thirty-five miles, the bullocks arrived, somewhat fatigued. The tent was pitched beneath the great trees, and as night had drawn on, supper was served as quickly as possible, for all the party cared more for sleeping than eating after such a day's march. Paganel, who had the first watch, did not lie down but shouldered his rifle and walked up and down before the camp, to keep himself from going to sleep. In spite of the absence of the moon, the night was almost luminous with the light of the southern constellations. The savant amused himself with reading the great book of the firmament, a book which is always open, and full of interest to those who can read it. The profound silence of sleeping nature was only interrupted by the clanking of the hobbles of the horse's feet. Paganel was engrossed in his astronomical meditations, and thinking more about the celestial than the terrestrial world, when a distinct sound aroused him from his reverie. He listened attentively, and to his great amaze fancied he heard the sounds of a piano. He could not be mistaken, for he distinctly heard chords struck. A piano in the wilds, said Paganel to himself. I can never believe it is that. It certainly was very surprising, but Paganel found it easier to believe it was some Australian bird imitating the sounds of a plail or a rart, as others do the sounds of a clock or mill. But at this very moment the notes of a clear ringing voice rose in the air. The pianist was accompanied by singing. Still Paganel was unwilling to be convinced. However, next minute he was forced to admit the fact, for there fell on his ear the sublime strains of Mozart's Il mio tesoro tanto from Duan Juan. Well now, said the geographer to himself, let the Australian birds be as queer as they may, and even granting the paroquets are the most musical in the world, they can't sing Mozart. He listened to the sublime inspiration of the great master to the end. The effect of this soft melody on the still clear night was indescribable. Paganel remained as if spellbound for a time. The voice ceased, and all was silence. When Wilson came to relieve the watch, he found the geographer plunged into a deep reverie. Paganel made no remark, however, to the sailor, but reserved his information for Glenarvan in the morning, and went into the tent to bed. Next day they were all aroused from sleep by the sudden loud barking of dogs. Glenarvan got up forthwith. Two magnificent pointers, admirable specimens of English hunting dogs, were bounding in front of the little wood, into which they had retreated at the approach of the travelers, redoubling their clamor. There is some station in this desert, then, said Glenarvan, and hunters too, for these are regular setters. 
Paganel was just about to recount his nocturnal experiences, when two young men appeared, mounted on horses of the most perfect breed, true hunters. The two gentlemen, dressed in elegant hunting costume, stopped at the sight of the little group camping in gypsy fashion. They looked as if they wondered what could bring an armed party there, but when they saw the ladies get out of the wagon, they dismounted instantly, and went toward them hat in hand. Lord Glenarvan came to meet them, and, as a stranger, announced his name and rank. The gentlemen bowed, and the elder of them said, My lord, will not these ladies and yourself and friends honor us by resting a little beneath our roof? Mr. began Glenarvan. Michal and Sandy Patterson are our names, proprietors of Hottam Station. Our house is scarcely a quarter of a mile distant. Gentlemen, replied Glenarvan, I should not like to abuse such kindly offered hospitality. My lord, returned Michal Patterson, by accepting it you will confer a favor on poor exiles, who will be only too happy to do the honors of the wilds. Glenarvan bowed in token of acquiescence. Sir, said Paganel, addressing Michal Patterson, if it is not an impudent question, may I ask whether it was you that sung an air from the divine Mozart last night? It was, sir, replied the stranger, and my cousin Sandy accompanied me. Well, sir, replied Paganel, holding out his hand to the young man, receive the sincere compliments of a Frenchman, who is a passionate admirer of this music. Michel grasped his hand cordially, and then, pointing out the road to take, set off, accompanied by the ladies and Lord Glenarvan and his friends, for the station. The horses and the camp were left to the care of Ayrton and the sailors. Hotom Station was truly a magnificent establishment, kept as scrupulously in order as an English park. Immense meadows, enclosed in grey fences, stretched away out of sight. In these, thousands of bullocks and millions of sheep were grazing, tended by numerous shepherds and still more numerous dogs. The crack of the stock whip mingled continually with the barking of the collies, and the bellowing and bleating of the cattle and sheep. Toward the east there was a boundary of meals and gum trees, beyond which rose Mount Hotam, its imposing peak towering seven thousand five hundred feet high. Long avenues of green trees were visible on all sides. Here and there was a thick clump of grass trees, tall bushes ten feet high, like the dwarf palm, quite lost in their crown of long narrow leaves. The air was balmy and odorous with the perfume of scented laurels, whose white blossoms, now in full bloom, distilled on the breeze the finest aromatic perfume. To these charming groups of native trees were added transplantations from European climates. The peach, pear, and apple trees were there, the fig, the orange, and even the oak, to the rapturous delight of the travellers, who greeted them with loud hurrahs. But astonished as the travellers were to find themselves walking beneath the shadow of the trees of their own native land, they were still more so at the sight of the birds that flew about in the branches, the satin bird with its silky plumage, and the king honeysuckers with their plumage of gold and black velvet. For the first time, too, they saw her the lyre bird, the tail of which resembles in form the graceful instrument of Orpheus. It flew about among the tree ferns, and when its tail struck the branches, they were almost surprised not to hear the harmonious strains that inspired Amphion to rebuild the walls of Thebes. Paganel had a great desire to play on it. However, Lord Glenarvan was not satisfied with admiring the fairy-like wonders of this oasis, improvised in the Australian desert. He was listening to the history of the young gentleman. In England, in the midst of civilized countries, the newcomer acquaints his host whence he comes and whither he is going. But here, by a refinement of delicacy, Michael and Sandy Patterson thought it a duty to make themselves known to the strangers who were about to receive their hospitality. Michael and Sandy Patterson were the sons of London bankers. When they were twenty years of age, the head of their family said, Here are some thousands, young men. Go to a distant colony and start some useful settlement there. Learn to know life by labor. 
If you succeed, so much the better. If you fail, it won't matter much. We shall not regret the money which makes you men. The two young men obeyed. They chose the colony of Victoria in Australia as the field for sowing the paternal banknotes, and had no reason to repent the selection. At the end of three years the establishment was flourishing. In Victoria, New South Wales, and Southern Australia, there are more than three thousand stations, some belonging to squatters who rear cattle, and others to settlers who farm the ground. Till the arrival of the two Pattersons, the largest establishment of this sort was that of Mr. Jamieson, which covered an area of seventy-five miles, with a frontage of about eight miles along the Pern, one of the affluents of the Darling. Now Hattam Station bore the palm for business and extent. The young men were both squatters and settlers. They managed their immense property with rare ability and uncommon energy. The station was far removed from the chief towns in the midst of the unfrequented districts of the Murray. It occupied a long wide space of five leagues in extent, lying between the Buffalo Ranges and Mount Hottam. At the two angles north of this vast quadrilateral, Mount Aberdeen rose on the left and the peaks of High Barwon on the right. Winding, beautiful streams were not wanting, thanks to the creeks and affluents of the Owens River, which throws itself at the north into the bed of the Murray. Consequently, they were equally successful in cattle breeding and farming. Ten thousand acres of ground, admirably cultivated, produced harvests of native productions and exotics, and several millions of animals fattened in the fertile pastures. The products of Hattam Station fetched the very highest price in the markets of Castlemaine and Melbourne. Michael and Sandy Patterson had just concluded these details of their busy life when their dwelling came in sight and the extremity of the avenue of the oaks. It was a charming house, built of wood and brick, hidden in grooves of emerophilies. Nothing at all, however, belonging to a station was visible, neither sheds, nor stables, nor cart-houses. All these outbuildings, a perfect village, comprising more than twenty huts and houses, were about a quarter of a mile off in the heart of a little valley. Electric communication was established between this village and the master's house, which, far removed from all noise, seemed buried in a forest of exotic trees. At Sandy Peterson bidding, a sumptuous breakfast was served in less than a quarter of an hour. The wines and viands were of the finest quality, but what pleased the guests more of all in the midst of these refinements of opulence was the joy of the young squatters in offering them this splendid hospitality. It was not long before they were told the history of the expedition, and had their liveliest interest awakened for its success. They spoke hopefully to the young Grants, and Michael said, Harry Grant has evidently fallen into the hands of natives, since he has not turned up at any of the settlements on the coast. He knows his position exactly, as the document proves, and the reason he did not reach some English colony is that he must have been taken prisoner by the savages the moment he landed. That is precisely what befell his quartermaster, Ayrton, said John Mangles. But you gentlemen, then, have never heard the catastrophe of the Britannia mentioned, inquired Lady Helena. Never, madam, replied Michael. And what treatment, in your opinion, has Captain Grant met with among the natives? The Australians are not cruel, madam, replied the young squatter, and Miss Grant may be easy on that score. There have been many instances of the gentleness of their nature, and some Europeans have lived a long time among them, without having the least cause to complain of their brutality. King, among others, the sole survivor of the Burke expedition, put in Paganel. And not only that bold explorer, returned Sandy, but also an English soldier named Buckley, who deserted a Port Philip in 1803, and who was welcomed by the natives, and lived thirty-three years among them. And more recently, added Michael, one of the last numbers of the Australasia informs us that a certain Morilli has just been restored to his countrymen after sixteen years of slavery. His story is exactly similar to the captain's, for it was at the very time of his shipwreck, in the Pruvienne, 
in 1846, that he was made prisoner by the natives, and dragged away into the interior of the continent. I therefore think you have reason to hope still. The young squatter's words caused great joy to his auditors. They completely corroborated the opinions of Paganel and Ayrton. The conversation turned on the convicts after the ladies had left the table. The squatters had heard of the catastrophe at Camden Bridge, but felt no uneasiness about the escaped gang. It was not a station, with more than a hundred men on it, that they would dare to attack. Besides, they would never go into the deserts of the Moray, where they could find no booty, nor near the colonies of the New South Wales, where the roads were too well watched. Ayrton had said this, too. Glenarvan could not refuse the request of his amiable hosts to spend the whole day at the station. It was twelve hours delay, but also twelve hours rest, and both horses and bullocks would be the better for the comfortable quarters they would find there. This was co accordingly agreed upon, and the young squatters sketched out a program of the day's amusements, which was adopted eagerly. At noon, seven vigorous hunters were before the door. An elegant break was intended for the ladies, in which the coachman could exhibit his skill in driving four in hand. The cavalcade set off preceded by huntsmen, and armed with first-right rifles, followed by a pack of pointers, barking joyously as they bounded through the bushes. For four hours the hunting party wandered through the paths and avenues of the park, which was as large as a small German state. The Ruiz Schleitz, or sex Gotha, would have gone inside it comfortably. Few people were to be met in it certainly, but sheep in abundance. As for game, there was a complete preserve awaiting the hunters. The noisy reports of guns were soon heard in all sides. Little Robert did wonders in company with Mayor McNabbs. The daring boy, in spite of his sister's injunctions, was always in front, and the first to fire. But John Mangles promised to watch over him, and Mary felt less uneasy. During this but two, they killed certain animals peculiar to the country, the very names of which were unknown to Paganel. Among others, the wombat and the bandicoot. The wombat is a herbivorous animal, which burrows in the ground like a badger. It is as large as a sheep, and the flesh is excellent. The bandicoot is a species of marsupial animal, with, which could outwit the European fox, and give him lessons in pillaging poultry yards. It was a repulsive-looking animal, a foot and a half long, but, as Paganel chanced to kill it, of course he thought it charming. An adorable creature, he called it. But the most interesting event of the day by far was the kangaroo hunt. About four o'clock the dogs roused a troop of these curious marsupials. The little ones retreated precipitately into the maternal pouch, and all the troop decamped in file. Nothing could be more astonishing than the enormous bounds of the kangaroo. The hind legs of the animal are twice as long as the front ones, and unbend like a spring. At the head of the flying troop was a male five feet high, a magnificent specimen of the Macropus giganteus, an old man, as the bushmen say. For four or five miles the chase was vigorously pursued. The kangaroos showed no signs of weariness, and the dogs, who had reason enough to fear their strong paws and sharp nails, did not care to approach them. But at last, worn out with the race, the troop stopped, and the old man leaned against the trunk of a tree, ready to defend himself. One of the pointers, carried away by excitement, went up to him. Next minute the unfortunate beast leaped into the air and fell down again, completely ripped up. The whole pack, indeed, would have had little chance with these powerful marsupia. They had to dispatch the fellow with rifles. Nothing but balls could bring down the gigantic animal. Just at this moment Robert was well nigh the victim of his own imprudence. To make sure of his aim he had approached too near the kangaroo, and the animal leaped upon him immediately. Robert gave out a loud cry and fell. Mary Grant saw it all from the break, and in an agony of terror, speechless and almost unable even to see, stretched out her arms toward her little brother. No one dared to fire for fear of founding the child. But John Mangles opened his hunting knife, and at the risk of being ripped up himself, 
sprang at the animal, and plunged it into his heart. The beast dropped forward, and Robert rose unhurt. Next minute he was in his sister's arms. "'Thank you, Mr. John, thank you,' she said, holding out her hand to the young captain. "'I had pledged myself for his safety,' was all John said, taking her trembling fingers into his own. This occurrence ended the sport. The band of Marsupia had disappeared after the death of their leader. The hunting party returned home, bringing their game with them. It was then six o'clock. A magnificent dinner was ready. Among other things, there was one dish that was a great success. It was kangaroo tail soup, prepared in the native manner. Next morning, very early, they took leave of the young squatters, with hearty thanks and a positive promise from them of a visit to Malcolm Castle, when they should return to Europe. Then the wagon began to move away, round the foot of Mount Hottam, and soon the hospitable dwelling disappeared from the sight, of the travellers like some brief vision which had come and gone. For five miles further, the horses were still treading the station lands. It was not till nine o'clock that they had passed the last fence, and entered the almost unknown districts of the province of Victoria. End of Book 2, Chapter 14book two chapter fifteen of in search of the castaways this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by christine in search of the castaways or the children of captain grant by jules verne book two chapter fifteen Suspicious Occurrences An immense barrier lay across the route to the southeast. It was the Australian Alps, a vast fortification, the fantastic curtain of which extended 1,500 miles and pierced the clouds at the height of 4,000 feet. The cloudy sky only allowed the heat to reach the ground through a close veil of mist. The temperature was just bearable, but the road was toilsome from its uneven character. The extumescences on the plain became more and more marked. Several mounds planted with green young gum trees appeared here and there. Further on these protuberances, rising sharply, formed the first steps of the great Alps. From this time their course was a continual ascent, as was soon evident in the strain it made on the bullocks to drag along the cumbrous wagon. Their yoke creaked, they breathed heavily, and the muscles of their hoofs were stretched as if they would burst. The planks of the vehicle groaned at the unexpected jolts, which Ayrton, with all his skill, could not prevent. The ladies bore their share of discomfort bravely. John Mangles and his two sailors acted as scouts, and went about a hundred steps in advance. They found out practical paths, or passes, indeed they might be called, for these projections of the ground were like so many rocks, between which the wagon had to steer carefully. It required absolute navigation to find a safe way over the billowy region. It was a difficult and often perilous task. Many a time Wilson's hatchet was obliged to open a passage through thick tangles of shrubs. The damp, argillaceous soil gave way under their feet. The route was indefinitely prolonged, owing to the insurmountable obstacles, huge blocks of granite, deep ravines, suspected lagoons, which obliged them to make a thousand detours. When night came, they found they had only gone over half a degree. They camped at the foot of the Alps, on the banks of the creek of Cobongra, on the edge of a little plain, covered with little shrubs four feet high, with bright red leaves which gladdened the eye. We shall have hard work to get over, said Glenarvan, looking at the chain of mountains, the outlines of which were fast fading away in the deepening darkness. The very name Alps gives plenty of room for reflection. It is not quite so big as it sounds, my dear Glenarvan. Don't suppose you have a whole Switzerland to traverse. In Australia there are the Grampians, the Pyrenees, the Alps, the Blue Mountains, as in Europe and America but in miniature. 
This simply implies either that the imagination of geographers is not infinite, or that their vocabulary of proper names is very poor. Then these Australian Alps, said Lord Glevarvan, are mere pocket mountains, put in Paganel. We shall get over them without knowing it. Speak for yourself, said the Major. It would certainly take a very absent man who could cross over a chain of mountains and not know it. Absent? But I am not an absent man now. I appeal to the ladies. Since ever I set foot on the Australian continent, have I been once on fault? Can you reproach me with a single blunder? Not one, Monsieur Paganel, said Mary Grant. You are now the most perfect of men. Too perfect, added Lady Helena, laughing. Your blunders suited you admirably. Didn't they, madame? If I have no faults now, I shall soon get like everybody else. I hope that I shall make some outrageous mistake before long, which will give you a good laugh. You see, unless I make mistakes, it seems to me I fail in my vocation. Next day, the ninth of January, notwithstanding the assurances of the confident geographer, it was not without great difficulty that the little troop made its way through the Alpine Pass. They were obliged to go at a venture, and enter the depths of narrow gorges without any certainty of an outlet. Ayrton would doubtless have found himself very much embarrassed if a little inn, a miserable public house, had not suddenly presented itself. "'My goodness!' cried Paganel. "'The landlord of this inn won't make his fortune in a place like this. What is the use of it here?' "'To give us the information we want about the route,' replied Glenarvan. "'Let us go in.' Glenarvan, followed by Ayrton, entered the inn forthwith. The landlord of the Bush Inn, as it was called, was a coarse man with an ill-tempered face, who must have considered himself his principal customer for the gin, brandy, and whisky he had to sell. He seldom saw any one but the squatters and rovers. He answered all the questions put to him in a surly tone. But his replies sufficed to make the route clear to Ayrton, and that was all that was wanted. Glenarvan rewarded him with a handful of silver for his trouble, and was about to leave the tavern, when a placard against the wall arrested his attention. It was a police notice, and announcing the escape of the convicts from Perth, and offering a reward for the capture of Ben Joyce of pounds hundred sterling. "'He is a fellow that's worth hanging, and no mistake,' said Glenarvan to the quartermaster. "'And worth capturing still more. But what a sum to offer. He is not worth it. I don't feel very sure of the innkeeper, so, in spite of the notice, said Glenarvan. No more do I, replied Ayrton. They went back to the wagon, toward the point where the route to Lucknow stopped. A narrow path wound away from this, which led across the chain in a slanting direction. They had commenced the ascent. It was hard work. More than once both the ladies and gentlemen had to get down and walk. They were obliged to help to push round the wheels of the heavy vehicle, and to support it frequently in dangerous declivities, to unharness the bullocks when the team could not go well round sharp turnings, prop up the wagon when it threatened to roll back, and more than once Ayrton had to reinforce his bullocks by harnessing the horses, although they were tired out already with dragging themselves along. Whether it was this prolonged fatigue, or from some other cause altogether, was not known. But one of the horses sank suddenly, without the slightest symptom of illness. It was Mulrady's horse that fell, and on attempting to pull it up, the animal was found to be dead. Ayrton examined it immediately, but was quite at a loss to account for the disaster. "'The beast must have broken some blood vessels,' said Glenarvan. "'Evidently,' replied Ayrton." "'Take my horse, Mulrady,' added Glenarvan. "'I will join Lady Helena in the wagon.' Mulrady obeyed, and the little party continued their fatiguing ascent, leaving the carcass of the dead animal to the ravens. The Australian Alps are of no great thickness, and the base is not more than eight miles wide. Consequently, if the pass chosen by Ayrton came out on the eastern side, they might hope to get over the high barrier within forty-eight hours more. 
the difficulty of the route would then be surmounted, and they would only have to get to the sea. During the 18th, the travelers reached the topmost point of the pass, about 2,000 feet high. They found themselves on an open plateau, with nothing to intercept the view. Toward the north, the quiet waters of Lake Omco, all alive with aquatic birds, and beyond, this lay the vast plains of the Moray. To the south were the wide-spreading plains of Gippsland, with its abundant gold fields and tall forests. Their nature was still mistress of the products and water, and great trees where the woodman's axe was as yet unknown, and the squatters, then five in number, could not struggle against her. It seemed as if this chain of the Alps separated two different countries, one of which had retained its primitive wildness. The sun went down, and a few solitary rays piercing the rosy clouds lighted up the Murray district, leaving Gippsland in deep shadow as if night had suddenly fallen on the whole region. The contrast was presented very vividly to the spectators placed between these two countries so divided, and some emotion filled the minds of the travelers, as they contemplated the almost unknown district they were about to traverse, right to the frontiers of Victoria. They camped on the plateau that night, and next day the descent commenced. It was tolerably rapid, a hailstorm of extreme violence assailed the travelers, and obliged them to seek a shelter among the rocks. It was not hailstones, but regular lumps of ice, as large as one's hand, which fell from the stormy clouds. A waterspout could not have come down with more violence, and sundry big bruises warned Paganel and Robert to retreat. The wagon was riddled in several places, and few coverings would have held out against those sharp icicles, some of which had fastened themselves into the trunks of the trees. It was impossible to go on till this tremendous shower was over, unless the travelers wished to be stoned. It lasted about an hour, and then the march commenced anew over slanting rocks still slippery after the hail. Toward evening the wagon, very much shaken and disjointed in several parts, but still standing firm on its wooden discs, came down the last slopes of the Alps, among great isolated pines. The passage ended in the plains of Gippsland. The chain of the Alps was safely passed, and the usual arrangements were made for the nightly encampment. On the 21st, at daybreak, the journey was resumed with an ardor which never relaxed. Everyone was eager to reach the goal, that is to say, the Pacific Ocean, and at that part where the wreck of the Britannia had occurred. Nothing could be done in the lonely wilds of Gippsland, and Ayrton urged Lord Glenarvan to send orders at once for the Duncan to repair to the coast, in order to have at hand all means of research. He thought it would certainly be advisable to take advantage of the Lucknow route to Melbourne. If they waited, it would be difficult to find any way of direct communication with the capital. This advice seemed good, and Paganel recommended that they should act upon it. He also thought that the presence of the yacht would be very useful, and he added that if the Lucknow Road was once passed, it would be impossible to communicate with Melbourne. Glenarvan was undecided what to do, and perhaps he would have yielded to Ayrton's arguments, if the Major had not combated this decision vigorously. He maintained that the presence of Ayrton was necessary to the expedition that he would know the country about the coast, and that if any chance should put them on the track of Harry Grant, the quartermaster would be better able to follow it up than any one else, and finally, that he alone could point out the exact spot where the shipwreck occurred. McNabbs voted, therefore, for the continuation of the voyage, without making the least change in their program. John Mangles was of the same opinion, the young captain said even that orders would reach Duncan more easily from Twofold Bay than if a message was sent two hundred miles over a wild country. His counsel prevailed. It was decided that they should wait till they come to Twofold Bay. The major watched Ayrton narrowly and noticed his disappointed look. But he said nothing, keeping his observations, as usual, to himself. The plains which lay at the foot of the Australian Alps were level, but slightly inclined towards the east. Great clumps of mimosas and eucalyptus and various odorous gum trees broke the uniform monotony here and there. 
the gastrolobium grandiflorum covered the ground, with its bushes covered with gay flowers. Several unimportant creeks, mere streams full of little rushes, and half covered up with orchids, often interrupted the route. They had to ford these. Flocks of bustards and emus fled at the approach of the travelers. Below the shrubs, kangaroos were leaping and springing like dancing jacks. But the hunters of the party were not thinking much of the sport, and the horses little needed any additional fatigue. Moreover, a sultry heat oppressed the plain. The atmosphere was completely saturated with electricity, and its influence was felt by men and beasts. They just dragged themselves along and cared for nothing else. The silence was only interrupted by the cries of Ayrton, urging on his burdened team. From noon to two o'clock, they went through a curious forest of ferns, which would have excited the admiration of less fiery travelers. These plants in full flower measured thirty feet in height. Horses and riders passed easily beneath their drooping leaves, and sometimes the spores would clash against the woody stems. Beneath these immovable parasols there was a refreshing coolness which everyone appreciated. Jacques Paganel, always demonstrative, gave such deep sighs of satisfaction that the parroquets and cockatoos flew out in alarm, making a deafening chorus of noisy chatter. The geographer was going on with his sighs and jubilations with the utmost coolness, when his companions suddenly saw him reel forward, and he and his horse fell down in a lump. Was it giddiness, or worse still, suffocation caused by the high temperature? They ran to him, exclaiming, Paganel, Paganel, what is the matter? Just this, I have no horse now, he replied, disengaging his feet from the stirrups. What, your horse? Dead like Mulready's, as if a thunderbolt had struck him. Glenarvan, John Mangles, and Wilson examined the animal, and found Paganel was right. His horse had been suddenly struck dead. That is strange, said John. Very strange, truly, muttered the Major. Glenarvan was greatly disturbed by this fresh accident. He could not get a fresh horse in the desert, and if an epidemic was going to seize their steeds, they would be seriously embarrassed how to proceed. Before the close of the day, it seemed as if the word epidemic was really going to be justified. A third horse, Wilson's, fell dead, and what was perhaps equally disastrous, one of the bullocks also. The means of traction and transport were now reduced to three bullocks and four horses. The situation became grave. The unmounted horsemen might walk, of course, as many squatters had done already. But if they abandoned the wagon, what would the ladies do? Could they go over the one hundred and twenty miles which lay between them and Twofold Bay? John Mangles and Lord Glenarvan examined the surviving horses with great uneasiness. But there was not the slightest symptom of illness or feebleness in them. The animals were in perfect health, and bravely bearing the fatigues of the voyage. This somewhat reassured Glenarvan, and made him hope that malady would strike no more victims. Ayrton agreed with him, but was unable to find the least solution of the mystery. They went on again, the wagon serving from time to time as a house of rest for the pedestrians. In the evening, after a march of only ten miles, the signal to halt was given, and the tent pitched. The night passed without inconvenience beneath a vast mass of bushy ferns, under which enormous bats, properly called flying foxes, were flapping about. The next day's journey was good. There were no new calamities. The health of the expedition remained satisfactory. Horses and cattle did their task cheerily. Lady Helena's drawing-room was very lively, thanks to the number of visitors. Mr. Albinet busied himself in passing round refreshments, which were very acceptable in such hot weather. Half a barrel of Scotch ale was sent in bodily. Barclay and Co. was declared to be the greatest man in Great Britain, even above Wellington, who could never have manufactured such good beer. This was a Scotch estimate. Jacques Paganel drank largely, and discoursed still more, the omni rescibili. A day so well commenced seemed as if it could not but end well. They had gone fifteen good miles, and managed to get over a pretty hilly district, where the soil was reddish. 
There was every reason to hope they might camp that same night on the banks of the Snowy River, an important river which throws itself into the Pacific, south of Victoria. Already the wheels of the wagon were making deep ruts on the wide plains, covered with blackish alluvium, as it passed on between tufts of luxuriant grass and fresh fields of gastrolobium. As evening came on, a white mist on the horizon marked the course of the Snowy River. Several additional miles were got over, and a forest of tall trees came in sight at a bend of the road, behind a gentle eminence. Ayrton turned his team a little toward the great trunks, lost in shadow, and he had got to the skirts of the wood about half a mile from the river, when the wagon suddenly sank up to the middle of the wheels. Stop, he called out to the horseman following him. What is wrong? inquired Glenarvan. We have stuck in the mud, replied Ayrton. He tried to stimulate the bullocks to a fresh effort by voice and goad, but the animals were buried halfway up their legs and could not stir. Let us come here, suggested John Mangles. It would certainly be the best place, said Ayrton. We shall see by daylight tomorrow how to get ourselves out. Glenarvan acted on their advice and came to a halt. Night came on rapidly after a brief twilight, but the heat did not withdraw with the light. Stifling vapors filled the air, and occasionally bright flashes of lightning, the reflections of a distant storm, lighted up the sky with a fiery glare. Arrangements were made for the night immediately. They did the best they could with the sunk wagon, and the tent was pitched beneath the shelter of the great trees, and if the rain did not come, they had not much to complain about. Ayrton succeeded though with some difficulty, in extricating the three bullocks. These courageous beasts were engulfed up to their flanks. The quartermaster turned them out with the four horses, and allowed no one but himself to see after their pasturage. He always executed his task wisely, and this evening Glenarvan noticed he redoubled his care, for which he took occasion to thank him, the preservation of the team being of supreme importance. Meantime, the travelers were dispatching a hasty supper. Fatigue and heat destroy appetite, and sleep was needed more than food. Lady Helena and Miss Grant speedily bade the company good night and retired. Their companions soon stretched themselves under the tent or outside under the trees, which is no great hardship in this salubrious climate. Gradually they all fell into a heavy sleep. The darkness deepened owing to a thick current of clouds which overspread the sky. There was not a breath of wind. The silence of night was only interrupted by the cries of the moorfolk in the minor key, like the mournful cuckoos of Europe. Towards eleven o'clock, after a wretched, heavy, unrefreshing sleep, the Major woke. His half-closed eyes were struck with a faint light running amongst the great trees. It looked like a white sheet and glittered like a lake and McNabb thought at first it was the commencement of a fire. He started up and went towards the wood, but what was his surprise to perceive a purely natural phenomenon? Before him lay an immense bed of mushrooms, which emitted a phosphorescent light. The luminous spores of the cryptograms shone in the darkness with intensity. The Major, who had no selfishness about him, was going to waken Paganel, that he might see this phenomenon with his own eyes, when something occurred which arrested him. This phosphorescent light illuminated the distance half a mile, and McNabbs fancied he saw a shadow pass across the edge of it. Were his eyes deceiving him? Was it some hallucination? McNabbs lay down on the ground, and, after a close scrutiny, he could distinctly see several men stooping down and lifting themselves up alternately, as if they were looking on the ground for recent marks. The Major resolved to find out what these fellows were about, and without the least hesitation, or so much as arousing his companions, crept along, lying flat on the ground, like a savage on the prairies, completely hidden among the long grass. End of Book 2, Chapter 15Book Two, Chapter Sixteen, of In Search of the Castaways. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine In Search of the Castaways, or the Children of Captain Grant, by Jules Verne. Book 2, Chapter 16 A Startling Discovery It was a frightful night. At 2 a.m. the rain began to fall in torrents from the stormy clouds, and continued till daybreak. The tent became an insufficient shelter. Glenarvan and his companions took refuge in the wagon. They did not sleep, but talked of one thing and another. The Major alone, whose brief absence has not been noticed, contented himself with being a silent listener. There was reason to fear that if the storm lasted longer, the snowy river would overflow its banks, which would be a very unlucky thing for the wagon, stuck fast as it was already in the soft ground. Mulrady, Ayrton, and Mangles went several times to ascertain the height of the water, and came back dripping from head to foot. At last day appeared, the rain ceased, but sunlight could not break through the thick clouds. Large patches of yellowish water, muddy, dirty ponds indeed they were, covered the ground. A hot steam rose from the soaking earth, and shattered the atmosphere with unhealthy humidity. Glenarvan's first concern was the wagon. This was the main thing in his eyes. They examined the ponderous vehicle, and found it sunk in the mud in a deep hollow in a stiff clay. The forepart had disappeared completely, and the hind part up to the axle. It would be a hard job to get the heavy conveyance out, and would need the united strength of men, bullocks, and horses. At any rate, we must make haste, said John Mangles. If the clay dries, it will make our task still more difficult. Let us be quick, then, replied Ayrton. Glenarvan, his two sailors, John Mangles and Ayrton, went off at once into the wood, where the animals had passed the night. It was a gloomy-looking forest of tall gum trees, nothing but dead trees, with wide spaces between, which had been barked for ages, or rather skinned like the cork oak at harvest time. A miserable network of bare branches was seen above two hundred feet high in the air. Not a bird built its nest in these aerial skeletons, not a leaf trembled on the dry branches, which rattled together like bones. To what cataclysm is this phenomenon to be attributed, so frequent in Australia? Entire forests struck dead by some epidemic, no one knows. Neither the oldest natives, nor their ancestors who have lain along buried in the groves of the dead, have ever seen them green. Glenarvan, as he went along, kept his eye fixed on the gray sky, on which the smallest branch of the gum trees was sharply defined. Ayrton was astonished not to discover the horses and bullocks where he had left them, the preceding night. They could not have wandered far with their hobbles on their legs. They looked over the wood, but saw no signs of them, and Ayrton returned to the banks of the river, where magnificent mimosas were growing. He gave a cry well known to his team, but there was no reply. The quartermaster seemed uneasy, and his companions looked at him with disappointed faces. An hour had passed in vain endeavors, and Glenarvan was about to go back to the wagon, when a neigh struck on his ear, and immediately after a bellow. "'They are there!' cried John Mangles, slipping between the tall branches of Gastrolobium, which grew high enough to hide a whole flock. Glenarvan, Mulready, and Ayrton darted after him, and speedily shared his stupefaction at the spectacle which met their gaze. Two bullocks and three horses lay stretched on the ground, struck down like the rest. Their bodies were already cold, and a flock of half-starved looking ravens, croaking among the mimosas, were watching the unexpected prey. Glenarvan and his party gazed at each other, and Wilson could not keep back the oath that rose to his lips. "'What do you mean, Wilson?' said Glenarvan, with difficulty controlling himself. "'Ayrton, bring away the bullock and the horse we have left. They will have to serve us now.' "'If the wagon were not sunk in the mud,' said Jungle Mangles, "'these two animals, by making short journeys, would be able to take us to the coast. So we must get the vehicle out, cost what it may.' "'We will try, John,' replied Glenarvan. "'Let us go back now.' or they will be uneasy at our long absence. 
Ayrton removed the hobbles from the bullock and Mulrady from the horse, and they began to return to the encampment, following the winding margin of the river. In half an hour they rejoined Paganel and McNabbs and the ladies, and told them of this fresh disaster. "'Upon my honor, Ayrton,' the Major could not help saying, it is a pity that you hadn't had the shoeing of all our beasts when we forded the Wimera. Why, sir? asked Ayrton. Because out of all our horses only the one new blacksmith had in his hands has escaped the common fate. That's true, said John Mangles. It's strange it happens so. A mere chance and nothing more, replied the quartermaster, looking firmly at the major. Major McNabbs bit his lips, as if to keep back something he was about to say. Glenarvan and the rest waited for him to speak out his thoughts, but the Major was silent and went up to his wagon, which Ayrton was examining. "'What was he going to say, Mangles?' asked Glenarvan. "'I don't know,' replied the young captain, "'but the Major is not at all a man to speak without reason.' "'No, John,' said Lady Helena, McNabbs must have suspicions about Ayrton. Suspicions! exclaimed Paganel, shrugging his shoulders. And what can they be? asked Glenarvan. Does he suppose him capable of having killed our horses and bullocks? And for what purpose? Is not Ayrton's interest identical with our own? You are right, dear Edward, said Lady Helena. And what is more, the quartermaster has given us incontestable proofs of his devotion ever since the commencement of the journey. Certainly he has, replied Mangles. But still, what could the major mean? I wish he would speak his mind plainly out. Does he suppose him acting in concert with the convicts? asked Paganel imprudently. What convicts? said Miss Grant. Monsignor Paganel is making a mistake, replied John Mangles instantly. He knows very well there are no convicts in the province of Victoria. Ah, that's true, returned Paganel, trying to get out of his unlucky speech. Whatever had I got in my head? Convicts. Who ever heard of convicts being in Australia? Besides, they would scarcely have disembarked before they would turn into good, honest men. The climate, you know, Miss Mary, the regenerative climate. Here the poor savant stuck fast unable to get further, like the wagon in the mud. Lady Helena looked at him in surprise, which quite deprived him of his remaining sang -froid. but seeing his embarrassment, she took Mary away to the side of the tent, where M. Albinet was laying out an elaborate breakfast. "'I deserve to be transported myself,' said Paganel woefully. "'I think so,' said Glenarvan." And after this grave reply, which completely overwhelmed the worthy geographer, Glenarvan and John Mangles went toward the wagon. They found Ayrton and the two sailors doing their best to get it out of the deep ruts, and the bullock and horse, yoked together, were straining every muscle. Wilson and Mulrady were pushing the wheels, and the quartermaster urging on the team with voice and goad. But the heavy vehicle did not stir, the clay, already dry, held it as firmly as if sealed by some hydraulic cement. John Mangles had the clay water to loosen it, but it was of no use. After renewed vigorous efforts, men and animals stopped. Unless the vehicle was taken to pieces, it would be impossible to extricate it from the mud. But they had no tools for the purpose, and could not attempt such a task. However, Ayrton, who was for conquering this obstacle at all costs, was about to commence afresh, when Glenarvan stopped him by saying, "'Enough, Ayrton, enough. We must husband the strength of our remaining horse and bullock. If we are obliged to continue our journey on foot, the one animal can carry the ladies, and the other the provisions. They may thus still be of great service to us.' "'Well, well, my lord,' replied the quartermaster, unyoking the exhausted beast. "'Now, friends,' added Glenarvan, let us return to the encampment and deliberately examine our situation, and determine on our course of action. After a tolerably good breakfast to make up for their bad night, the discussion was opened, and every one of the party was asked to give his opinion. The first point was to ascertain their exact position, and this was referred to Paganel, 
who informed them, with his customary rigorous accuracy, that the expedition had been stopped on the 37th parallel in longitude 147 degrees 53 minutes, on the banks of the Snowy River. "'What is the exact longitude of Twofold Bay?' asked Glenarvan. "'150 degrees,' replied Paganel. Two degrees seven minutes distant from this, and that is equal to seventy-five miles. And Melbourne is? Two hundred miles off, at least. Very good. Our position being then settled, what is the best to do? The response was unanimous to get to the coast without delay. Lady Helena and Mary Grant undertook to go five miles a day. The courageous ladies did not shrink, if necessary, from walking the whole distance between the Snowy River and Twofold Bay. "'You are a brave travelling companion, dear Helena,' said Lord Glenarvan. "'But are we sure of finding at the bay all we want when we get there?' "'Without the least doubt,' replied Paganel. "'Eden is a municipality which already numbers many years in existence. Its port must have frequent communication with Melbourne.' I suppose even at Delegiti, on the Victoria frontier, thirty-five miles from here, we might revictual our expedition and find fresh means of transport. And the Duncan? asked Ayrton. Don't you think it advisable to send for her to come to the bay? What do you think, John? said Glenarvan. I don't think your lordship should be in any hurry about it, replied the young captain, after brief reflection. There will be time enough to give orders to Tom Austin and summon him to the coast. That's quite certain, added Paganel. You see, said John, in four or five days we shall reach Eden. Four or five days, repeated Ayrton, shaking his head. Say fifteen or twenty, Captain, if you don't want to repent your mistake when it is too late. Fifteen or twenty days to go seventy-five miles, cried Glenarvan. At the least, my lord, you are going to traverse the most difficult portion of Victoria, a desert, where everything is wanting, the squatters say, plains covered with scrub, where is no beaten track and no stations. You will have to walk hatchet or torch in one hand, and believe me, that's not quick work. Ayrton had spoken in a firm tone, and Paganel, at whom all the others looked inquiringly, nodded his head in token of his agreement in opinion with the quartermaster. But John Mangles said, Well, admitting these difficulties, in fifteen days at most, your lordship can send orders to the Duncan. I have to add, said Ayrton, that the principal difficulties are not the obstacles in the road, but the snowy river has to be crossed, and most probably we must wait till the water goes down. Wait, cried John, is there no ford? I think not, replied Ayrton. This morning I was looking for some practical crossing, but could not find any. It is unusual to meet with such a tumultuous river at this time of the year, and it is a fatality against which I am powerless. Is the snowy river wide? asked Lady Helena. Wide and deep, madam, replied Ayrton, a mile wide, with an impetuous current. A good swimmer could not go over without danger. Let us build a boat, then, said Robert who never stuck at anything. We have only to cut down a tree and hollow it out, and get in and be off. He is going ahead, this boy of Captain Grant's, said Paganel. And he's right, returned John Mangles. We shall be forced to come to that, and I think it is useless to waste our time in idle discussion. What do you think of it, Ayrton? asked Glenarvan seriously. I think, my lord, that a month hence, unless some help arrives, we shall find ourselves still on the banks of the Snowy. Well, then, have you any better plan to propose? said John Mangles, somewhat impatiently. Yes, that the Duncan should leave Melbourne and go to the east coast. Oh, always the same story. And how could her presence at the bay facilitate our means of getting there? Ayrton waited an instant before answering, and then said, rather evasively, I have no wish to obtrude my opinions. What I do is for our common good, and I am ready to start the moment his owner gives the signal. And he crossed his arms, and was silent. 
"'That is no reply, Ayrton,' said Glenarvan. "'Tell us your plan, and we will discuss it. "'What is it you propose?' Ayrton replied in a calm tone of assurance. "'I propose that we should not venture beyond the snowy in our present condition. "'It is here we must wait till help comes, "'and this help can only come from the Duncan. "'Let us come here, where we have provisions, "'and let one of us take your orders to Tom Austin to go on to Twofold Bay.' This unexpected proposition was greeted with astonishment, and by John Mangles with openly expressed opposition. Continued Ayrton, either the river will get lower and allow us to ford it, or we shall have time to make a canoe. This is the plan I submit for your lordship's approval. Well, Ayrton, replied Glenarvan, your plan is worthy of serious consideration. The worst thing about it is the delay it would cause, but it would save us a great fatigue and perhaps danger. What do you think of it, friends? Speak your mind, McNabbs, said Lady Helena. Since the beginning of the discussion you have been only a listener, and very sparing of your words. Since you ask my advice, said the Major, I will give it to you frankly. I think Ayrton has spoken wisely and well, and I side with him. Such a reply was hardly looked for, as hitherto the major had been strongly opposed to Ayrton's project. Ayrton himself was surprised, and gave a hasty glance at the major. However, Paganel, Lady Helena, and the sailors were all of the same way of thinking, and since McNabbs had come over to his opinion, Glenarvan decided that the quartermaster's plan should be adopted in principle. And now, John, he added, don't you think yourself it would be prudent to encamp here, on the banks of the river Snowy, till we can get some means of conveyance? Yes, replied John Mangles, if our messenger can get across the Snowy, where we cannot. All eyes were turned to the quartermaster, who said, with the air of a man who knew what he was about, The messenger will not cross the river. Indeed, said John Mangles. He will simply go back to the Lucknow Road, which leads straight to Melbourne. Go two hundred and fifty miles on foot, cried the young captain. On horseback, replied Ayrton. There is one horse sound enough at present. It will only be an affair of four days. Allow the Duncan two days more to get to the bay and twenty hours to get back to the camp, and in a week the messenger can be back with the entire crew of the vessel. The major nodded approvingly as Ayrton spoke, to the profound astonishment of John Mangles. But as every one was in favor of the plan, all there was to do was to carry it out as quickly as possible. "'Now then, friends,' said Glenarvan, "'we must settle who is to be our messenger. It will be a fatiguing, perilous mission. I would not conceal the fact from you. Who is disposed, then, to sacrifice himself for his companions, and carry our instructions to Melbourne?' Wilson and Mulready, and also Paganel, John Mangles and Robert, instantly offered their services. John particularly insisted that he should be entrusted with the business. But Ayrton, who had been silent until that moment, now said, "'With your honor's permission, I will go myself. I am accustomed to all the country round. Many a time I have been across worse parts. I can go through where another would stick. I ask, then, for the good of all, that I may be sent to Melbourne. A word from you will accredit me with your chief officer, and in six days I guarantee that Duncan shall be in Twofold Bay. That's well spoken, replied Glenarvan. You are a clever, daring fellow, and you will succeed. It was quite evident the quartermaster was the fittest man for the mission. All the rest withdrew from the competition. John Mangles made this one last objection that the presence of Ayrton was necessary to discover traces of the Britannia or Harry Grant. But the Major justly observed that the expedition would remain on the banks of the Snowy till the return of Ayrton, that they had no idea of resuming their search without him, and that consequently his absence would not in the least prejudice the captain's interests. "'Well, go, Ayrton,' said Glenarvan. "'Be as quick as you can, and come back by Eden to our camp. A gleam of satisfaction shot across the quartermaster's face. He turned away his head, 
but not before John Mangles caught the look, and instinctively felt his old distrust of Ayrton revive. The quartermaster made immediate preparations for departure, assisted by the two sailors, one of whom saw to the horse and the other to the provisions. Glenarvan, meantime, brought his letter to Tom Austin. He ordered his chief officer to repair without delay to Twofold Bay. He introduced the quartermaster to him as a man worthy of all confidence. On arriving at the coast, Tom was to dispatch a detachment of sailors from the yacht under his orders. Glenarvan was just at this part of his letter when McNabbs, who was following him with his eyes, asked him in a singular tone how he wrote Ayrton's name. Why, as it is pronounced, of course, replied Glenarvan. It is a mistake, replied the Major quietly. He pronounces it Ayrton, but he writes it Ben Joyce. End of Book Two, Chapter Sixteen. Book Two, Chapter Seventeen of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Search of the Castaways, or the Children of Captain Grant, by Jules Verne. Book 2, Chapter 17. The Plot Unveiled. The revelation of Tom Ayrton's name was like a clap of thunder. Ayrton had started up quickly and grasped his revolver. A report was heard, and Glenarvan fell wounded by a ball. Gunshots resounded at the same time outside. John Mangles and the sailors, after their first surprise, would have seized Ben Joyce, but the bold convict had already disappeared and rejoined his gang scattered among the gum trees. The tent was no shelter against the balls. It was necessary to beat a retreat. Glenarvan was slightly wounded, but could stand up. To the wagon, to the wagon, cried John Mangles, dragging Lady Helena and Mary Grant along, who were soon in safety behind the thick curtains. John and the Major, and Paganel and the sailors, seized their carbines in readiness to repulse the convicts. Glenarvan and Robert went in beside the ladies, while all Bennett rushed to the common defense. These events occurred with the rapidity of lightning. John Mangles watched the skirts of the wood attentively. The reports had ceased suddenly on the arrival of Ben Joyce. Profound silence had succeeded the noisy fusillade. A few wreaths of white smoke were still curling over the tops of the gum trees. The tall tufts of gastrolobium were motionless. All signs of attack had disappeared. The Major and John Mangles examined the wood closely as far as the great trees. The place was abundant. Numerous footmarks were there, and several half-burned caps were lying smoking on the ground. The Major, like a prudent man, extinguished these carefully for a spark would be enough to kindle a tremendous conflagration in this forest of dry trees. "'The convicts have disappeared,' said John Mangles. "'Yes,' replied the Major, "'and the disappearance of them makes me uneasy. I prefer seeing them face to face. Better to meet a tiger on the plain than a serpent in the grass. Let us beat the bushes all round the wagon.' The Major and John hunted all round the country, but there was not a convict to be seen from the edge of the wood right down to the river. Ben Joyce and his gang seemed to have flown away like a flock of marauding birds. It was too sudden a disappearance to let the travelers feel perfectly safe. Consequently, they resolved to keep a sharp lookout. The wagon, a regular fortress buried in mud, was made the center of the camp, and two men mounted guard round it, who were relieved hour by hour. The first care of Lady Helena and Mary was to dress Glenarvan's wound. Lady Helena rushed toward him in terror as he fell, down struck by Ben Joyce's ball. Controlling her agony, the courageous woman helped her husband into the wagon. Then his shoulder was bared, and the Major found, on examination, that the ball had only gone into the flesh, and there was no internal lesion. Neither bone nor muscle appeared to be injured. The wound bled profusely, 
but Glenarvan could use his fingers and forearm, and consequently there was no occasion for any uneasiness about the issue. As soon as his shoulder was dressed, he would not allow any more fuss to be made about himself, but at once entered on the business in hand. All the party, except Mulrady and Wilson, who were on guard, were brought into the wagon, and the Major was asked to explain how this denouncement had come about. Before commencing his recital, he told Lady Helena about the escape of the convicts at Perth, and their appearance in Victoria, and as also their complicity in the railway catastrophe. He handed her the Australian and New Zealand Gazette they had bought in Seymour, and added that a reward had been offered by the police for the apprehension of Ben Joyce, a redoubtable bandit who had become a noted character during the last eighteen months for doing deeds of villainy and crime. But how had McNabbs found out that Ayrton and Ben Joyce were one and the same individual? This was the mystery to be unraveled, and the Major soon explained it. Ever since their first meeting, McNabbs had felt an instinctive distrust of the quartermaster. Two or three insignificant facts, a hasty glance exchanged between him and the blacksmith of the Wimmera River, his unwillingness to cross towns and villages, his persistence about getting the Duncan summoned to the coast, the strange death of the animals entrusted to his care, and lastly, a want of frankness in all his behavior, all these details combined had awakened the major's suspicions. However, he could not have brought any direct accusation against him till the events of the preceding evening had occurred. He then told of his experience. McNabbs, slipping between the tall shrubs, got within reach of the suspicious shadows he had noticed about half a mile away from the encampment. The phosphorescent furs emitted a faint light, by which he could discern three men examining marks on the ground, and one of the three was the blacksmith of Black Point. "'It is them,' said one of the men. "'Yes,' replied another. "'There is the trefoil on the mark of the horseshoe.' It has been like that since the Wimera. All the horses are dead. The poison is not far off. There is enough to kill a regiment of cavalry. A useful plant, says Gastrolobium. I heard them say this to each other, and then they were quite silent. But I did not know enough yet, so I followed them. Soon the conversation began again. He is a clever fellow, this Ben Joyce, said the blacksmith. A capital quartermaster, with his invention of shipwreck. If his project succeeds, it will be a stroke of fortune. He is a very devil, is this Ayrton. Call him Ben Joyce, for he has well earned his name. And then the scoundrels left the forest. I had all the information I wanted now, and came back to the camp quite convinced, begging Paganel's pardon, that Australia does not reform criminals. This was all the Major's story, and his companions sat silently thinking over it. "'Then Ayrton has dragged us here,' said Glenarvan, pale with anger, "'on purpose to rob and assassinate us.' "'For nothing else,' replied the Major, "'and ever since we left the Wimmera, "'his gang has been on our track and spying on us, "'waiting for a favorable opportunity.' "'Yes.' Then the wretch was never one of the sailors on the Britannia. He had stolen the name of Ayrton and the shipping papers. They were all looking at McNabbs for an answer, for he must have put the question to himself already. There is no great certainty about the matter, he replied, in his usual calm voice. But in my opinion the man's name is really Ayrton. Ben Joyce is his nom de coeur. It is an incontestable fact that he knew Harry Grant, and also that he was quartermaster of the Britannia. These facts were proved by the minute details given us by Ayrton, and are corroborated by the conversation between the convicts, which I repeated to you. We need not lose ourselves in vain conjectures, but consider it as certain that Ben Joyce is Ayrton, and that Ayrton is Ben Joyce, that is to say, one of the crew of the Britannia has turned leader of the convict gang. 
The explanations of McNabbs were accepted without discussion. "'Now then,' said Glenarvan, "'will you tell us how and why Harry Grant's quartermaster comes to be in Australia?' "'How, I don't know,' replied McNabbs, "'and the police declare they are as ignorant on the subject as myself. "'Why, it is impossible to say. "'That is a mystery which the future may explain.' "'The police are not even aware of Ayrton's identity with Ben Joyce,' said John Mangles. "'You are right, John,' replied the Major, "'and this circumstance would throw light on their search.' "'Then, I suppose,' said Lady Helena, "'the wicked wretch had got to work on Paddy O'Moore's farm with a criminal intent?' "'There is not the least doubt of it. "'He was planning some evil design against the Irishman "'when a better chance presented itself.' Chance led us into his presence. He heard Paganel's story and all about the shipwreck, and the audacious fellow determined to act his part immediately. The expedition was decided on. At the Wimera he found means of communicating with one of his gang, the blacksmith of Black Point, and left traces of our journey which might be easily recognized. The gang followed us. A poisonous plant enabled them gradually to kill our bullocks and horses. At the right moment, he sunk us in the marshes of the snowy, and gave us into the hands of his gang. Such was the history of Ben Joyce. The Major had shown him up in the, his character, a bold and formidable criminal. His manifestly evil designs called for the utmost vigilance on the part of Glenarvan. Happily, the unmasked bandit was less to be feared than the traitor. But one serious consequence must come out of this revelation. No one had thought of it yet except Mary Grant. John Mangles was the first to notice her pale, despairing face. He understood what was passing in her mind at a glance. "'Miss Mary, Miss Mary!' he cried. "'You are crying!' "'Crying, my child,' said Lady Helena." "'My father, madame, my father,' replied the poor girl. "'She could say no more, but the truth flashed on every mind. "'They all knew the cause of her grief, and why tears fell from her eyes, "'and her father's name came to her lips. "'The discovery of Ayrton's treachery had destroyed all hope. "'The convict had invented a shipwreck to entrap Glenarvan. "'In the conversation overheard by McNabbs, the convicts had plainly said that the Britannia had never been wrecked on the rocks in Twofold Bay. Harry Grant had never set foot on the Australian continent. A second time they had been sent on the wrong track by an erroneous interpretation of the document. Gloomy silence fell on the whole party at the sight of the children's sorrow, and no one could find a cheering word to say. Robert was crying in his sister's arms. Paganel muttered in a tone of vexation, "'That unlucky document! It may boast of having half crazed a dozen people's wits!' The worthy geographer was in such a rage with himself that he struck his forehead as if he would smash it in. Glenarvan went out to Mulroddy and Wilson, who were keeping watch. Profound silence reigned over the plain between the wood and the river. Ben Joyce and his band must be at considerable distance, for the atmosphere was in such a state of complete torpor that the slightest sound would have been heard. It was evident from the flocks of birds on the lower branches of the trees, and the kangaroos feeding quietly on the young shoots, and a couple of emus, whose confiding heads passed between the great clumps of bushes, that those peaceful solitudes were untroubled by the presence of human beings. "'You have neither seen nor heard anything for the last hour,' said Glenarvan to the two sailors. "'Nothing whatever, your honor,' replied Wilson. "'The convicts must be miles away from here.' "'They were not in numbers enough to attack us, I suppose,' added Muradi. "'Ben Joyce will have gone to recruit his party, with some bandits like himself, "'among the bush rangers, who may be lurking about the foot of the Alps.' "'That is probably the case, Mulrady,' replied Glenarvan. "'The rascals are cowards. "'They know we are armed, and well armed, too. "'Perhaps they are waiting for nightfall to commence the attack. 
we must redouble our watchfulness. Oh, if we could only get out of this bog, and down the coast, but this swollen river bars our passage. I would pay its weight in gold for a raft which would carry us over to the other side. Why does not your honor give orders for a raft to be constructed? We have plenty of wood. No, Wilson, replied Glenarvan. The snowy is not a river, it is an impassable torrent. John Mangles, the major, and Paganel just then came out of the wagon on purpose to examine the state of the river. They found it still so swollen by the heavy rain that the water was a foot above the level. It formed an impetuous current like the American rapids. To venture over that foaming current and that rushing flood, broken into a thousand eddies and hollows and gulfs, was impossible. John Mangles declared the passage impracticable. But we must not stay here, he added, without attempting anything. What we were going to do before Ayrton's treachery is still more necessary now. What do you mean, John? asked Glenarvan. I mean that our need is urgent, and that since we cannot go to Twofold Bay, we must go to Melbourne. We have still one horse. Give it to me, my lord, and I will go to Melbourne. "'But that will be a dangerous venture, John,' said Glenarvan, "'not to speak of the perils of a journey of two hundred miles over an unknown country. "'The road and the byways will be guarded by the accomplices of Ben Joyce. "'I know it, my lord, but I know also that things can't stay long as they are. "'Ayrton only asked a week's absence to fetch the crew of the Duncan, "'and I will be back to the Snowy River in six days.' Well, my lord, what are your commands? Before Glenarvan decides, said Paganel, I must make an observation. That someone must go to Melbourne is evident, but that John Mangles should be the one to expose himself to the risk cannot be. He is the captain of the Duncan, and must be careful of his life. I will go instead. That is all very well, Paganel, said the Major, but why should you be the one to go? "'Are we not here?' said Noradi and Wilson. "'And do you think,' replied McNabbs, "'that the journey of two hundred miles on horseback frightens me?' "'Friends,' said Glenarvan, "'one of us must go, "'so let it be decided by drawing lots. "'Write all our names, Paganel. "'Not yours, my lord,' said John Mangles. "'And why not?' "'What, separate you from Lady Helena, "'and before your wound is healed, too?' Glenarvan, said Paganel, you cannot leave the expedition. No, added the Major, your place is here, Edward, you ought not to go. Danger is involved in it, said Glenarvan, and I will take my share along with the rest. Write the names, Paganel, and put mine among them, and I hope the lot may fall on me. His will was obeyed. The names were written, and the lots drawn. Fate fixed on Mulrady. The brave sailor shouted, Hurrah! and said, My lord, I am ready to start. Glenarvan pressed his hand, and then went back to the wagon, leaving John Mangles and the Major on watch. Lady Helena was informed of the determination to send a message to Melbourne, and that they had drawn lots who should go, and Mulrady had been chosen. Lady Helena said a few kind words to the brave sailor, which went straight to his heart. Fate could hardly have chosen a better man, for he was not only brave and intelligent, but robust and superior to all fatigue. Mulrady's departure was fixed for eight o'clock, immediately after the short twilight. Wilson undertook to get the horse ready. He had a project in his head of changing the horse's left shoe for one of the horses that had died in the night. This would prevent the convicts from tracking Mulrady or following him as they were not mounted. While Wilson was arranging this, Glenarvan got his letter ready for Tom Austin, but his wounded arm troubled him, and he asked Paganel to write it for him. The savant was so absorbed in one fixed idea that he seemed hardly to know what he was about. In all this succession of vexations, it must be said, the document was always uppermost in Paganel's mind. He was always foring himself about each word, trying to discover some new meaning, 
and losing the wrong interpretation of it, and going over and over himself in perplexities. He did not hear Glenarvan when he first spoke, but on the request being made a second time, he said, Ah, very well, I'm ready. While he spoke, he was mechanically getting paper from his notebook. He tore a blank page off, and sat down, pencil in hand, to write. Glenarvan began to dictate as follows. Order to Tom Austin, chief officer, to get to sea without delay, and bring the Duncan to... Paganel was just finishing the last word, when his eye chanced to fall on the Australian and New Zealand Gazette, lying on the ground. The paper was so folded that only the last two syllables of the title were visible. Paganel's pencil stopped, and he seemed to become oblivious of Glenarvan and the letter entirely, till his friends called out, Come, Paganel! Ah, said the geographer with a loud exclamation. What is the matter? asked the major. Nothing, nothing, replied Paganel. Then he muttered to himself, Arland, Arland, Arland. He had got up and seized the newspaper. He shook it in his efforts to keep back the words that involuntarily rose to his lips. Lady Helena, Mary, Robert, and Glenarvan gazed at him in astonishment, at a loss to understand this unaccountable agitation. Paganel looked as if a sudden fit of insanity had come over him. But his excitement did not last. He became by degrees calmer, as a gleam of joy that shone in his eyes died away. He sat down again and said quietly, "'When you please, my lord, I'm ready.' Glenarvan resumed his dictations at once, and the letter was soon completed. It read as follows, "'Order to Tom Austin to go to sea without delay.' and takes the Duncan to Melbourne, by the thirty-seventh degree of latitude to the eastern coast of Australia. Of Australia? said Paganel. Ah, yes, of Australia. Then he finished the letter, and gave it to Glenarvan to sign, who went through the necessary formality as well as he could, and closed and sealed the letter. Paganel, whose hand still trembled with emotion, directed it thus, Tom Austin, chief officer on board the yacht Duncan, Melbourne. Then he got up and went out of the wagon, gesticulating and repeating the incomprehensible words, Arland, Arland, Arland. End of Book 2, Chapter 17「Book Two, Chapter Eighteen of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine. In Search of the Castaways, or the Children of Captain Grant, by Jules Verne. Book Two, Chapter Eighteen. Four Days of Anguish. The rest of the day passed on without any further incident. All the preparations for Mulrady's journey were completed, and the brave sailor rejoiced in being able to give his lordship this proof of devotion. Paganel had recovered his usual sang froid and manners. His look, indeed, betrayed his preoccupation, but he seemed resolved to keep it secret. No doubt he had strong reasons for this course of action, for the Major heard him repeating, like a man struggling with himself. No, no, they would not believe it, and, besides, what good would it be? It's too late. Having taken this resolution, he busied himself with giving Mulrady the necessary directions for getting to Melbourne, and showed him his way on the map. All the tracks, that is to say, paths through the prairie, came out on the road to Lucknow, this road, after running right down to the coast, took a sudden bend in the direction of Melbourne. This was the route that must be followed steadily, for it would not do to attempt a shortcut across an almost unknown country. Nothing, consequently, could be more simple. Mulrady could not lose his way. As to dangers, there were none after he had gone a few miles beyond the encampment, 
out of the reach of Ben Joyce and his gang. Once past their hiding place, Mulrady was certain of soon being able to outdistance the convicts and execute his important mission successfully. At six o'clock they all dined together. The rain was falling in torrents. The tent was not protection enough, and the whole party had to take refuge in the wagon. This was a sure refuge. The clay kept it firmly embedded in the soil like a fortress resting on a sure foundations. The arsenal was composed of seven carabines and seven revolvers, and could stand a pretty long siege, for they had plenty of ammunition and provisions. But before six days were over, the Duncan would anchor in Twofold Bay, and twenty-four hours after her crew would reach the other shore of the snowy river, and should the passage still remain impracticable, the convicts, at any rate, would be forced to retire before the increased strength but all depended on Mulrady's success in his perilous enterprise. At eight o'clock it got very dark. Now was the time to start. The horse prepared for Mulrady was brought out. His feet, by way of extra precaution, were wrapped round with clothes, so that they could not make the least noise on the ground. The animal seemed tired, and yet the safety of all depended on his strength and sure-footedness. The major advised Mulrady to let him go gently as soon as he got past the convicts. Better delay half a day than not arrive safely. John Mangles gave his sailor a revolver, which he had loaded with the utmost care. This is a formidable weapon in the hand of a man who does not tremble, for six shoots fired in a few seconds would easily clear a road infested with criminals. Mulrady seated himself in the saddle, ready to start. "'Here is the letter you are to give to Tom Austin,' said Glenarvan. "'Don't let him lose an hour. "'He is to sail for Twofold Bay at once, "'and if he does not find us there, "'if we have not managed to cross the snowy, "'let him come on to us without delay. "'Now go, my brave sailor, and God be with you.' "'He shook hands with him and bade him good-bye, "'and so did Lady Helena and Mary Grant.' A more timorous man than the sailor would have shrunk back a little from setting out on such a dark raining night, on an errand so full of danger, across vast unknown wilds. But his farewells were calmly spoken, and he speedily disappeared down a path which skirted the wood. At the same moment the gusts of wind redoubled their violence. The high branches of the eucalyptus clattered together noisily and bough after bough fell on the wet ground. More than one great tree, with no living sap, but still standing hitherto, fell with a crash during the storm. The wind howled amid the cracking wood, and mingled its moans with the ominous roaring of the rain. The heavy clouds, driving along towards the east, hung on the ground like rays of vapor, and deep, cheerless gloom intensified the horrors of the night. The travellers went back into the wagon immediately after Mulrady had gone. Lady Helena, Mary Grant, Glenarvan and Paganel occupied the first compartment, which had been hermetically closed. The second was occupied by Albinet, Wilson and Robert. The Major and John Mangles were on duty outside. This precaution was necessary, for an attack on the part of the convicts would be easy enough, and therefore probable enough. The two faithful guardians kept close watch, bearing philosophically the rain and wind that beat on their faces. They tried to pierce through the darkness so favorable to ambushes, for nothing could be heard but the noise of the tempest, the sough of the wind, the rattling branches, falling trees, and roaring of the unchained waters. At times the wind would cease for a few moments, as if to take breath. Nothing was audible but the moan of the snowy river as it flowed between the motionless reeds and the dark curtain of gum trees. The silence seemed deeper in these momentary lulls, and the Major and John Mangles listened attentively. During one of these calms a sharp whistle reached them. John Mangles went hurriedly up to the Major. "'You heard that?' he asked. "'Yes,' said McNabbs. "'Is it man or beast?' "'A man,' replied John Mangles. "'And then both listened. "'The mysterious whistle was repeated "'and answered by a kind of report, 
but almost indistinguishable, for the storm was raging with renewed violence. McNabbs and John Mangles could not hear themselves speak. They went for comfort under the shelter of the wagon. At this moment the leather curtains were raised, and Glenarvan rejoined his two companions. He too had heard this ill-boding whistle, and the report which echoed under the tilt. "'Which way was it?' asked he. "'There,' said John, pointing to the dark track in the direction taken by Mulrady. "'How far?' "'The wind brought it, I should think, three or four miles at least.' Come, said Glenarvan, putting his gun on his shoulder. No, said the Major, it is a decoy to get us away from the wagon. But if Mulrady has even now fallen beneath the blows of these rascals, exclaimed Glenarvan, seizing McNabbs by the hand. We shall know by tomorrow, said the Major coolly, determined to prevent Glenarvan from taking a step which was equally rash and futile. "'You cannot leave the camp, my lord,' said John. "'I will go alone.' "'You will do nothing of the kind,' cried McNabbs, energetically. "'Do you want to have us killed one by one to diminish our force "'and put us at the mercy of these wretches? "'If Mulrady has fallen a victim to them, it is a misfortune "'that must not be repeated. "'Mulrady was sent, chosen by chance. "'If the lot had fallen to me, I should have gone as he did, but I should neither have asked nor expected assistance. In restraining Glenarvan and John Mangles, the Major was right, in every aspect of the case. To attempt to follow the sailor, to run into the darkness of night among the convicts in their leafy ambush, was madness, and more than that, it was useless. Glenarvan's party was not so numerous that it could afford to sacrifice another member of it. Still Glenarvan seemed as if he could not yield. His hand was always on his carabine. He wandered about the wagon, and bent a listening ear to the faintest sound. The thought that one of his men was perhaps mortally wounded, abandoned to his fate, calling in vain on those for whose sake he had gone forth, was a torture to him. McNabbs was not sure that he should be able to restrain him, or if Glenarvan, carried away by his feelings, would not run into the arms of Ben Joyce. Edward, he said, be calm, listen to me as a friend, think of Lady Helena, of Mary Grant, of all who are left, and besides, where would you go? Where would you find Mulrady? He must have been attacked two miles off. In what direction? Which track would you follow? At that very moment, as if to answer the major, a cry of distress was heard. Listen, said Glenarvan. This cry came from the same quarter as the report, but less than a quarter of a mile off. Glenarvan, repulsing McNabbs, was already on the track, when at three hundred paces from the wagon they heard the exclamation, Help! Help! The voice was plaintive and despairing. John Mangles and the Major sprang toward the spot. A few seconds after they perceived among the scrub a human form, dragging itself along the ground and uttering mournful groans. It was Mulrady, wounded, apparently dying, and when his companions raised him they felt their hands bathed in blood. The rain came down with redoubled violence, and the wind raged among the branches of the dead trees. In the pelting storm Glenarvan, the Major and John Mangles, transported the body of Mulrady. On their arrival everyone got up. Paganel, Robert, Wilson, and Albinet left the wagon, and Lady Helena gave up her compartment to poor Mulrady. The Major removed the poor fellow's flannel shirt, which was dripping with blood and rain. He soon found the wound. It was a stab in the right side. McNabbs dressed it with great skill. He could not tell whether the weapon had touched any vital part. An intermittent jet of scarlet blood flowed from it. The patient's paleness and weakness showed that he was seriously injured. The major washed the wound first with fresh water, and then closed the orifice. After this, he put on a thick pad of lint, and then folds of scraped linen, held firmly in place with a bandage. He succeeded in stopping the hemorrhage. Mulrady was laid on his side, with his head and chest well raised, 
and Lady Helena succeeded in making him swallow a few drops of water. After about a quarter of an hour, the wounded man, who till then had lain motionless, made a slight movement. His eyes unclosed, his lips muttered incoherent words, and the major, bending toward him, heard him repeating, My lord, the letter, Ben Joyce. The major repeated these words and looked at his companions. What did Moradi mean? Ben Joyce had been the attacking party, of course, but why? Surely for the express purpose of intercepting him and preventing his arrival at the Duncan. This letter, Glenarvan searched Mulrady's pockets. The letter addressed to Tom Austin was gone. The night wore away amid anxiety and distress. Every moment they feared would be poor Mulrady's last. He suffered from acute fever. The sisters of charity, Lady Helena and Mary Grant, never left him. Never was patient so well tended, nor by such sympathetic hands. Day came, and the rain had ceased. Great clouds filled the sky still, the ground was strewn with broken branches. The marly soil, soaked by the torrents of rain, had yielded still more. The approaches to the wagon became difficult, but it could not sink any deeper. John Mangles, Paganel, and Glenarvan went, as soon as it was light enough, to reconnoitre in the neighborhood of the encampment. They revisited the track, which was still stained with blood. They saw no vestige of Ben Joyce, nor of his band. They penetrated as far as the scene of the attack. Here two corpses lay on the ground, struck down by Mulrady's bullets. One was the blacksmith of Black Point. His face, already changed by death, was a dreadful spectacle. Glenarvan searched no further. Prudence forbade him to wander from the camp. He returned to the wagon, deeply absorbed by the critical position of affairs. "'We must not think of sending another messenger to Melbourne,' said he. "'But we must,' said John Mangles, "'and I must try to pass where my sailor could not succeed. "'No, John, it's out of the question. "'You have not even a horse for the journey, which is full two hundred miles.' This was true, for Mulrady's horse, the only one that remained, had not returned. Had he fallen during the attack on his rider? Or was he straying in the bush? Or had the convicts carried him off? Come but will, replied Glenarvan. We will not separate again. Let us wait a week or a fortnight till the snowy falls to its normal level. We can then reach Twofold Bay by short stages, and from there... We can send on to the Duncan, by a safer channel, the order to meet us. That seems the only plan, said Paganel. Therefore, my friends, rejoined Glenarvan, no more parting. It is too great a risk for one man to venture alone into a robber-haunted waste. And now may God save our poor sailor, and protect the rest of us. Glenarvan was right in both points. First, in prohibiting all isolated attempts, and second, in deciding to wait till the passage of Snowy River was practicable. He was scarcely thirty miles from Delegit, the first frontier village of New South Wales, where he would easily find the means of transport to Twofold Bay, and from there he could telegraph to Melbourne his orders about the Duncan. These measures were wise, but how late! If Glenarvan had not sent Mulrady to Lucknow, what misfortunes would have been averted? not to speak of the assassination of the sailor. When he reached the camp, he found his companions in better spirits. They seemed more hopeful than before. "'He is better! He is better!' cried Robert, running out to meet Lord Glenarvan. "'Moradi!' "'Yes, Edward,' answered Lady Helena. "'A reaction has set in. The Major is more confident. Our sailor will live.' "'Where is McNabbs?' asked Glenarvan. "'With him.' Mulrady wanted to speak to him, and they must not be disturbed. He then learned that about an hour since, the wounded man had awakened from its lethargy, and the fever had abated. But the first thing he did on recovering his memory and speech was to ask for Lord Glenarvan, or failing him the major. McNabbs, seeing him so weak, would have forbidden any conversation, but Mulrady insisted with such energy that the major had to give in. 
The interview had already lasted some minutes when Glenarvan returned. There was nothing for it but to await the return of McNabbs. Presently the leather curtains of the wagon moved, and the Major appeared. He rejoined his friends at the foot of a gum tree, where the tent was placed. His face, usually so stolid, showed that something disturbed him. When his eyes fell on Lady Helena and the young girl, his glance was full of sorrow. Glenarvan questioned him, and extracted the following information. When he left the camp, Mulrady followed one of the paths indicated by Paganel. He made as good speed as the darkness of the night would allow. He reckoned that he had gone about two miles, when several men, five he thought, sprang to his horse's head. The animal reared. Mulrady seized his revolver and fired. He thought he saw two of his assailants fall. By the flush he recognized Ben Joyce, but that was all. He had not time to fire all the barrels. He felt a violent blow on his side and was thrown to the ground. Still he did not lose consciousness. The murderers thought he was dead. He felt them search his pockets, and then heard one of them say, I have the letter. Give it to me, returned Ben Joyce, and now the Duncan is ours. At this point of the story, Glenarvan could not help uttering a cry. McNabbs continued. Now, you fellows, added Ben Joyce, catch the horse. In two days I shall be on board the Duncan, and in six I shall reach Tufal Bay. This is to be the rendezvous. My lord and his party will be still stuck in the marshes of the snowy river. Cross the river at the bridge of Campbell Pier, proceed to the coast, and wait for me. I will easily manage to get you on board. Once at sea, in a craft like the Duncan, we shall be masters of the Indian Ocean. Hurrah for Ben Joyce, cried the convicts. Mulrady's horse was brought, and Ben Joyce disappeared, galloping on the Lucknow Road, while the band took the road southeast of the snowy river. Mulrady, though severely wounded, had the strength to drag himself to within three hundred paces from the camp, whence we found him almost dead. There, said McNabbs, is the history of Mulrady, and now you can understand why the prey fellow was so determined to speak. This revelation terrified Glenarvan and the rest of the party. Pirates, pirates, cried Glenarvan, my crew massacred, my Duncan in the hands of these bandits. Yes, for Ben Joyce will surprise the ship, said the Major, and then... Well, we must get to the coast first, said Paganel. But how are we to cross the snowy river, said Wilson. As they will, replied Glenarvan. They are to cross at Campbell Pier Bridge, and so will we. But about Mulrady, asked Lady Helena. We will carry him, we will have relays. Can I leave my crew to the mercy of Ben Joyce and his gang? To cross the snowy river at Campbell Pier was practicable, but dangerous. The convicts might entrench themselves at that point and defend it. There were at least thirty against seven. But there are moments when people do not deliberate, or when they have no choice but to go on. My lord, said John Mangles, before we throw away our chance, before venturing to this bridge, we ought to reconnoiter, and I will undertake it. I will go with you, John, said Paganel. This proposal was agreed to, and John Mangles and Paganel prepared to start immediately. They were to follow the course of the snowy river, follow its banks till they reached the place indicated by Ben Joyce, and especially they were to keep out of sight of the convicts, who were probably scoring the bush. So the two brave comrades started, well provisioned and well armed, and were soon out of sight as they threaded their way among the tall reeds by the river. The rest anxiously awaited their return all day. Evening came, and still the scouts did not return. They began to be seriously alarmed. At last, toward eleven o'clock, Wilson announced their arrival. Paganel and John Mangles were worn out with the fatigues of a ten-mile walk. "'Well, what about the bridge? Did you find it?' asked Glenarvan with impetuous eagerness. "'Yes, a bridge of supplejacks,' said John Mangles. "'The convicts passed over, but—' "'But what?' said Glenarvan who foreboded some new misfortune. 
They burned it after they passed, said Paganel. End of Book Two, Chapter Eighteen. Book Two, Chapter Nineteen of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Search of the Castaways or the Children of Captain Grant by Jules Verne. Book Two, Chapter Nineteen Helpless and Hopeless. It was not a time for despair, but action. The bridge at Campbell Pier was destroyed, but the snowy river must be crossed, come what might, and they must reach Twofold Bay before Ben Joyce and his gang. So, instead of wasting time in empty words, the next day, the 16th of January, John Mangles and Glenarvan went down to examine the river and arrange for the passage over. The swollen and tumultuous waters had not gone down the least, they rushed on with indescribable fury. It would be risking life to battle with them. Glenarvan stood gazing with folded arms and downcast face. "'Would you like me to try and swim across?' said John Mangles. "'No, John, no,' said Lord Glenarvan, holding back the bold, daring young fellow. "'Let us wait.' And they both returned to the camp. The day passed in the most intense anxiety— Ten times Lord Glenarvan went to look at the river, trying to invent some bold way of getting over, but in vain. Had a torrent of lava rushed between the shores, it could not have been more impassable. During these long wasted hours, Lady Helena, under the Major's advice, was nursing Mulrady with the utmost skill. The sailor felt a throb of returning life. McNabbs ventured to affirm that no vital part was injured. Loss of blood accounted for the patient's extreme exhaustion. The wound once closed and the hemorrhage stopped, time and rest would be all that was needed to complete his cure. Lady Helena had insisted on giving up the first compartment of the wagon to him, which greatly tried his modesty. The poor fellow's greatest trouble was the delay. His condition would might cause Glenarvan, and he made him promise that they should leave him in the camp, under Wilson's care, should the passage of the river became practicable. But, unfortunately, no passage was practicable, either that day or the next, January the 17th. Glenarvan was in despair. Lady Helena and the Major vainly tried to calm him, and preached patience. Patience, indeed, when perhaps at this very moment Ben Joyce was boarding the yacht, when the Duncan, losing from her moorings, was getting up steam to reach the fatal coast, and each hour was bringing her nearer. John Mangles felt in his own breast all that Glenarvan was suffering. He determined to conquer the difficulty at any price, and constructed a canoe in the Australian manner with large sheets of bark of the gum trees. These sheets were kept together by bars of wood, and formed a very fragile boat. The captain and the sailor made a trial trip in it during the day. All that skill and strength and tact and courage could do, they did, but they were scarcely in the current before they were upside down, and nearly paid with their lives for the dangerous experiment. The boat disappeared, dragged down by the eddy. John Mangles and Wilson had not gone ten fathoms, and the river was a mile broad, and swollen by the heavy rains and melted snows. Thus passed the 19th and 20th of January. The Major and Glenarvan went five miles up the river in search of a favorable passage, but everywhere they found the same roaring, rushing, impetuous torrent. The whole southern slope of the Australian Alps poured its liquid masses into this single bed. All hope of saving the Duncan was now at an end. Five days had elapsed since the departure of Ben Joyce, the yacht must be, at this moment, at the coast, and in the hands of the convicts. However, it was impossible that this state of things could last. The temporary influx would soon be exhausted, and the violence also. 
Indeed, on the morning of the 21st, Paganel announced that the water was already lower. "'What does it matter now?' said Glenarvan. "'It's too late.' "'There is no reason for our staying longer here,' said the Major. "'Certainly not,' replied John Mangles. "'Perhaps tomorrow the river may be practicable.' "'And will that save my unhappy man?' cried Glenarvan. "'Will your lordship listen to me?' returned John Mangles. "'I know Tom Austin. He would execute your orders and set out as soon as departure was possible. But who knows whether the Duncan was ready and her injury repaired at the arrival of Ben Joyce? And suppose the yacht could not go to sea. Suppose there was a delay of a day or two days.' "'You're right, John,' replied Glenarvan. "'We must get to Twofold Bay.' were only thirty-five miles from Delegit. Yes, added Paganel, and that's a town where we shall find rapid means of convenience. Who knows whether we shan't arrive in time to prevent a catastrophe? Let us start, cried Glenarvan. John Mangles and Wilson instantly set to work to construct a canoe of larger dimensions. Experience had proved that the bark was powerless against the violence of the torrent, and John accordingly felled some of the gum trees and made a rude but solid raft with the trunks it was a long task and the day had gone before the work was ended it was completed next morning by this time the waters had visibly diminished the torrent had once more become a river though a very rapid one it is true however by pursuing a zigzag course and overcoming it to a certain extent john hoped to reach the opposite shore at half past twelve they embarked provisions enough for a couple of days the remainder was left with the wagon and the tent milrady was doing well enough to be carried over his convalescence was rapid at one o'clock they all seated themselves on the raft still moored to the shore john mangles had installed himself at the starboard and entrusted to wilson a sort of oar to steady the raft against the current, and lessen the leeway. He took his own stand at the back, to steer by means of a large skull. But, notwithstanding their efforts, Wilson and John Mangles soon found themselves in an inverse position, which made the action of the oars impossible. There was no help for it. They could do nothing to arrest the goratory movement of the raft. It turned round with dizzying rapidity, and drifted out of its course. John Mangles stood with pale face and set teeth, gazing at the whirling current. However, the raft had reached the middle of the river, about half a mile from the starting point. Here the current was extremely strong, and this broke the whirling eddy and gave the raft some stability. John and Wilson seized their oars again and managed to push it in an oblique direction. This brought them nearer to the left shore. They were not more than fifty fathoms from it, when Wilson's oar snapped short off, and the raft, no longer supported, was dragged away. John tried to resist at the risk of breaking his own oar, too, and Wilson, with bleeding hands, seconded his efforts with all his might. At last they succeeded, and the raft, after a passage of more than half an hour, struck against a steep bank of the opposite shore. The shock was so violent that the logs became disunited, the cords broke, and the water bubbled up between. The travelers had barely time to catch hold of the steep bank. They dragged out Mulrady and the two dripping ladies. Everyone was safe, but the provisions and firearms, except the carabine of the major, went drifting down with the debris of the raft. The river was crossed. The little company found themselves almost without provisions, thirty-five miles from Delegit in the midst of the unknown deserts of the Victoria frontier. Neither settlers nor squatters were to be met with. It was entirely uninhabited, unless by ferocious bush rangers and bandits. They resolved to set off without delay. Mulrady saw clearly that he would be a great drag on them, and he begged to be allowed to remain, and even to remain alone, till assistance could be sent from Delegit. Glenarvan refused. It would be three days before he could reach Delegit, and five the shore, that is to say, the 26th of January. Now, 
as the Duncan had left Melbourne on the 16th, what difference would a few days delay make? No, my friend, he said, I will not leave anyone behind. We will make a litter and carry you in turn. The litter was made of baths of eucalyptus covered with branches, and, whether he would or not, Mulrady was obliged to take his place on it. Glenarvan would be the first to carry his sailor. He took hold of one end and Wilson of the other, and all set off. What a sad spectacle, and how lamentably was this expedition to end, which had commenced so well. They were no longer in search of Harry Grant. This continent where he was not, and never had been, threatened to prove fatal to those who sought him. And when these intrepid countrymen of his should reach the shore, they wouldn't find the Duncan waiting to take them home again. The first day passed silently and painfully. Every ten minutes the litter changed bearers. All the sailors' comrades took their share in this task without murmuring, though the fatigue was augmented by the great heat. In the evening, after a journey of only five miles, they camped under the gum trees. The small store of provisions saved from the raft composed the evening meal, but all they had to depend upon now was the major's carabine. It was a dark, rainy night, and morning seemed as if it would never dawn. They set off again, but the major could not find a chance of firing a shot. This fatal region was only a desert, unfrequented even by animals. Fortunately, Robert discovered a bustard's nest with a dozen of large eggs in it, which Albinet cooked on hot cinders. These with a few roots of porcelain which were growing at the bottom of a ravine, were all the breakfast of the twenty-second. The route now became extremely difficult. The sandy plains were bristling with spinifex, a prickly plant which is called in Melbourne the porcupine. It tears the clothing to rags and makes the legs bleed. The courageous ladies never complained, but footed it bravely, setting an example and encouraging one another by word or look. They stopped in the evening at Mount Bulla Bulla, on the edge of the Jangala Creek. The supper would have been very scant, if McNabbs had not killed a large rat, the mus conditor, which is highly spoken of as an article of diet. Albinet roasted it, and it would have been pronounced even superior to its reputation, had it equaled the sheep in size. They were obliged to be content with it, however, and it was devoured to the bones. On the 23rd, the weary but still energetic travelers started off again. After having gone round the foot of the mountain, they crossed the long prairies, where the grass seemed made of whalebone. It was a tangle of darts, a medley of sharp little sticks, and a path had to be cut through either with the hatchet or fire. That morning there was not even a question of breakfast. Nothing could be more barren than this region, strewn with pieces of quartz. Not only hunger but thirst began to assail the travellers. A burning atmosphere heightened their discomfort. Glenarvan and his friends could only go half a mile an hour. Could this lack of food and water continue till evening, they would all think on the road, never to rise again. But when everything fails a man, and he finds himself without resources, at the very moment when he feels he must give up, the providence steps in. Water presented itself in the cephalots, a species of cup-shaped flower filled with refreshing liquid, which hung from the branches of coloriform shaped bushes. They all quenched their thirst with these, and found new life returning. The only food they could find was the same as the natives were forced to subsist upon, when they could find neither game nor serpents nor insects. Paganel discovered in the dry bed of a creek a plant whose excellent properties had been frequently described by one of his colleagues in the Geographical Society. It was the Nardu, a cryptogamous plant of the family Marsilacea, and the same which kept Burke and King alive in the deserts of the interior. Under its leaves, which resembled those of the trefoil, there were dried spurrels as large as a lentil, and these spurrels, when crushed between two stones, made a sort of flower. 
This was converted into coarse bread, which stilled the pangs of hunger at least. There was a great abundance of this plant growing in the district, and Albin had gathered a large supply, so that they were sure of food for several days. The next day, the 24th, Mulrady was able to walk part of the way. His wound was entirely cicatrized. The town of Delegit was not more than ten miles off, and that evening they camped in longitude 140 degrees, on the very frontier of New South Wales. For some hours a fine but penetrating rain had been falling. There would have been no shelter from this, if by chance John Mangles had not discovered a sawyer's hut, deserted and dilapidated to a degree. But with this miserable cabin they were obliged to be content. Wilson wanted to kindle a fire to prepare the nardo bread, and he went out to pick up the dead wood scattered all over the ground. But he found it would not light. The great quantity of albuminous matter which it contained prevented all combustion. This is the incombustible wood put down by Paganel in his list of Australian products. They had to dispense with fire, and consequently with food too, and sleep in their wet clothes, while the laughing jackasses, concealed in the high branches, seemed to ridicule the poor unfortunates. However, Glenarvan was nearly at the end of his sufferings. It was time. The two young ladies were making heroic efforts, but their strength was hourly decreasing. They dragged themselves along, almost unable to walk. Next morning they started at daybreak. At 11 a.m., Delegate came in sight in the county of Wellesley, and fifty miles from Twofold Bay. Means of conveyance were quickly procured here. Hope returned to Glenarvan as they approached the coast. Perhaps there might have been some slight delay, and after all, they might get there before the arrival of the Duncan. In twenty-four hours they would reach the bay. At noon, after a comfortable meal, all the travellers installed in a mail coach, drawn by five strong horses, left Delegit at a gallop. The postillion, stimulated by a promise of a princely docure, drove rapidly along over a well-kept road. They did not lose a minute in changing horses, which took place every ten miles. It seemed as if they were infected with Lenarvan's zeal. All that day, and night too, they travelled on at the rate of six miles an hour. In the morning at sunrise, a dull murmur fell on their ears, and announced their approach to the Indian Ocean. They required to go round the bay to gain the coast at the 37th parallel, the exact point where Tom Austin was to wait their arrival. When the sea appeared, all eyes anxiously gazed at the offing. Was the Duncan, by a miracle of providence, there, running close to a shore, as a month ago, when they crossed Cape Corrientes, they had found her on the Argentine coast? They saw nothing. Sky and earth mingled in the same horizon. Not a sail enlivened the vast stretch of ocean. One hope still remained. Perhaps Tom Austin had thought it his duty to, to cast anchor in Twofold Bay, for the sea was heavy, and a ship would not dare to venture near the shore. To Eden, cried Glenarvan, immediately the mail coach resumed the route round the bay, towards the little town of Eden, five miles distant. The postillion stopped not far from the lighthouse, which marks the entrance of the port. Several vessels were moored in the roadstead, but none of them bore the flag of Malcolm. Glenarvan, John Mangles, and Paganel got out of the coach, and rushed to the custom house to inquire about the arrival of vessels within the last few days. No ship had touched the bay for a week. Perhaps the yacht has not started, Glenarvan said, a sudden revulsion of feeling lifting him from despair. Perhaps we have arrived first. John Mangle shook his head. He knew Tom Austin. His first mate would not delay the execution of an order for ten days. I must know at all events how they stand, said Glenarvan. Better certainty than doubt. A quarter of an hour afterward, a telegram was sent to the syndicate of shipbrokers in Melbourne. The whole party then repaired to the Victoria Hotel. At 2 p.m. the following telegraphic reply was received. 
Lord Glenarvan Eden, to Fort Bay. The Duncan left on the 16th current. Destination unknown. G. Andrews, S.B. The telegram dropped from Glenarvan's hands. There was no doubt now. The good, honest Scotch yacht was now a pirate ship in the hands of Ben Joyce. So ended this journey across Australia, which had commenced under circumstances so favorable. All trace of Captain Grant and his shipwrecked men seemed to be irrevocably lost. This ill success had caused the loss of a ship's crew. Lord Glenarvan had been vanquished in the strife, and the courageous searchers, whom the unfriendly elements of the Pampas had been unable to check, had been conquered on the Australian shore by the perversity of man. End of chapter 19 and end of book 2book three chapter one of in search of the castaways this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by christine in search of the castaways or the children of captain grant by jules verne book three chapter one a rough captain if ever the searchers after Captain Grant were tempted to despair, surely it was at this moment when all their hopes were destroyed at a blow. Toward what quarter of the world should they direct their endeavors? How were they to explore new countries? The Duncan was no longer available, and even an immediate return to their own land was out of the question. Thus the enterprise of these generous Scots had failed. Failed. A despairing word that finds no echo in a brave soul. And yet under the repeated blows of adverse fate, Glenarvan himself was compelled to acknowledge his inability to prosecute his devoted efforts. Mary Grant at this crisis nerved herself to the resolution never to utter the name of her father. She suppressed her own anguish when she thought of the unfortunate crew who had perished. The daughter was merged in the friend and she now took upon her to console Lady Glenarvan, who till now had been her faithful comforter. She was the first to speak of returning to Scotland. John Mangles was filled with admiration at seeing her so courageous and so resigned. He wanted to say a word further in the captain's interest, but Mary stopped him with a glance, and afterwards said to him, No, Mr. John, we must think of those who ventured their lives, Lord Glenarvan must return to Europe. You are right, Miss Mary, answered John Mangles. He must. Besides, the English authorities must be informed of the fate of the Duncan. But do not despair. Rather than abandon our search, I will resume it alone. I will either find Captain Grant or perish in the attempt. It was a serious undertaking to which John Mangles bound himself. Mary accepted and gave her hand to the young captain as if to ratify the treaty. On John Mangles' side it was a life's devotion, on Mary's undying gratitude. During that day their departure was finally arranged. They resolved to reach Melbourne without delay. Next day John went to inquire about the ships ready to sail. He expected to find frequent communication between Eden and Victoria. He was disappointed. Ships were scarce. Three or four vessels, anchored in Twofold Bay, constituted the mercantile fleet of the place. None of them were bound for Melbourne, nor Sydney, nor Point de Galve, at any of which ports Glenarvan would have found ships loading for England. In fact, the Peninsular and Oriental Company has a regular line of packets between these points and England. Under these circumstances, what was to be done? Waiting for a ship might be a tedious affair, for Twofold Bay is not much frequented. Numbers of ships pass by without touching. After due reflection and discussion, Glenarvan had nearly decided to follow the coast road to Sydney, when Paganel made an unexpected proposition. The geographer had visited Twofold Bay on his own account, 
and was aware that there were no means of transport for Sydney or Melbourne. But of the three vessels anchored in the roadstead, one was loading for Auckland, the capital of the northern island of New Zealand. Paganel's proposal was to take the ship in question and get to Auckland, whence it would be easy to return to Europe by the boats of the Peninsular and Oriental Company. This proposition was taken into serious consideration. Paganel on this occasion dispensed with the volley of arguments he generally indulged in. He confined himself to the bare proposition, adding that the voyage to New Zealand was only five or six days, the distance, in fact, being only about a thousand miles. By a singular coincidence, Auckland is situated on the self-same parallel, the 37th, which the explorers had perseveringly followed since they left the coast of Araucania. Paganel might fairly have used this as an argument in favor of his scheme. In fact, it was a natural opportunity of visiting the shores of New Zealand. But Paganel did not lay stress on this argument. After two mistakes, he probably hesitated to attempt a third interpretation of the document. Besides, what could he make of it? It said positively that a continent had served as a refuge for Captain Grant, not an island. Now, New Zealand was nothing but an island. This seemed decisive, whether for this reason or for some other. Paganel did not connect any idea of further search with this proposition of reaching Auckland. He merely observed that regular communication existed between that point and Great Britain, and that it was easy to take advantage of it. John Mangles supported Paganel's proposal. He advised its adoption, and it was hopeless to await the problematical arrival of a vessel in twofold the bay. But, before coming to any decision, he thought it best to visit the ship mentioned by the geographer. Glenarvan, the Major, Paganel, Robert, and Mangles himself, took a boat, and a few strokes brought them alongside the ship, anchored two cables lengths from the quay. It was a brig of 150 tons, named the Mockery. It was engaged in the coasting trade between the various ports of Australia and New Zealand. The captain, or rather the master, received his visitors gruffly enough. They perceived that they had to do with a man of no education, and whose manners were in no degree superior to those of the five sailors of his crew. With a coarse red face, thick hands, and a broken nose, blind of an eye, and his lips stained with the pipe, Will Halley was a sadly brutal-looking person. But they had no choice, and for so short a voyage it was not necessary to be very particular. "'What do you want?' asked Will Halley, when the stranger stepped on the poop of his ship. "'The captain,' answered John Mangles. "'I am the captain,' said Halley. "'What else do you want?' "'The mockery is loading for Auckland, I believe.' "'Yes. What else?' "'What does she carry?' Everything saleable and purchasable. What else? When does she sail? Tomorrow at the midday tide. What else? Does she take passengers? That depends on who the passengers are, and whether they are satisfied with the ship's mess. They would bring their own provisions. What else? What else? Yes, how many are there? Nine, two of them are ladies. I have no cabins. We will manage with such space as may be left at their disposal. What else? Do you agree? said John Mangles, who was not in the least put out by the captain's peculiarities. We'll see, said the master of the Mercury. Will Halley took two or three turns on the poop, making it resound with iron-heeled boots, and then he turned abruptly to John Mangles. "'What would you pay?' said he. "'What do you ask?' replied John. Fifty pounds.' Glenarvan looked consent. "'Very good. Fifty pounds,' replied John Mangles. "'But passage only,' added Halley. "'Yes, passage only.' "'Food extra. Extra.' "'Agreed. And now?' said Will, putting out his hand. What about the deposit money? Here is half of the passage money, twenty-five pounds, said Mangles, counting out the sum to the master. All aboard tomorrow, said he, before noon. 
where there are no eye-way anchor. We will be punctual. This said, Glenarvan, the Major, Robert, Paganel, and John Mangles left the ship, Halley not so much as touching the oilskin that adorned his red locks. What a brute! exclaimed John. He will do, answered Paganel. He is a regular sea wolf. A downright beer, added the Major. I fancy, said John Mangles, that the said beer has dealt in human flesh in his time. What matter, answered Glenarvan, as long as he commands the Macquarie, and the Macquarie goes to New Zealand. From Twofold Bay to Auckland we shall not see much of him. After Auckland we shall see him no more. Lady Helena and Mary Grant were delighted to hear that their departure was arranged for tomorrow. Glenarvan warned them that the Macquarie was inferior in comfort to the Duncan. But after what they had gone through, they were indifferent to trifling annoyances. Wilson was told off to arrange the accommodation on board the Macquarie. Under his busy brush and broom, things soon changed their aspect. Will Halley shrugged his shoulders and left the sailor have his way. Glenarvan and his party gave him no concern. He neither knew nor cared to know their names. His new freight represented fifty pounds, and he rated it far below the two hundred tons of cured hides which were stowed away in his hold. Skins first, men after. He was a merchant. As to his sailor qualification, he was said to be skillful enough in navigating these seas, whose reefs make them very dangerous. As the day drew to a close, Glenarvan had a desire to go again to the point on the coast cut by the 37th parallel. Two motives prompted him. He wanted to examine once more the presumed scene of the wreck. Ayrton had certainly been quartermaster of the Britannia, and the Britannia might have been lost on this part of the Australian coast, on the east coast if not on the west. It would not do to leave without thorough investigation a locality which they were never to revisit. And then, failing the Britannia, the Duncan certainly had fallen into the hands of the convicts. Perhaps there had been a fight. There might yet be found on the coast traces of the struggle, a last resistance. If the crew had perished among the waves, the waves probably had thrown some bodies on the shore. Glenarvan, accompanied by his faithful John, went to carry out the final search. The landlord of the Victoria Hotel lent them two horses, and they set out on the northern road that skirts Twofold Bay. It was a melancholy journey. Glenarvan and Captain John trotted along without speaking, but they understood each other. The same thoughts, the same anguish, harrowed both their hearts. They looked at the sea-worn rocks. They needed no words of question or answer. John's well-tried zeal and intelligence were a guarantee that every point was scrupulously examined. The least likely places, as well as the sloping beaches and sandy plains, where even the slight tides of the Pacific might have thrown some fragments of wreck. But no indication was seen that could suggest further search in that quarter. All trace of the wreck escaped them still. As to the Duncan, no trace either. All that part of Australia bordering the ocean was desert. Still John Mangles discovered on the skirts of the shore evident traces of camping, remains of fires recently kindled under solitary mill trees. Had a tribe of wandering blacks passed that way lately? No, for Glenarvan saw a token which furnished incontestable proof that the convicts had frequented the part of the coast. This token was a grey and yellow garment, worn and patched, an ill-omened rag thrown down at the foot of a tree. It bore the convict's original number at the Perth penitentiary. The felon was not there, but his filthy garments betrayed his passage. This livery of crime, after having clothed some miscreant, was now decaying on this desert shore. "'You see, John,' said Glenarvan, "'the convicts got as far as here.' and our poor comrades of the Duncan. Yes, said John in a low voice, they never landed, they perished. Those wretches, cried Glenarvan, if ever they fall into my hands, I will avenge my crew. Grief had hardened Glenarvan's features. For some minutes he gazed at the expanse before him, as if taking a last look at some ship 
disappearing in the distance. Then his eyes became dim. He recovered himself in a moment, and without a word or look, he set off at a gallop toward Eden. The wanderers passed their last evening sadly enough. Their thoughts recalled all the misfortunes they had encountered in this country. They remembered how full of well-warranted hope they had been at Cape Bernoulli, and how cruelly disappointed at Twofold Bay. Paganel was full of feverish agitation. John Mangles, who had watched him since the affair of Snow River, felt that the geographer was, was hesitating whether to speak or not to speak. A thousand times he had pressed him with questions, and failed in obtaining an answer. But that evening John, enlightening him to his room, asked him why he was so nervous. "'Friend John,' said Paganel, evasively, "'I am not more nervous tonight than I always am.' "'Mr. Paganel,' answered John, "'you have a secret that chokes you.' "'Well,' cried the geographer, gesticulating, "'what can I do? It is stronger than I.' "'What is stronger?' "'My joy on the one hand, my despair on the other.' "'You rejoice and despair at the same time?' "'Yes, at the idea of visiting New Zealand.' "'Why? Have you any trace?' asked John eagerly. "'Have you recovered the lost tracks?' "'No, friend John. No one returns from New Zealand. "'But still, you know human nature. "'All we want to nourish hope is breath. "'My device is Spiro Spero, and it is the best motto in the world.' End of the Book 3, Chapter 1book three chapter two of in search of the castaways this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by christine in search of the castaways or the children of captain grant by jules verne book three chapter two navigators and their discoveries Next day, the 27th of January, the passengers of a Macquarie were installed on board of the brig. Will Halley had not offered his cabin to his lady passengers. This omission was the less to be deplored, for the den was forcy of the bear. At half-past twelve, the anchor was weighed, having been loosed from its holding ground with some difficulty. A moderate breeze was blowing from the southwest. The sails were gradually unfurled, the five hands made slow work. Wilson offered to assist the crew, but Halley begged him to be quiet, and not to interfere with what did not concern him. He was accustomed to manage his own affairs, and required neither assistance nor advice. This was aimed at John Mangles, who had smiled at the clumsiness of some manoeuvre. John took the hint, but mentally resolved that he would nevertheless hold himself in readiness, in case the incapacity of the crew should endanger the safety of the vessel. However, in time, the sails were adjusted by the five sailors, aided by the stimulus of the captain's oath. The mockery stood out to sea on the larboard tack, under all her lower sails, topsails, topgallants, cross-jack, and jib. By and by, the other sails were hoisted. But in spite of this additional canvas, the brig made very little way. Her rounded bow... The width of her hold and her heavy stern made her a bad sailor, the perfect type of a wooden shoe. They had to make the best of it. Happily, five days, or at most six, would take them to Auckland, no matter how bad a sailor the Macquarie was. At seven o'clock in the evening, the Australian coast and the lighthouse of the port of Eden had faded out of sight. The ship labored on the lumpy sea, and rolled heavily in the trough of the waves. The passengers below suffered a good deal from this motion, but it was impossible to stay on deck, as it rained violently. Thus they were condemned to close imprisonment. Each one of them was lost in his own reflections. Words were few. Now and then Lady Helena and Miss Grant exchanged a few syllables. Lenarvan was restless. He went in and out, while the Major was impassive. 
John Mangles, followed by Robert, went on the poop from time to time to look at the weather. Paganel sat in his corner, muttering vague and incoherent words. What was the worthy geographer thinking of? Of New Zealand, the country to which destiny was leading him. He went mentally over all his history. He called to mind the scenes of the past in that ill-omened country. But in all that history was there a fact, was there a solitary incident that could justify the discoverers of these islands in considering them as continent? Could a modern geographer or a sailor concede to them such a designation? Paganel was always revolving the meaning of the document. He was possessed with the idea. It became his ruling thought. After Patagonia, after Australia, his imagination, allured by a name, flew to New Zealand. But in that direction one point, and only one, stood in his way. Contin, contin, he repeated. That must mean continent. And then he resumed his mental retrospect of the navigators who made known to us these two great islands of the southern sea. It was on the 13th of December, 1642, that the Dutch navigator Tasman, after discovering Van Diemen's land, sighted the unknown shores of New Zealand. He coasted along for several days, and on the 17th of December his ships penetrated into a large bay, which, terminating in a narrow strait, separated the two islands. The northern island was called by the natives Ikanamani, a word which signifies the fish of money. The southern island was called Tawaiponamu, the whale that yields the green stones. Abel Tasman sent his boats on shore, and they returned accompanied by two canoes and a noisy company of natives. These savages were middle height, of brown or yellow of complexion, angular bones, harsh voices, and black hair, which was dressed in the Japanese manner, and surmounted by a tall white feather. The first interview between Europeans and Aborigines seemed to promise amicable and lasting intercourse. But the next day, when one of Tasman's boats was looking for an anchorage nearer to the land, seven canoes, manned by a great number of natives, attacked them fiercely. The boat capsized and filled. The quartermaster in command was instantly struck with a badly sharpened spear and fell into the sea. Of his six companions, four were killed. The other two on the quartermaster were able to swim to the ships, and were picked up and recovered. After this sad occurrence, Tasman set sail, confining his revenge to giving the natives a few musket shots, which probably did not reach them. He left this bay, which still bears the name of the Massacre Bay, followed the western coast, and on the 5th of January anchored near the northernmost point. Here the violence of the surf, as well as the unfriendly attitude of the natives, prevented his obtaining water, and he finally quitted these shores, giving them the name Statenland, or the Land of the States, in honor of the States General. The Dutch navigator concluded that these islands were adjacent to the islands of the same name on the east of Terra del Fuego, at the southern point of the American continent. He thought he had found the great southern continent. But, said Paganel to himself, what a seventeenth-century sailor might call a continent would never stand for one with a nineteenth-century man. No such mistake can be supposed. No, there is something here that baffles me. End of Book 3, Chapter 2 Book Three, Chapter Three of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine. In Search of the Castaways or The Children of Captain Grant by Jules Verne. Book Three, Chapter Three. THE MARTYR ROLL OF NAVIGATORS On the 31st of January, four days after starting, the Macquarie had not done two-thirds of the distance between Australia and New Zealand. Will Halley took very little heed to the working of the ship, 
he let things take their chance. He seldom showed himself, for which no one was sorry. No one would have complained if he had passed all his time in his cabin, but for the fact that the brutal captain was every day under the influence of gin or brandy. His sailors willingly followed his example, and no ship ever sailed more entirely depending on Providence than the Macquarie did from Twofold Bay. This unpardonable carelessness obliged John Mangles to keep a watchful eye over open. Mulready and Wilson more than once brought round the helm when some careless steering threatened to throw the ship on her beam ends. Often Will Halley would interfere and abuse the two sailors with a volley of oaths. The latter, in their impatience, would have liked nothing better than to bind this drunken captain and lower him into the hold for the rest of the voyage. But John Mangles succeeded, after some persuasion, in calming their well-grounded indignation. Still, the position of things filled him with anxiety, but, for fear of alarming Glenarvan, he spoke only to Paganel or the Major. McNabbs recommended the same course as Mulroddy and Wilson. "'If you think it would be for the general good, John,' said McNabbs, "'you should not hesitate to take the command of the vessel. "'When we get to Auckland, the drunken imbecile can resume his command, "'and then he is at liberty to wreck himself if that is his fancy.' All that is very true, Mr. McNabbs, and if it is absolutely necessary, I will do it. As long as we are on open sea, a careful lookout is enough. My sailors and I are watching on the poop, but when we get near the coast, I confess I shall be uneasy if Halley does not come to his senses. Could not you direct the course? asked Paganel. That would be difficult, replied John. Would you believe it that there is not a chart on board? Is that so? It is indeed. The Macquarie only does a coasting trade between Eden and Auckland, and Halley is so at home in these waters that he takes no observations. I suppose he thinks the ship knows the way, and steers herself. Ha ha, laughed John Mangles. I do not believe in ships that steer themselves. And if Halley is drunk when we get among soundings, he will get us all into trouble. Let us hope, said Paganel, that the neighborhood of land will bring him to his senses. Well then, said McNabbs, if needs were, you could not sail the Macquarie into Auckland. Without a chart of the coast, certainly not. The coast is very dangerous. It is a series of shallow fjords as irregular and capricious as the fjords of Norway. There are many reefs, and it requires great experience to avoid them. If her keel struck one of those rocks that are submerged but a few feet below the water. In that case, those on board would have to take refuge on the coast, if there was time. A terrible extremity, said Paganel, for they are not hospitable shores, and the dangers of the land are not less appalling than the dangers of the sea. You refer to the Maoris, Monsieur Paganel, asked John Mangles. Yes, my friend. They have a bad name in these waters. It is not a matter of timid or brutish Australians, but of an intelligent and sanctuary race, cannibals, greedy of human flesh, man-eaters, to whom we should look in vain for pity. Well, then, exclaimed the Major, if Captain Grant had been wrecked on the coast of New Zealand, you would dissuade us from looking for him. Oh, you might search on the coast, replied the geographer, because you might find traces of the Britannia, but not in the interior, for it would be perfectly useless. Every European who ventures into these fatal districts falls into the hands of the Maoris, and a prisoner in the hands of the Maoris is a lost man. I have urged my friends to cross the Pampas, to toil over the plains of Australia, but I will never lure them into the mazes of the New Zealand forest. May heaven be our guide, and keep us from ever being thrown within the power of those fierce natives. End of the Book 3, Chapter 3 Book 3, Chapter 4 
of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Search of the Castaways or The Children of Captain Grant by Jules Verne. Book 3, Chapter 4, The Wreck of the Macri. Still, this wearisome voyage dragged on. On the 2nd of February, six days from starting, the Macri had not yet made a nearer acquaintance with the shores of Auckland. The wind was fair, nevertheless, and blew steadily from the southwest, but the currents were against the ship's course, and she scarcely made any way. The heavy, lumpy sea strained her cordage, her timbers creaked, and she labored painfully in the trough of the sea. Her standing rigging was so out of order that it allowed play to the masts, which were violently shaken at every roll of the sea. Fortunately, Will Halley was not a man in a hurry and did not use oppressive canvas, or his mass would inevitably have come down. John Mangles, therefore, hoped that the wretched hull would reach port without accident, but it grieved him that his companions should have to suffer so much discomfort from the defective arrangements of the brig. But neither N Lady Helena nor Mary Grant uttered a word of complaint, though the continuous rain obliged them to stay below, where the want of air and the violence of the motion were painfully felt. They often braved the weather and went on the poop till driven down again by the force of the sudden squall. Then they returned to the narrow space, fitter for stowing cargo than accommodating passengers especially ladies. Their friends did their best to amuse them. Paganel tried to beguile the time with his stories, but it was a hopeless cause. Their minds were so distracted at this change of route as to be quite unhinged. Much as they had been interested in his dissertation on the Pampas or Australia, his lectures on New Zealand fell on cold and indifferent ears. Besides, they were going to this new and ill-reputed country without enthusiasm, without conviction, not even of their own free will, but solely at the bidding of destiny. Of all the passengers on board the Macquarie, the most to be pitied was Lord Glenarvan. He was rarely to be seen below. He could not stay in one place. His nervous organization, highly excited, could not submit to confinement between four narrow bulkheads. All day long, even all night, regardless of the torrents of rain and the dashing waves, he stayed on the poop, sometimes leaning on the rail, sometimes walking to and fro in feverish agitation. His eyes wandered ceaselessly over the blank horizon. He scanned it eagerly during every short interval of clear weather. It seemed as if he sought to question the voiceless waters. He longed to tear away the veil of fog and vapor that obscured his view. He could not be resigned, and his features expressed the bitterness of his grief. He was a man of energy till now happy and powerful, and deprived in a moment of power and happiness. John Mangles bore his company and endured him with the inclemency of the weather. On this day Glenarvan looked more anxiously than ever at each point where a break in the mist enabled him to do so. John came up to him and said, Your lordship is looking out for land? Glenarvan shook his head in dissent. And yet, said the young captain, you must be longing to quit this vessel. We ought to have seen the lights of Auckland thirty-six hours ago. Glenarvan made no reply. 
He still looked, and for a moment his glass was pointed toward the horizon to windward. The land is not on that side, my lord, said John Mangles. Look more to starboard. Why, John, replied Glenarvan, I am not looking for the land. What then, my lord? My yacht, the Duncan, said Glenarvan hotly. It must be here on these coasts, skimming these very waves, playing the vile part of a pirate. It is here, John, I am certain of it, on the track of vessels between Australia and New Zealand, and I have a presentiment that we shall fall in with her. God keep us from such a meeting. Why, John? Your lordship forgets our position. What could we do in this ship if Duncan gave chase? We could not even fly. Fly, John? Yes, my lord, we should try in vain. We should be taken, delivered up to the mercy of those wretches. And Ben Joyce has showed us that he does not stop at a crime. Our lives would be worth little. We would fight to the death, of course. But after that, think of Lady Glenarvan. Think of Mary Grant. Poor girls, muttered Glenarvan. John, my heart is broken, and sometimes despair nearly masters me. I feel as if fresh misfortunes awaited us, and that heaven itself is against us. It terrifies me. You, my lord? Not for myself, John, but for those I love, whom you love also. Keep up your heart, my lord, said the young captain. We must not look out for troubles. The Macquarie sails badly, but she makes some way nevertheless. Will Halley is a brute, but I am keeping my eyes open, and if the coast looks dangerous, I will put the ship's head to sea again, so that on that score there is little or no danger. But as to getting alongside the Duncan, God forbid! And if your lordship is bent on looking out for her, let it be in order to give her a wide berth. John Mangles was right. An encounter with Duncan would have been fatal to the Macquarie. There was every reason to fear such an engagement in these narrow seas in which pirates could ply their trade without risk. However, for that day at least, the yacht did not appear and the sixth night from their departure from Twofold Bay came without the fears of John Mangles being realized. But that night was to be a night of terrors. Darkness came on almost suddenly at seven o'clock in the evening. End of Book Three, Chapter Four Book 3, Chapter 5 of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Anthony Petronic. In Search of the Castaways, or the Children of Captain Grant by Jules Verne. Book 3, Chapter 5, Cannibals. Will Halley and his crew, taking advantage of the darkness of night and the sleep of the passengers, had fled with the only boat. There could be no doubt about it. The captain, whose duty would have kept him on board to the last, had been the first to quit the ship. "'The cowards are off,' said John Mangles. "'Well, my lord, so much the better. They have spared us some trying scenes.' "'No doubt,' said Glenarvan. "'Besides, we have a captain of our own, and courageous, if unskillful sailors your companions, John. Say the word, and we are ready to obey. The Major, Paganel, Robert, Wilson, Mulrady, Albinet himself, applauded Glenarvan's speech and ranged himself on the deck, ready to execute their captain's orders. "'What is to be done?' asked Glenarvan. It was evident that raising the Macquarie was out of the question, and no less evident that she must be abandoned. Waiting on board for succor that might never come would have been imprudence and folly. Before the arrival of a chance vessel on the scene, the Macquarie would have broken up. The next storm, or even a high tide raised by the winds from seaward, would roll it on the sands, break it into splinters, and scatter them on the shore. John was anxious to reach the land before this inevitable consummation. 
he proposed to construct a raft strong enough to carry the passengers and a sufficient quantity of provisions to the coast of new zealand there was no time for discussion the work was to be set about at once and they had made considerable progress when night came and interrupted them toward eight o'clock in the evening after supper while lady helena and mary grant slept in their berths paganel and his friends conversed on the serious matters as they walked up and down the deck robert had chosen to stay with them the brave boy listened with all his ears ready to be of use and willing to enlist in any perilous adventure paganel asked john mangles whether the craft could not follow the coast as far as auckland instead of landing its freight on the coast john replied that the voyage was impossible with such an unmanageable craft and what we cannot do on a raft could have been done in the ship's boat yes if necessary answered john but we should have had to sail by day and anchor at night then those wretches who abandoned us oh as for them said john they were drunk and in the darkness i have no doubt they paid for their cowardice with their lives for the boat would have been very useful to us what would you have paganel the raft will bring us to the shore said glenarvan the very thing i would fain avoid said the geographer what do you think another twenty miles after crossing the pampas in australia can have any terrors for us hardened as we are to fatigue my friend replied paganel i do not call in question our courage nor the bravery of our friends twenty miles would be nothing in any other country than new zealand you cannot suspect me of faint-heartedness i was the first to persuade you to cross america and australia but here the case is different i repeat anything is better than to venture into this treacherous country anything is better in my judgment said john mangles than braving certain destruction on a stranded vessel what is there so formidable in new zealand asked glenarvan the savages said paganel the savages repeated glenarvan can we not avoid them by keeping to the shore but in any case what have we to fear surely two resolute and well-armed europeans need not give a thought to an attack by a handful of miserable beings paganel shook his head in this case there are no miserable beings to contend with the new zealanders are a powerful race who are rebelling against english rule who fight the invaders and often beat them and who always eat them cannibals exclaimed robert cannibals then they heard him whisper my sister lady helena don't frighten yourself my boy said glenarvan our friend paganel exaggerates far from it rejoined paganel robert has shown himself a man and i treat him as such in not concealing the truth from him paganel was right cannibalism has become a fixed fact in new zealand as it is in the fijis and in the torres straits superstition is no doubt partly to blame but cannibalism is certainly owing to the fact that there are moments when game is scarce and hunger great the savages began by eating human flesh to appease the demands of an appetite rarely satiated subsequently the priest regulated and satisfied the monstrous custom what was a meal was raised to the dignity of a ceremony that is all besides in the eyes of the maoris nothing is more natural than to eat one another the missionaries often questioned them about cannibalism they asked them why they devoured their brothers to which the chiefs made answer that fish eat fish dogs eat men men eat dogs and dogs eat one another even the maori mythology has a legend of a god who ate another god and with such a precedent who could resist eating his neighbor another strange notion is that eating a dead enemy they consume his spiritual being and so inherit his soul his strength and his bravery which they hold are especially lodged in the brain this accounts for the fact that the brain figures in the feast as the choicest delicacy and is offered to the most honored guest but while he acknowledged all this paganel maintained not without a show of reason that sensuality and especially hunger was the first cause of cannibalism among the new zealanders and not only among the polynesian races but also among the savages of europe for said he cannibalism was long prevalent among the ancestors of the most civilized people and especially if the major will not think me personal among the scotch really said mcnabbs yes major replied paganel if you read certain passages of saint jerome on the anticoli of scotland you will see what he thought of your forefathers and without going so far back as historic times under the reign of elizabeth when shakespeare was dreaming out of his shylock a scotch bandit sawney bean was executed for the crime of cannibalism was it religion that prompted him to cannibalism no it was hunger hunger said john mangles hunger 
repeated Paganel. But above all, the necessity of the carnivorous appetite of replacing the bodily waste by the azote contained in animal tissue. The lungs are satisfied with the provision of vegetable and farinaceous food. But to be strong and active, the body must be supplied with those plastic elements that renew the muscles. Until the Maoris become members of the Vegetarian Association, they will eat meat, and human flesh as meat. Why not animal flesh? asked Glenarvan. Because they have no animals, replied Paganel, and that ought to be taken into account, not to extenuate, but to explain their cannibal heads. Quadrupeds and even birds are rare on these inhospitable shores, so that the Maoris have always eaten human flesh. There are even man-eating seasons, as there are in civilized countries hunting seasons. They begin the great wars, and whole tribes are served up on the tables of the conquerors. Well then, said Glenarvan, according to your mode of reasoning, Paganel, cannibalism will not cease in New Zealand until her pastures teem with sheep and oxen. Evidently, my dear lord, and even then it will take years to wean them from Maori flesh, which they prefer to all others, for the children will still have a relish for what their fathers so highly appreciated. According to them, it tastes like pork with even more flavor. As to white men's flesh, they do not like it so well, because the whites eat salt with their food, which gives a peculiar flavor, not to the taste of connoisseurs. They are dainty, said the Major, but black or white, do they eat it raw or cook it? Why, what is that to you, Mr. McNabbs? cried Robert. What is that to me? exclaimed the Major earnestly. If I am to make a meal for a cannibal, I should prefer being cooked. Why? because then I should be sure of not being eaten alive. Very good, Major, said Paganel. But suppose they cooked you alive. The fact is, answered the Major, I will not give half a crown for the choice. Well, McNabbs, if it will comfort you, you may as well be told. The New Zealanders do not eat flesh without cooking or smoking it. They are very clever and experienced in cookery. For my part, I very much dislike the idea of being eaten. The ideal of endings one life in the maw of a stranger? Bah! The conclusion of all, said John Mangles, is that we must not fall into their hands. Let us hope that one day Christianity will abolish all these monstrous customs. Yes, we must hope so, replied Paganel. But believe me, a savage who has tasted human flesh is not easily persuaded to forego it. I will relate two facts which prove it. By all means, let us have the facts, Paganel, said Glenarvan. The first is narrated in the chronicles of the Jesuit society in Brazil. A Portuguese missionary was one day visiting an old Brazilian woman who was very ill. She had only a few days to live. The Jesuit inculcated the truths of religion which the dying woman accepted without objection. Then, having attended to her spiritual wants, he bethought himself of her bodily needs and offered her some European delicacies. Alas, she said, my digestion is too weak to bear any kind of food. There is only one thing I could fancy, and nobody here could get it for me. What is it? asked the Jesuit. Ah, my son, she said, it is the hand of a little boy. I feel as if I should enjoy munching the little bones. Horrid! But I wonder, is it so very nice? said Robert. My second tale will answer you, my boy, said Taganel. One day a missionary was reproving a cannibal for the horrible custom so abhorrent to God's laws of eating human flesh. And besides, said he, it must be so nasty. Oh, father, said the savage, looking greedily at the missionary, say that God forbids it. That is a reason for what you tell us. But don't say it is nasty. If you had only tasted it. End of Book 3, Chapter 5 Recording by Michael Anthony Petronic Book 3, Chapter 6 of In Search of the Castaways this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. In Search of the Castaways, or The Children of Captain Grant, by Jules Verne. Book Three, Chapter Six, A Dreaded Country. Paganel's facts were indisputable. The cruelty of the New Zealanders was beyond a doubt. Therefore, it was dangerous to land. But had the danger been a hundredfold greater, it had to be faced. John Mangles felt the necessity of leaving without delay a vessel doomed to certain and speedy destruction. There were two dangers, one certain and the other probable, but no one could hesitate between them. 
As to their chance of being picked up by a passing vessel, they could not reasonably hope for it. The Macquarie was not in the track of ships bound to New Zealand. They keep further north for Auckland, further south for New Plymouth, and the ship had struck just between these two points, on the desert region of the shores of Ikanamani, a dangerous, difficult coast, and infested by desperate characters. "'When shall we get away?' asked Glenarvan. "'Tomorrow morning at ten o'clock,' replied John Mangles. "'The tide will then turn and carry us to land.' Next day, February 5, at eight o'clock, the raft was finished. John had given all his attention to the building of this structure. The foreyard, which did very well for mooring the anchors, was quite inadequate to the transport of passengers and provisions. What was needed was a strong, manageable raft that would resist the force of the waves during a passage of nine miles. Nothing but the masts could supply suitable materials. Wilson and Mulrady set to work. The rigging was cut clear and the mainmast, chopped away at the base, fell over the starboard rail, which crashed under its weight. The Macquarie was thus raised like a pontoon. When the lower mast, the topmasts, and the royals were sawn and split, the principal pieces of the raft were ready. They were then joined to the fragments of the foremast, and the whole was fastened securely together. John took the precaution to place in the interstices half a dozen empty barrels, which would raise the structure above the level of the water. On this foundation, Wilson laid a kind of floor in open work, made of the gratings off the hatches. The spray could then dash on the raft without staying there, and the passengers would be kept dry. In addition to this, the hose pipes firmly lashed together formed a kind of circular barrier which protected the deck from the waves. That morning, John, seeing that the wind was in their favor, rigged up the royal yard in the middle of the raft as a mast. It was stayed with shrouds and carried a makeshift sail. A large, broad-bladed oar was fixed behind to act as a rudder, in case the wind was sufficient to require it. The greatest pains had been expended on strengthening the raft to resist the force of the waves, but the question remained whether, in the event of a change of wind, they could steer, or, indeed, whether they could hope ever to reach the land. At nine o'clock they began to load. First came the provisions, in quantity sufficient to last till they should reach Auckland for they could not count on the productions of this barren region. Old Bonnet's stores furnished some preserved meat which remained of the purchase made for their voyage in the Macquarie. This was but a scanty resource. They had to fall back on the coarse viands of the ship, sea biscuits of inferior quality, and two casks of salt fish. The steward was quite crestfallen. These provisions were put in hermetically sealed cases, staunch and safe from seawater, and then lowered onto the raft, and strongly lashed to the foot of the mast. The arms and ammunition were piled in a dry corner. Fortunately, the travellers were well armed with carbines and revolvers. A holding anchor was also put on board, in case John should be unable to make the land in one tide, and would have to seek moorings. At ten o'clock the tide turned. The breeze blew gently from the northwest, and a slight swell rocked the frail craft. "'Are we ready?' asked John. "'All ready, Captain,' answered Wilson. "'All aboard!' cried John. Lady Helena and Mary Grant descended by a rope ladder, and took their station at the foot of the mast on the cases of provisions, their companions near them. Wilson took the helm. John stood by the tackle, and Mulrady cut the line which held the raft to the ship's side." The sail was spread, and the frail structure commenced its progress toward the land, aided by wind and tide. The coast was about nine miles off, a distance that a boat with good oars would have accomplished in three hours. But with a raft, allowance must be made. If the wind held, they might reach the land in one tide. But if the breeze died away, the ebb would carry them away from the shore, and they would be compelled to anchor and wait for the next tide a serious consideration, and one that filled John Mangles with anxiety. Still, he hoped to succeed. The wind freshened. The tide had turned at ten o'clock, and by three they must either make the land or anchor to save themselves from being carried out to sea. They made a good start. Little by little the black line of the reefs and the yellow banks of sand disappeared under the swelling tide. Extreme watchfulness and perfect skill were necessary to avoid these submerged rocks, and steer a bark that did not readily answer to the helm, and that constantly broke off. At noon they were still five miles from shore. 
a tolerably clear sky allowed them to make out the principal feature of the land. In the northeast rose a mountain about twenty-three hundred feet high, whose sharply defined outline was exactly like the grinning face of a monkey turned toward the sky. It was Parangia, which the map gave as exactly on the thirty-eighth parallel. At half-past twelve Paganel remarked that all the rocks had disappeared under the rising tide. "'All but one,' answered Lady Helena. "'Which, madam?' asked Paganel. "'There,' replied she, pointing to a black speck a mile off. "'Yes, indeed,' said Paganel. "'Let us try to ascertain its position, so as not to get too near it, for the sea will soon conceal it.' "'It is exactly in a line with the northern slope of the mountain,' said John Mangles. "'Wilson, mind you give it a wide berth.' "'Yes, Captain,' answered the sailor, throwing his whole weight on the great oar that steered the raft. In half an hour they had made half a mile, but, strange to say, the black point still rose above the waves. John looked attentively, and, in order to make it out, borrowed Paganel's telescope. "'That is no reef,' said he, after a moment. "'It is something floating, which rises and falls with the swell.' "'Is it part of the mast of the Macquarie?' asked Lady Helena. "'No,' said Glenarvan. "'None of her tempers could have come so far.' "'Stay,' said John Mangles. "'I know it. It is the boat.' "'The ship's boat?' exclaimed Glenarvan. "'Yes, my lord, the ship's boat. Keel up.' "'The unfortunate creatures,' cried Lady Helena. "'They have perished.' "'Yes, madam,' replied John Mangles. "'They must have perished, for in the midst of these breakers in a heavy swell on that pitchy night, they ran to certain death.' For a few minutes the passengers were silent. They gazed at the frail craft as they drew near it. It must evidently have capsized about four miles from the shore, and not one of the crew could have escaped. "'But this boat may be of use to us,' said Glenarvan. "'That is true,' answered John Mangles. "'Keep her up, Wilson.' The direction was slightly changed, but the breeze fell gradually, and it was two hours before they reached the boat." Mulrady, stationed forward, fended off the blow, and the yawl was drawn alongside. "'Empty?' asked John Mangles. "'Yes, Captain,' answered the sailor. "'The boat is empty, and all its seams are open. It is of no use to us.' "'No use at all?' said McNabbs. "'None at all,' said John Mangles. "'It is good for nothing but to burn.' "'I regret it,' said Paganel for the yawl might have taken us to Auckland. "'We must bear our fate, Monsieur Paganel,' replied John Mangles. "'But for my part, in such a stormy sea, I prefer our raft to that crazy boat. A very slight shock would be enough to break her up. Therefore, my lord, we have nothing to detain us further.' "'As you think best, John.' "'Own, then, Wilson,' said John, "'and bear straight for the land.' There was still an hour before the turn of the tide." and that time they might make two miles. But the wind soon fell almost entirely, and the raft became nearly motionless, and soon began to drift to seaward under the influence of the ebb tide. John did not hesitate a moment. "'Let go the anchor,' said he. Mulrady, who stood to execute this order, let go the anchor in five fathoms water. The raft backed about two fathoms on the line, which was then at full stretch, the sail was taken in, and everything made snug for a tedious period of inaction. The returning tide would not occur till nine o'clock in the evening, and as John Mangles did not care to go on in the dark, the anchorage was for the night, or at least till five o'clock in the morning, land being in sight at a distance of less than three miles. A considerable swell raised the waves, and seemed to set in continuously toward the coast, and perceiving this, Glenarvan asked John why he did not take advantage of this swell to get nearer to the land. "'Your lordship is deceived by an optical illusion,' said the young captain. "'Although the swell seems to carry the waves landward, it does not really move at all. It is mere undulating molecular motion, nothing more. Throw a piece of wood overboard, and you will see that it will remain quite stationary, except as the tide affects it. There is nothing for it but patience.' "'And dinner,' said the Major. Old Bennett unpacked some dried meat and a dozen biscuits. The steward blushed as he proffered the meagre bill of fare. But it was received with a good grace, even by the ladies, 
who, however, had not much appetite, owing to the violent motion. This motion, produced by the jerking of the raft on the cable, while she lay head on to the sea, was very severe and fatiguing. The blows of the short, tumbling seas were as severe as if she had been striking on a submerged rock. Sometimes it was hard to believe that she was not aground. The cable strained violently, and every half hour John had to take in a fathom to ease it. Without this precaution it would certainly have given way, and the raft must have drifted to destruction. John's anxiety may easily be understood. His cable might break, or his anchor lose its hold, and in either case the danger was imminent. Night drew on. The sun's disk, enlarged by refraction, was dipping blood-red below the horizon. The distant waves glittered in the west, and sparkled like sheets of liquid silver. Nothing was to be seen in that direction but sky and water, except one sharply defined object, the hull of the Macquarie, motionless on her rocky bed. The short twilight postponed the darkness only by a few minutes, and soon the coast outline, which bounded the view on the east and north, was lost in darkness. The shipwrecked party were in an agonizing situation on their narrow raft, and overtaken by the shades of night. Some of the party fell into a troubled sleep, a prey to evil dreams. Others could not close an eye. When the day dawned, the whole party were worn out with fatigue. With the rising tide, the wind blew again toward the land. It was six o'clock in the morning, and there was no time to lose. John arranged everything for resuming their voyage, and then he ordered the anchor to be weighed. But the anchor flukes had been so embedded in the sand by the repeated jerks of the cable, that without a windlass it was impossible to detach it, even with the tackle which Wilson had improvised. Half an hour was lost in vain efforts. John, impatient of delay, cut the rope, thus sacrificing his anchor, and also the possibility of anchoring again if this tide failed to carry them to land. But he decided that further delay was not to be thought of, and an axe blow committed the raft to the mercy of the wind, assisted by a current of two knots an hour. The sail was spread. They drifted slowly toward the land, which rose in gray, hazy masses, on a background of sky illumined by the rising sun. The reef was dexterously avoided and doubled, but with the fitful breeze the raft could not get near the shore. What toil and pain to reach a coast so full of danger when attained! At nine o'clock the land was less than a mile off. It was a steeply shelving shore, fringed with breakers. A practicable landing-place had to be discovered. Gradually the breeze grew fainter, and then ceased entirely. The sail flapped idly against the mast, and John had it furled. The tide alone carried the raft to the shore, but steering had become impossible, and its passage was impeded by immense bands of fucus. At ten o'clock John found himself almost at a standstill, not three cables' lengths from the shore. Having lost their anchor, they were at the mercy of the ebb tide. John clenched his hands. He was racked with anxiety, and cast frenzied glances toward this inaccessible shore. In the midst of his perplexities, a shock was felt. The raft stood still. It had landed on a sandbank twenty-five fathoms from the coast. Glenarvan, Robert, Wilson, and Mulrady jumped into the water. The raft was firmly moored to the nearest rocks. The ladies were carried to land without wetting a fold of their dresses, and soon the whole party, with their arms and provisions, were finally landed on these much-dreaded New Zealand shores. End of Book 3, Chapter 6《Book Three, Chapter Seven of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Search of the Castaways, or the Children of Captain Grant, by Jules Verne. Book Three, Chapter Seven The Maori War. Glenarvan would have liked to start without an hour's delay and follow the coast to Auckland. But since the morning heavy clouds had been gathering, and toward eleven o'clock, after the landing was effected, the vapors condensed into violet rain, so that instead of starting they had to look for shelter. Wilson was fortunate enough to discover what just suited their wants, a grotto hollowed out by the sea in the basaltic rocks. Here the travelers took shelter with their arms and provisions. 
In the cave they found a ready-garnered store of dried seaweed, which formed a convenient couch. For fire they lighted some wood near the mouth of the cavern, and dried themselves as well as they could. John hoped that the duration of this deluge of rain would be in an inverse ratio to its violence, but he was doomed to disappointment. Hours passed without any abatement of its fury. Toward noon the wind freshened, and increased the force of the storm. The most patient of men would have rebelled at such an untoward incident, but what could be done? Without any vehicle, they could not brave such a tempest, and after all, unless the natives appeared on the scene, a delay of twelve hours was not so much consequence, as the journey to Auckland was only a matter of a few days. During this involuntary halt, the conversation turned on the incidents of the New Zealand war. But to understand and appreciate the critical position into which these Macquarie passengers were thrown, something ought to be known of the history of the struggle which had deluged the island of Iknamani with blood. Since the arrival of Abel Tasman in Cook's Strait on the 16th of December, 1642, though the New Zealanders had often been visited by European vessels, they had maintained their liberty in their several islands. No European power had thought of taking possession of this archipelago which commands the whole Pacific Ocean. The missionaries stationed at various points were the sole channels of Christian civilization. Some of them, especially the Anglicans, prepared the minds of the New Zealand chiefs for submitting to the English yoke. It was cleverly managed, and these chiefs were influenced to sign a letter addressed to Queen Victoria to ask her protection. But the most clear-sighted of them saw the folly of this step, and one of them, after having affixed his tattoo mark to the letter by way of signature, uttered these prophetic words, "'We have lost our country. Henceforth it is not ours. Soon the stranger will come and take it, and we shall be his slaves.' And so it was, on January twenty ninth, 1840, the English corvette Herald arrived to claim possession." From the year 1840 till the day the Duncan left the Clyde, nothing had happened here that Paganel did not know, and he was ready to impart his information to his companions. "'Madam,' said he, in answer to Lady Helena's questions, "'I must repeat what I had occasion to remark before, that the New Zealanders are a courageous people, who yielded for a moment, but afterward fought foot to foot against the English invaders.' the maori tribes are organized like the old clans of scotland they are so many great families owning a chief who is very jealous of his prerogative the men of this race are proud and brave one tribe tall with straight hair like the maltese or the jews of baghdad the other smaller thick-set like mulattoes but robust haughty and warlike they had a famous chief named hihi a real versantinjorix so that you need not be astonished that the war with the English has become chronic in the northern island, for in it is the famous tribe of the Waikatos, who defend their lands under the leadership of William Thompson. But, said John Mangles, are not the English in possession of the principal points in New Zealand? Certainly, dear John, replied Paganel, after Captain Hobson took formal possession and became governor, Nine colonies were founded at various times between 1840 and 1862, in the most favorable situations. These formed the nucleus of nine provinces, four in the North Island and five in the Southern Island, with a total population of 184,346 inhabitants, on the 30th of June, 1864. "'But what about this interminable war?' asked John Mangles. "'Well,' said Paganel, Six months long have gone by since we left Europe, and I cannot say what may have happened during that time, with the exception of a few facts which I gathered from the newspapers of Maryborough and Seymour during our Australian journey. At that time the fighting was very likely in the Northern Island. "'And when did the war commence?' asked Mary Grant. "'Recommence, you mean, my dear young lady,' replied Paganel, for there was an insurrection so far back as 1845. The present war began toward the close of 1863, but long before that date the Maoris were occupied in making preparations to shake off the English yoke. The national party among the natives carried on an active propaganda for the election of a Maori ruler. 
The object was to make old Potatu king, and to fix as the capital of the new kingdom his village, which lay between Wakato and Wapi rivers. Potatu was an old man, remarkable rather for cunning than for bravery. But he had a prime minister who was both intelligent and energetic, a descendant of the Niktahas, who occupied the isthmus before the arrival of the strangers. This minister, William Thompson, became the soul of the War of Independence, and organized the Maori troops with great skill. Under this guidance, a Taranaki chief gathered the scattered tribes around the same flag. A Wikato chief formed a land league intended to prevent the natives from selling their land to the English government, and warlike feasts were held, just as in civilized countries on the verge of revolution. The English newspapers began to notice these alarming symptoms, and the government became seriously disturbed at these land league proceedings. In short, the train was laid, and the mine was ready to explode. Nothing was wanted but the spark, or rather the shock of rival interests, to produce the spark. This shock took place in 1860, in the Taranaki province, on the southwest coast of Iknamani. A native had six hundred acres of land in the neighborhood of New Plymouth. He sold them to the English government, but when the surveyor came to measure the purchased land, the chief Kingi protested, and by the month of March he had made the six hundred acres in question into a fortified camp, surrounded with high palisades. Some days after, Colonel Gold carried this fortress at the head of his troops, and that day heard the first shot fired of the native war. Have the rebels been successful up to this time? Yes, madam, and the English themselves have often been compelled to admire the courage and bravery of the New Zealanders. Their mode of warfare is of the guerrilla type. They form skirmishing parties, come down in small detachments, and pillage the colonists' homes. General Cameron had no easy time in the campaigns during which every bush had to be searched. In 1863, after a long and sanguinary struggle, The Maoris were entrenched in strong and fortified position on the upper Wakato, at the end of a chain of steep hills, and covered by three miles of forts. The native prophets called on all the Maori population to defend the soil, and promised the extermination of the Pakakas, or white men. General Cameron had three thousand volunteers at his disposal, and they gave no quarter to the Maoris after the barbarous murder of Captain Sprent. Several bloody engagements took place. In some instances, the fighting lasted twelve hours before the Maoris yielded to the English cannonade. The heart of the army was the fierce Wakato tribe under William Thompson. This native general commanded at the outset two thousand five hundred warriors, afterward increased to eight thousand. The men of Shongi and Heki, two powerful chiefs, came to his assistance. The women took their part in the most trying labors of this patriotic war. But right has not always might. After severe struggles, General Cameron succeeded in subduing the Wakato district, but empty and depopulated, for the Maoris escaped in all directions. Some wonderful exploits were related. Four hundred Maoris, who were shut up in the fortress of Oraka, besieged by one thousand English, under Brigadier General Carey, without water or provisions, refused to surrender. But one day at noon cut their way through the then decimated fortieth regiment and escaped to the marshes. But, asked John Mangles, did the submission of the Wakito district put an end to the sanguinary war? No, my friend, replied Paganel. The English resolved to march on Taranaki province and besiege Metatawa, William Thompson's fortress. But they did not carry it without great loss. Just as I was leaving Paris, I heard that the governor and the general had accepted the submission of the Taranga tribes and left them in possession of three fourths of their lands. It was also rumored that the principal chief of the rebellion, William Thompson, was inclined to surrender. But the Australian papers have not confirmed this, but rather the contrary, and I should not be surprised to find that at this moment the war is going on with renewed vigor. Then, according to you, Paganel, said Glenarvan, This struggle is still going on in the provinces of Auckland and Taranaki? I think so. This very province where the Macquarie's wreck has deposited us. Exactly. We have landed a few miles above Cahia Harbor, where the Maori flag is probably still floating. 
"'Then our most prudent course would be to keep toward the north,' remarked Glenarvan. "'By far the most prudent,' said Paganel. "'The New Zealanders are incensed against Europeans, and especially against the English. "'Therefore let us avoid falling into their hands.' "'We might have the good fortune to fall in with a detachment of European troops,' said Lady Helena. "'We may, madam,' replied the geographer, "'but I do not expect it. "'Detached parties do not like to go far into the country, "'where the smallest tussock, the thinnest brushwood, "'may conceal an accomplished marksman. "'I don't fancy we shall pick up an escort of the 40th Regiment, "'but there are mission stations on this west coast, "'and we shall be able to make them our halting places "'till we get to Auckland.'" End of Book 3, Chapter 7《Book Three, Chapter Eight of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Search of the Castaways, or the Children of Captain Grant by Jules Verne. Book Three, Chapter Eight. On the Road to Auckland. On the seventh of February, at six o'clock in the morning, the signal for departure was given by Glenarvan. During the night, the rain had ceased. The sky was veiled with light grey clouds, which moderated the heat of the sun, and allowed the travellers to venture on a journey by day. Paganel had measured on the map a distance of eighty miles between Point Kauhia and Auckland. It was an eight days' journey if they made ten miles a day. But instead of following the windings of the coast, he thought it better to make for a point thirty miles off, at the confluence of the Wakato and the Waipa, at the village of Ingarnavia. The overland track passes that point, and is rather a path than a road, practicable for the vehicles which go almost across the island, from Napier in Hawke's Bay, to Auckland. From this village it would be easy to reach Drury, and there they could rest in an excellent hotel, highly recommended by Dr. Hotstetter. The travellers, each carrying a share of the provisions, commenced to follow the shore of Aotea Bay. From prudential motives they did not allow themselves to struggle, and by instinct they kept a lookout over the undulating plains to the eastward, ready with their loaded carbines. Paganel, map in hand, took a professional pleasure in verifying the minutest details. The country looked like an immense prairie which faded into distance, and promised an easy walk. But the travellers were undeceived when they came to the edge of this verdant plain. The grass gave way to a low scrub of small bushes bearing little white flowers, mixed with those innumerable tall ferns with which the lands of New Zealand abound. They had to cut a path across the plain, through these woody stems, and this was a matter of some difficulty. But at eight o'clock in the evening, the first slopes of the Hakarihoata ranges were turned, and the party camped immediately. After a fourteen days' march, they might well think of resting. Neither wagon nor tent being available, they sought repose beneath some magnificent Norfolk Island pines. They had plenty of rugs, which make good beds. Glenarvan took every possible precaution for the night. His companions and he, well armed, were to watch in turns, two and two, till daybreak. No fires were lighted. Barriers of fire are a potent preservation from wild beasts, but New Zealand has neither tiger, nor lion, nor bear, nor any wild animal, but the Maori adequately fills their place, and a fire would only have served to attract this two-footed jaguar. The night passed pleasantly with the exception of the attack of the sand-flies, called by the natives Ngamu, and the visit of the audacious family of rats, who exercised their teeth on the provisions. Next day, on the 8th of February, Paganel rose more sanguine, and almost reconciled to the country. The Maoris, whom he particularly dreaded, had not yet appeared, and these ferocious cannibals had not molested him even in his dreams. "'I begin to think that our little journey will end favorably. This evening we shall reach the confluence of the Waipa and Wakato, and after that there is not much chance of meeting natives on this way to Auckland. "'How far is it now?' said Glenarvan, to the confluence of the Waipa and Wakato. Fifteen miles, just about what we did yesterday. But we shall be terribly delayed if this interminable scrub continues to obstruct our path. No, said Paganel, we shall follow the banks of the Waipa, and then we shall have no obstacle, but on the contrary a very easy road. Well, then, said Glenarvan, seeing the ladies ready, let us make a start. During the early part of the day the thick brushwood seriously impeded their progress. Neither wagon nor horses could have passed where travellers passed, so that their Australian vehicle was but slightly regretted. Until practicable wagon roads are cut through these forests of scrub, New Zealand will only be accessible to foot passengers. 
The ferns, whose name is Legion, concur with the Maoris in keeping strangers off the lands. The little party overcame many obstacles in crossing the plains in which the Hakari Hoata ranges rise. Before noon they reached the banks of the Waipa, and followed the northward course of the river. The Major and Robert, without leaving their companions, shot some snipe and partridge under the low shrubs of the plain. Albanet, to save time, plucked the birds as he went along. Paganel was less absorbed by the culinary importance of the game than by the desire of obtaining some bird peculiar to New Zealand. His curiosity as a naturalist overcame his hunger as a traveller. He called to mind the peculiarities of the tui of the natives, sometimes called the mocking-bird from its incessant chuckle, and sometimes the parson in allusion to the white cravat it wears over its black, cassock-like plumage. "'The tui,' said Paganel to the Major, "'grows so fat during the winter that it makes him ill, and prevents him from flying. Then he tears his breast with his beak, to relieve himself of his fat, and so becomes lighter. Does that not seem to you singular, McNabs?' "'So singular that I don't believe a word of it,' replied the Major. Paganel, to his great regret, could not find a single specimen, or he might have shown the incredulous Major the bloody scars on the breast. But he was more fortunate with a strange animal which, hunted by men, cats, and dogs, has fled toward the unoccupied country, and is fast disappearing from the fauna of New Zealand. Robert, searching like a ferret, came upon a nest made of interwoven roots, and in it a pair of birds destitute of wings and tail, with four toes, a long snipe-like beak, and a covering of white feathers over the whole body, singular creatures, which seem to connect the oviparous tribes with the mammifers. It was the New Zealand kiwi, the Apteryx australis of naturalists, which lives with equal satisfaction on larvae, insects, worms, or seeds. The bird is peculiar to the country. It has been introduced into a very few of the zoological collections of Europe. Its graceless shape and comical motions have always attracted the notice of travellers, and during the great exploration of the astrolabe and the zeely, Dermot d'Urville was principally charged by the Academy of Sciences to bring back a specimen of these singular birds. But in spite of the rewards offered to the natives, he could not obtain a single specimen. Paganel, who was elated at such a piece of luck, tied the two birds together, and carried them along with the intention of presenting them to the Jardin des Plantes in Paris. Presented by M. Jacques Paganel, he mentally saw the flattering inscription on the handsomest cage in the gardens, Sanguine Geographer. The party pursued their way without fatigue along the banks of the Waipa. The country was quite deserted, not a trace of natives, nor any track that could betray the existence of man. The stream was fringed with tall bushes, or glided along sloping banks, so that nothing obstructed the view of the low range of hills which closed the eastern end of the valley. With their grotesque shapes, and their outlines lost in a deceptive haze, they brought to mind giant animals, worthy of antediluvian times. They might have been a herd of enormous whales, suddenly turned to stone. These disrupted masses proclaimed their essential volcanic character. New Zealand is, in fact, a formation of recent plutonic origin. Its emergence from the sea is constantly increasing. Some points are known to have risen six feet in twenty years. Fire still runs across its centre, shakes it, convulses it, and finds an outlet in many places by the mouths of geysers and the craters of volcanoes. At four in the afternoon, nine miles had been easily accomplished. According to the map which Paganel constantly referred to, the confluence of the Waipa and Wakaito ought to be reached about five miles further on, and there the night halt could be made. Two or three days would then suffice for the fifty miles which lay between them and the capital, and if Glenarvan happened to fall in with the mail-coach that plies between Hawke's Bay and Auckland twice a month, eight hours would be sufficient. Therefore, said Glenarvan, we shall be obliged to camp during the night once more. Yes, said Paganel, but I hope for the last time. I am very glad to think so, for it is very trying for Lady Helena and Mary Grant. And they never utter a murmur, added John Mangles, but I think I heard you mention a village at the confluence of these rivers. Yes, said the geographer, here it is, marked on Johnston's map. It is in Garnavahia, two miles below the junction. Well, could we not stay there for the night? Lady Helena and Miss Grant would not grudge two miles more to find a hotel of even a humble character. A hotel, cried Paganel, a hotel in a Maori village. You would not find an inn, not a tavern. This village will be a mere cluster of huts, and so far from seeking rest there, my advice is that you give it a wide berth. Your old fears, Paganel, retorted Glenarvan. My dear lord, where Maoris are concerned, distrust is safer than confidence. 
I do not know on what terms they are with the English, whether the insurrection is suppressed or successful, or whether indeed the war may not be going on with full vigour. Modesty apart, people like us would be a prize, and I must say I would rather forego a taste of Maori hospitality. I think it certainly more prudent to avoid this village of Ingarnavahia, to skirt it at a distance, so as to avoid all encounters with the natives. When we reach Drury it will be another thing, and there our brave ladies will be able to recruit their strength at their leisure. This advice prevailed. Lady Helena preferred to pass another night in the open air, and not to expose her companions to danger. Neither Mary Grant nor she wished to halt, and they continued their march along the river. Two hours later, the first shades of evening began to fall. The sun, before disappearing below the western horizon, darted some bright rays through an opening in the clouds. The distant eastern summits were empurpled with the parting glories of the day. It was like a flying salute addressed to the wayworn travellers. Glenarvan and his friends hastened their steps. They knew how short the twilight is in this high latitude, and how quickly the night follows it. They were very anxious to reach the confluence of the two rivers before the darkness overtook them. But a thick fog rose from the ground, and made it very difficult to see the way. Fortunately hearing stood them in the stead of sight. Shortly a nearer sound of water indicated that the confluence was at hand. At eight o'clock the little troop arrived at the point where the Waipa loses itself in the Wakato, with a moaning sound of meeting waves. "'There is the Wakaito,' cried Paganel, "'and the road to Auckland is along its right bank.' "'We shall see that to-morrow,' said the Major. "'Let us camp here. "'It seems to me that that dark shadow "'is that of a little clump of trees "'grown expressly to shelter us. "'Let us have supper, and then get some sleep.' "'Supper, by all means,' said Paganel, "'but no fire, nothing but biscuit and dried meat. "'We have reached this spot incognito. "'Now let us try and get away in the same manner. "'By good luck the fog is in our favor. The clump of trees was reached, and all concurred in the wish of the geographer. The cold supper was eaten without a sound, and presently a profound sleep overcame the travellers, who were tolerably fatigued with their fifteen miles' march. End of Book 3, Chapter 8「All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.」In Search of the Castaways, or The Children of Captain Grant by Jules Verne. Book 3, Chapter 9 Introduction to the Carnivals The next morning at daybreak, a thick fog was clinging to the surface of the river. A portion of the vapors that saturated the air were condensed by the cold, and lay as a dense cloud on the water. But the rays of the sun soon broke through the watery mass and melted away. A tongue of land, sharply pointed and bristling with brushes, projected into the uniting steams. The sifter waters of the Vaipa rushed against the current of the Waikato for a quarter of a mile before they mingled with it. But the calm and majestic river soon quieted the noisy steams and carried it off quietly in its course to the Pacific Ocean. When the vapor disappeared, a boat was seen ascending the current of the Waikato. It was a canoe, seventy feet long, five broad, and three deep. The prow raised like that of a Venetian gondola, and the whole held out of a trunk of a kahikatea. A bed of dry fern was laid at the bottom. It was swiftly rowed by eight oars, and steered with a paddle by a man seated in the stern. This man was a tall Maori, about forty-five years of age, broad-chested, muscular, with powerful developed hands and feet. His prominent and deeply furrowed brow, his fierce look and sinister expression, gave him a formidable aspect. Tattooing, or moko, as the New Zealanders call it, is a mark of great distinction. 
none is worthy of these honorary lines who has not distinguished himself in repeated fights the slaves and the lower class cannot obtain these decoration chiefs of high position may be known by the finish and precision and truth of the design which sometimes covers their whole bodies with the figures of animals some are found to undergo the painful operation of moko five times the more illustrious the more illustrated is the rule of new zealand dumont de ville has given some curious details as to this custom he justly observes that moko is the counterpart of the armorial bearings of which many families in europe are so vain but he remarks that there is a difference the armorial bearings of europe are frequently and prove only the merits of the first who bore them and are no certificate of the merits of his descendants while the individual coat of arms of the maori is an irrefragable proof that it was earned by the display of extraordinary personal courage the practice of tattooing independently of the consideration it procures has also a useful aspect it gives the cutaneous system an increased thickness enabling it to resist the inclemency of the season and the incessant attacks of the mosquitoes as to the chief who was steering the canoe there could be no mistake the shaped albatross bone used by the maori tetua had five times scored his countenance he was in his fifth edition and betrayed it in his hardly bearing his figure draped in a large mat woven of formium trimmed white dog skin was clouted with a pair of cotton drawers blood strained from recent combats from the pendant lobe of his ear hung earrings of green jade and round his neck a quivering necklace of ponemus a kind of jade stone sacred among the new zealanders at his side laid an english rifle and a patu patu a kind of two-headed axe of an emerald color and eighteen inches long beside him sat nine armed warriors of inferior rank ferocious looking fellows some of them suffering from recent wounds they sat quite motionless wrapped in their flax mantles three savage-looking dogs laid at their feet the eight rowers in the prow seemed to be servants or slaves of the chief they rowed vigorously and propelled the boat against the not very rapid current of the waikato with extraordinary velocity in the center of this long canoe with their feet tied together sat ten european prisoners closely packed together it was glenarvan and lady helena mary grant robert paganel the major john mangles the steward and two sailors the night before the little band had unwittingly owing to the mist encamped in the midst of a numerous party of natives toward the middle of the night they were surprised in their sleep were made prisoners and carried on board the canoe they had not been ill-treated so far but all attempts at resistance had been vain their arms and ammunition were in the hands of the savages and they would soon have been targets for their own balls they were soon aware from a few english words used by the natives that they were a retreating party of the tribe who had been beaten and decimated by the english troops 
and were on their way back to the upper Waikato. The Maori chief, whose principal warriors had been picked off by the soldiers of the 42nd Regiment, was returning to make a final appeal to the tribes of the Waikato district, so that he might go to the aid of the indomitable William Thompson, who was still holding his own against the conquerors. The chief's name was Kaikumu, a name of evil bodying in the native language, meaning he who eats the limbs of his enemies. He was bold and brave, but his cruelty was equally remarkable. No pity was to be expected at his hands. His name was well known to the English soldiers, and a price had been set on his head by the governor of New Zealand. This terrible blow befell Glen Arvan at the very moment when he was about to reach the long-desired haven of Auckland, and so regain his own country. But no one who looked at his cool, calm features could have guessed the anguish he endured. Glen Arvan always rose to his misfortunes. He felt that his part was to be the strength and the example of his wife and companions, that he was the head and chief, ready to die for the rest if circumstances required it. He was of a deeply religious turn of mind, and never lost his trust in providence nor his belief in the sacred character of his enterprise. In the midst of this crowning peril, he did not give way to any feeling of regret at having been induced to venture into this country of savages. His companions were worthy of him. They entered into his lofty views, and judging by their haughty demeanor, it would scarcely have been supposed that they were hurrying to the final catastrophe. With one accord, and by Glenraven's advice, they resolved to effect utter indifferences before the natives. It was the only way to impress these ferocious natures. Savages in general, and particularly the Maoris, have a notion of dignity from which they never derogate. They respect, above all things, coolness and courage. Glenavon was aware that by this mode of procedure he and his companions would spare themselves needless humiliation. From the moment of embarking, the natives, who were very taciturn, like all savages, had scarcely exchanged a word but from the few sentences they did utter, Glenarvan felt certain that the English language was familiar to them. He therefore made up his mind to question the chief on the fate that awaited them. Addressing himself to Kaikumu, he said in a perfectly unconcerned voice, Where are we going, chief? Kaikumu looked coolly at him, and made no answer. What are you going to do with us? pursued Glenarvan. A sudden gleam flashed into the eyes of Kaikumu, and he said in a deep voice, Exchange you, if your own people care to have you, eat you if they don't. Glenarvan asked no further questions, but hope revived in his heart. He concluded that some Maori chiefs had fallen into the hands of the English, and that the natives would try to get them exchanged, so they had a chance of salvation, and the case was not quite so desperate. The canoe was speeding rapidly up the river. Paganel, whose excitable temperament always rebounded from one extreme to the other, had quite regained his spirits. 
he consoled himself that the natives were saving them the trouble of the journey to the English outposts, and that was so much gain. So he took it quite quietly, and followed on the map the curse of the Waikato across the plains and valleys of the province. Lady Helena and Mary Grant, concealing their alarm, conversed in a low voice with Glenarvan, and the neist physiognomist would have failed to see any anxiety in their faces. The Waikato is the national river in New Zealand. It is to the Maoris what the Rhine is to the Germans, and the Duneb to the slaves. In its course of two hundred miles it waters the finest lands of the North Islands, from the province of Wellington to the province of Auckland. It gave its name to all those indomitable tribes of the river district, which rose en masse against the invaders. The water of this river are still almost strangers to any craft but the native canoe. The most audacious tourist will scarcely venture to invade these sacred shores. In fact, the upper Waikato is sealed against profane Europeans. Paganel was aware of the feelings of veneration with which the natives regard this great arterial steam. He knew that the English and German naturalists had never penetrated further than its junction with the Viper. He wondered how far the good pleasure of Kaikumu would carry his captives. He could not have guessed, but for hearing the word Taupo repeatedly uttered between the sheaf and his warriors, he consulted his map and saw that Taupo was the name of a lake celebrated in geographical annals and lying in the most mountainous part of the island at the southern extremity of Auckland province. The Waikato passes through this lake and then flows on for 120 miles. End of Book 3, Chapter 9 Recording by Dirk Weber, Rheinberg Book 3, Chapter 10 of In Search of the Castaways This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Search of the Castaways, or the Children of Captain Grant, by Jules Verne, Book 3, Chapter 10, A Momentous Interview. An unfathomable gulf, twenty-five miles long and twenty miles broad, was produced, but long before historic times, by the falling in of caverns among the trachytic lavas of the centre of the island. And these waters, falling from the surrounding heights, have taken possession of this vast basin. The gulf has become a lake, but it is also an abyss, and no lead line has yet sounded its depth. Such is the wondrous lake of Taupo, lying 1,250 feet above the level of the sea, and in view of an amphitheatre of mountains 2,400 feet high. On the west are rocky peaks of great size, on the north lofty summits clothed with low trees, on the east a broad beach with a road track, and covered with pumice stones which shimmer through the leafy screen of the bushes. On the southern side rise volcanic cones behind a forest flat. Such is the majestic frame that encloses this vast sheet of water, whose roaring tempests rival the cyclones of ocean. The whole region boils like an immense cauldron hung over subterranean fires. The ground vibrates from the agitation of the central furnace. Hot springs filter out everywhere. The crust of the earth cracks in great rifts like a cake, too quickly baked. About a quarter of a mile off, on a craggy spur of the mountain, stood a Pa, or Maori fortress. The prisoners, whose feet and hands were liberated, were landed one by one and conducted into it by the warriors. The path which led up to the entrenchment lay across the fields of Forium, 
and a grove of beautiful trees, the cacatis, with persistent leaves and red berries, Dracaenus australis, and the tea trees of the natives, whose crown is a graceful counterpart of the cabbage palm, and hyuas, which are used to give a black dye to cloth, large doves with metallic sheen on their plumage, and a world of starlings with reddish caramels, flew away at the approach of the natives. After a rather circuitous walk, Glenarvan and his party arrived at the Pa. The fortress was defended by an outer enclosure of strong palisades, fifteen feet high, a second line of stakes, then a fence composed of osiers with loopholes enclosed the inner space, that is, the plateau of the Pa, on which were erected the Maori buildings, and about forty huts arranged symmetrically. When the captives approached, they were horror-struck at the sight of the heads which adorned the posts of the inner circle. Lady Helena and Mary Grant turned away their eyes, more with disgust than with terror. These heads were those of hostile chiefs who had fallen in battle, and whose bodies had served to feed the conquerors. The geographer recognized that it was so, from their eye-sockets being hollow and deprived of eyeballs. Glenarvan and his companions had taken in all this scene at a glance. They stood near an empty house, waiting the pleasure of the chief, and exposed to the abuse of a crowd of old crones. This troop of harpies surrounded them, shaking their fist, howling and vociferating. Some English words that escaped their coarse mouths left no doubt that they were clamoring for immediate vengeance. In the midst of all these cries and threats, Lady Helena, tranquil to all outward seeming, affected an indifference she was far from feeling. This courageous woman made heroic efforts to restrain herself, lest she should disturb Glenarvan's coolness. Poor Mary Grant felt her heart sink within her, and John Mangles stood by, ready to die in her behalf. His companions bore the deluge of invectives, each according to his disposition, the major with utter indifference, Paganel with exasperation that increased every moment. Glenarvan, to spare Lady Helena the attacks of these witches, walked straight up to Kai Kamo, and pointed to the hideous group. "'Send them away,' said he. The Maori chief stared fixedly at his prisoner without speaking, and then with a nod he silenced the noisy horde. Glenarvan bowed as a sign of thanks, and went slowly back to his place. At this moment a hundred Maoris were assembled in the pa, old men, full-grown men, youths. The former were calm but gloomy, awaiting the orders of Kai Kamau. The others gave themselves up to the most violent sorrow, bewailing their parents and friends who had fallen in the late engagements. Kai Kamau was the only one of the chiefs that obeyed the call of William Thompson, who had returned to the Lake District, and he was the first to announce to his tribe the defeat of the national insurrection, beaten on the plains of the lower Wakato. Of the two hundred warriors, who, under his orders, hastened to the defense of the soil, one hundred and fifty were missing on his return. Allowing for a number, being made prisoners by the invaders, how many must be lying on the field of battle, never to return to the country of their ancestors? This was the secret of the outburst of grief with which the tribe saluted the arrival of Kai Kamo. Up to that moment nothing had been known of the last defeat, and the fatal news fell on them like a thunderclap. Among the savages, sorrow is always manifested by physical signs. The parents and friends of deceased warriors, the women especially, lacerated their faces and shoulders with sharpened shells. The blood spurted out and blended with their tears. Deep wounds denoted great despair. The unhappy Maoris, bleeding and excited, were hideous to look upon. There was another serious element in their grief. Not only had they lost the relative or friend they mourned, but his bones would be missing in the family mausoleum. In the Maori religion, the possession of these relics is regarded as indispensable to the destinies of the future life not the perishable flesh, but the bones, which are collected with the greatest care, cleaned, scraped, polished, even varnished, and then deposited in the udupa, that is, the house of glory. 
These tombs are adorned with wooden statues, representing with perfect exactness the tattoo of the deceased. But now their tombs would be left empty, the religious rites would be unsolemnized, and the bones that escaped the teeth of the wild dog would whiten without burial on the field of battle. Then the sorrowful chorus redoubled. The menaces of the women were intensified by the imprecations of the men against the Europeans. Abusive epitaphs were lavished. The accompanying gestures became more violent. The howl was about to end in brutal action. Kai Kumo, fearing that he might be overpowered by the fanatics of his tribe, conducted his prisoners to a sacred place on an abruptly raised plateau at the other end of the pa. This hut rested against a mound elevated a hundred feet above it, which formed the steep outer buttress of the entrenchment. In this where Atua, sacred house, the priests, or Arikis, taught the Maoris about a triune god, father, son, and bird, or spirit. The large, well-constructed hut contained the sacred and choice food which Maui Ranga Rangui eats by the mouths of his priests. In this place, and safe for the moment from the frenzied natives, the captives lay down on the flax mats. Lady Helena was quite exhausted, her moral energies prostrate, and she fell helpless into her husband's arms. Glenarvan pressed her to his bosom and said, Courage, my dear Helena, heaven will not forsake us. Robert was scarcely in when he jumped on Wilson's shoulders and squeezed his head through a crevice left between the roof and the walls, from which chaplets of amulets were hung. From that elevation he could see the whole extent of the Pa, and as far as Kai Kumo's house. "'They are all crowding around the chief,' he said softly. "'They are throwing their arms about. They are howling. Kai Kumo is trying to speak.' Then he was silent for a few minutes. Kaikumo was speaking. The savages are quieter. They are listening. Evidently, said the Major, this chief has a personal interest in protecting us. He wants to exchange his prisoners for some chiefs of his tribe. But will his warriors consent? Yes, they are listening. They have disappeared. Some have gone into their huts. The others have left the entrenchment. Are you sure? said the Major. "'Yes, Mr. McNabbs,' replied Robert. "'Kaikumo is left alone with the warriors of his canoe. "'Oh, one of them is coming up here.' "'Come down, Robert,' said Glenarvan. "'At this moment Lady Helena, who had risen, seized her husband's arm. "'Edward,' she said in a resolute tone, "'neither Mary Grant nor I must fall into the hands of these savages alive.' "'And so saying, she handed Glenarvan a loaded revolver. "'Firearm?' exclaimed Glenarvan, with flashing eyes. "'Yes, the Maoris do not search their prisoners, but, Edward, this is for us, not for them.' Glenarvan slipped the revolver under his coat. At the same moment the mat at the entrance was raised, and a native entered. He motioned to the prisoners to follow him. Glenarvan and the rest walked across the paw and stopped before Kai Como. He was surrounded by the principal warriors of his tribe and among them the maori whose canoe joined that of the kai Kumo at the confluence of puhane henna on the waikato he was a man about forty years of age powerfully built and of fierce and cruel aspect his name was Keretet, meaning the irascible in the native tongue kai Kumo treated him with a certain tone of respect and by the fineness of his tattoo it was easy to perceive that Keretet held a lofty position in the tribe. But a keen observer would have guessed the feeling of rivalry that existed between these two chiefs. The major observed that the influence of Karatet gave umbrage to Kai Kumo. They both ruled the Wakati tribes, and were equal in authority. During this interview Kai Kumo smiled, but his eyes betrayed a deep-seated enmity. Kai Kumo interrogated Glenarvan. "'You are English?' he said. Yes, replied Glenarvan, unhesitatingly, as his nationality would facilitate the exchange. And your companions? said Kai Kumo. My companions are English like myself. We are shipwrecked travelers, but it may be important to state that we have taken no part in the war. 
that matters little, was the brutal answer of Caratet. Every Englishman is an enemy. Your people invaded our island. They robbed our field. They burned our villages. They were wrong, said Glenarvan quietly. I say so because I think it, not because I am in your power. Listen, said Kai Kumo, the Tohanga, the chief priest of the Nui Atua, has fallen into the hands of your brethren. He is a prisoner among the Pakakas. Our deity has commanded us to ransom him. For my own part, I would rather have torn out your heart. I would have stuck your head and those of your companions on the posts of that palisade. But Nui Atua has spoken. As he uttered these words, Kai Kumo, who till now had been quite unmoved, trembled with rage, and his features expressed intense ferocity. Then, after a few minutes' interval, he proceeded more calmly. Do you think the English will exchange you for our Tahanga? Glenarvan hesitated, all the while watching the Maori chief. I do not know, said he, after a moment of silence. Speak, returned Kai Kumo. Is your life worth that of our Tahunga? No, replied Glenarvan. I am neither a chief nor a priest among my own people. Paganel, petrified at this reply, looked at Glenarvan in amazement. Kai Kumo appeared equally astonished. "'You doubt it, then?' said he. "'I do not know,' replied Glenarvan. "'Your people will not accept you as an exchange for Tahunga?' "'Me alone, no,' repeated Glenarvan. "'All of us, perhaps, they might.' "'Our Maori custom,' replied Kai Kumo, "'is head for head.' "'Offer first these ladies in exchange for your priest,' said Glenarvan, pointing to Lady Helena and Mary Grant. Lady Helena was about to interrupt him, but the Major held her back. "'These two ladies,' continued Glenarvan, bowing respectfully toward Lady Helena and Mary Grant, "'are personages of rank in their own country.' The warrior gazed coldly at his prisoner. An evil smile relaxed his lips for a moment. Then he controlled himself, and in a voice of ill-concealed anger, "'Do you hope to deceive Kai Kumo with your lying words? Accursed Pakaka! Cannot the eyes of Kai Kumo read hearts?' And pointing to Lady Helena, "'That is your wife,' he said. "'No, mine!' exclaimed Keretet. And then, pushing his prisoners aside, he laid his hand on the shoulder of Lady Helena, who turned pale at his touch. Edward, cried the unfortunate woman in terror. Glenarvan, without a word, raised his arm, a shot, and Caratet fell at his feet. The sound brought a crowd of natives to the spot. A hundred arms were ready, and Glenarvan's revolver was snatched from him. Kai Kumo glanced at Glenarvan with a curious expression. Then with one hand protecting Glenarvan, and with the other he waved off the crowd, who were rushing on to the party. At last his voice was heard above the tumult. "'Taboo! Taboo!' he shouted. At that word the crowd stood still before Glenarvan and his companions, who for the time were preserved by a supernatural influence. A few minutes after they were reconducted to where Achua, which was their prison, but Robert Grant and Paganel were not with them. End of Book 3 Chapter 10 Book Three, Chapter Six of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Anthony Petronic. In Search of the Castaways, or The Children of Captain Grant by Jules Verne. Book Three, Chapter Six, The Chief's Funeral. Kai Ka Amu, as frequently happens among the Maoris joined the title of Ariki to that of tribal chief. He was invested with the dignity of priest, and as such he had the power to throw over persons or things to the superstitious protection of the taboo. The taboo, which is common to all Polynesian races, has the primary effect of isolating the tabooed person and preventing the use of tabooed things. According to the Maori doctrine, anyone who laid sacrilegious hands on what had been declared taboo would be punished with death by the insulted deity. 
and even if the god delayed the vindication of his power, the priest took care to accelerate his vengeance. By the chiefs, the taboo was made a political engine, except in some cases, for domestic reasons. For instance, a native is tabooed for several days when his hair is cut, when he is tattooed, when he is building a canoe or a house, when he is seriously ill, and when he is dead. If excessive consumption threatens to exterminate the fish of a river, or ruin the early crops of sweet potatoes, these things are put under the protection of the taboo. If a chief wishes to clear his house of hangers-on, he taboos it. If an English trader displeases him, he is tabooed. His interdict has the effect of the old royal veto. If an object is tabooed, no one can touch it with impunity. When a native is under the interdict, certain ailments are denied him for a prescribed period. If he is relieved as regards to the severe diet, his slaves feed him with the viands he is forbidden to touch with his hands. If he is poor and has no slaves, he has to take up the food with his mouth, like an animal. In short, the most trifling acts of the Maoris are directed and modified by this singular custom. The deity is brought into constant contact with their daily life. The taboo has the same weight as a law, or rather the code of the Maoris, indisputable and undisputed, is comprised in the frequent applications of the taboo. As to the prisoners confined in the Wa'ariatua, it was an arbitrary taboo which had saved them from the fury of the tribe. Some of the natives, friends and partisans of Kai Ka'amu, desisted at once on hearing the chief's voice, and protected the captives from the rest. Glenarvan cherished no elusive hopes as to his own fate. Nothing but his death could atone for the murder of a chief, and among these people death was only the concluding act of a martyrdom of torture. Glenarvan, therefore, was fully prepared to pay the penalty of the righteous indignation that nerved his arm, but he hoped that the wrath of Kaikaamu would not extend beyond himself. What a night he and his companions passed! Who could picture their agonies or measure their sufferings? Robert and Paganel had not been restored to them, but their fate was no doubtful matter. They were too surely the first victims of the frenzied natives. Even McNabbs, who was always sanguine, had abandoned hope. John Mangles was nearly frantic at the sight of Mary Grant's despair at being separated from her brother. Glenarvan pondered over the terrible request of Lady Helena, who preferred dying by his hand to submitting to torture and slavery. How was he to summon the terrible courage? And Mary, who has a right to strike her dead, thought John, whose heart was broken. Escape was clearly impossible. Ten warriors, armed to the teeth, kept watch at the door of the Wa'ariatua. The morning of February 13th arrived. No communication had taken place between the natives and the tabooed prisoners. A limited supply of provisions was in the house, which the unhappy inmates scarcely touched. Misery deadened the pangs of hunger. The day passed without change and without hope. The funeral ceremonies of the dead chief would doubtless be the signal for their execution. Although Glenarvan did not conceal from himself the probability that Ka'ai Ka'amu had given up all idea of exchange, the Major still cherished a spark of hope. Who knows, said he, as he reminded Glenarvan of the effect produced on the chief by the death of Karatiti, who knows but that Ka'ai Ka'amu, in his heart, is very much obliged to you. But even McNabb's remarks failed to awaken hope in Glenarvan's mind. The next day passed without any appearance of preparation for their punishment, and this was the reason for the delay. The Maoris believe that for three days after death the soul inhabits the body, and therefore, for three times twenty-four hours, the corpse remains unburied. This custom was rigorously observed. Till February 15th the pa was deserted. John Mangles, hoisted on Wilson's shoulders, frequently reconnoitred the outer defenses. Not a single native was visible, only the watchful sentinels relieving guard at the door of the Wa'ariatua. But on the third day the huts opened. All the savages, men, women, and children, in all seven hundred Maoris, assembled in the pa, silent and calm. Kai Ka'amu came out of his house, and surrounded by the principal chiefs of his tribe, he took his stand on a mound some feet above the level, in the center of the enclosure. 
the crowd of natives formed in a half-circle some distance off, in dead silence. At a sign from Kai Ka'amu, a warrior bent his steps toward Dwa'ari Atua. Remember, said Lady Helena to her husband. Glenarvan pressed her to his heart, and Mary Grant went closer to John Mangandley's and said hurriedly, Lord and Lady Glenarvan cannot but think if a wife may claim death at her husband's hands to escape a shameful life. A betrothed wife may claim death at the hands of her betrothed husband to escape the same fate. John, at this last moment, I ask you, have we not long been betrothed to each other in our secret hearts? May I rely on you, as Lady Helena relies on Lord Glenarvan? Mary, cried the young captain in his despair. Ah, d dear Mary. The mat was lifted and the captives led to Kaakaiamu. The two women were resigned to their fate. The men dissembled their sufferings with superhuman effort. They arrived in the presence of the Maori chief. You killed Karatiti, said he to Glenarvan. I did, answered Glenarvan. You die tomorrow at sunrise. Alone? asked Glenarvan with a beating heart. Oh, if our Tahanga's life was not more precious than yours, exclaimed Kaika Amu with a ferocious expression of regret. At this moment there was commotion among the natives. Glenarvan looked quickly around. The crowd made way, and a warrior appeared, heated by running and sinking with fatigue. Kaai Ka'amu, as soon as he saw him, said in English, evidently for the benefit of the captives, You come from the camp of the Pakikas. Yes, answered the Maori. You have seen the prisoner, Artahanga? I have seen him. Alive? Dead. English have shot him. It was all over with Glenarvan and his companions. All, cried Kaai Ka'amu, you all die tomorrow at daybreak. Punishment fell on all indiscriminately. Lady Helena and Mary Grant were grateful to heaven for the boon. The captives were not taken back to Wa'aria Tua. They were destined to attend the obsequy of the chief and the bloody rites that accompanied them. A guard of natives conducted them to the foot of an immense Ka'uri, and then stood on guard without taking their eyes off the prisoners. The three prescribed days had elapsed since the death of Karatiti, and the soul of the dead warrior had finally departed, so the ceremonies commenced. The body was laid on a small mound in the central enclosure. It was clothed in a rich dress and wrapped in a magnificent flax mat. His head, adorned with feathers, was encircled with a crown of green leaves. His face, arms, and chest had been rubbed with oil and did not show any sign of decay. The parents and friends arrived at the foot of the mound, and at a certain moment, as if the leader of an orchestra were leading a funeral chant, there arose a great wail of tears, sighs, and sobs. They lamented the deceased with plaintive rhythm and a doleful cadence. The kinsmen beat their heads. The kinswomen tore their faces with their nails and lavished more blood than tears. But these demonstrations were not sufficient to propitiate the soul of the deceased whose wrath might strike the survivors of his tribe, and his warriors, as they could not recall him to life, were anxious that he should have nothing to wish for in the other world. The wife of Kiratiti was not to be parted from him. Indeed, she would have refused to survive him. It was a custom as well as a duty, and Maori history has no lack of such sacrifices. This woman came on the scene. She was still young. Her disheveled hair flowed over her shoulders, her sobs and cries filled the air. Incoherent words, regrets, sobs, broken phrases in which she extolled the virtues of the dead alternated with her moans, and in a crowning paroxysm of sorrow she threw herself at the foot of the mound and beat her head on the earth. The Ka'i Ka'amu drew near. Suddenly the wretched victim rose, but a violent blow from a miri, a kind of club brandished by the chief, struck her to the ground she fell senseless. Horrible yells followed. A hundred arms threatened the terror-stricken captives. But no one moved, for the funeral ceremonies were not yet over. The wife of Kiratiti had joined her husband. The two bodies laid stretched side by side. But in the future life, even the presence of his faithful companion was not enough. Who would attend on them in the realm of Nu Ia to Ua, if their slaves did not follow them into the other world? Six unfortunate fellows were brought to the mound. They were attendants whom the pitiless usages of war had reduced to slavery. 
during the chief's lifetime they had borne the severest privations and been subjected to all kinds of ill usage they had been scantily fed and incessantly occupied like beasts of burden and now according to maori ideals they were to resume to all eternity this life of bondage these poor creatures appeared quite resigned to their destiny they were not taken by surprise their unbound hands showed that they met their fate without resistance their death was speedy and not aggravated by tedious suffering torture was reserved for the authors of the murder who only twenty paces off averted their eyes from the horrible scene which was to grow yet more horrible six blows of the miri delivered by hands of six powerful warriors felled the victims in the midst of a sea of blood this was the signal for a fearful scene of cannibalism the bodies of slaves are not protected by taboo like those of their masters they belong to the tribe they were a sort of small change thrown among the mourners and the moment of sacrifice was over the whole crowd chiefs warriors old men women children without distinction of age or sex fell upon the senseless remains with brutal appetite faster than a rapid pen could describe it the bodies still reeking were dismembered divided cut up not into morsels but into crumbs of the two hundred maoris present every one obtained a share they fought they struggled they quarreled over the smallest fragment the drops of hot blood splashed over these festive monsters and the whole of this detestable crew groveled under a rain of blood it was like the delirious fury of tigers fighting over their prey or like a circus where the wild beasts devour the deer this scene ended a score of fires were lit at various points of the pa the smell of charred flesh polluted the air and but for the fearful tumult of the festival but for the cries that emanated from these flesh-sated throats the captives might have heard the bones crunching under the teeth of the cannibals glenarvan and his companions breathless with horror tried to conceal this fearful scene from the eyes of the two poor ladies they understood then what fate awaited them next day at dawn and also with what cruel torture this death would be preceded they were dumb with horror the funeral dances commenced strong liquors distilled from the piper excelsium animated the intoxication of the natives they had nothing human left it seemed possible that the taboo might be forgotten and they might rush upon the prisoners who were already terrified at their delirious gestures but kai kaamu kept his own senses amidst the general delirium he allowed an hour for this orgy of blood to attain its maximum and then cease and the final scene of the obsequies was performed with the accustomed ceremonial the corpses of karatiti and his wife were raised the limbs were bent and laid against the stomach according to the maori usage then came the funeral not the final interment but a burial until the moment when the earth had destroyed the flesh and nothing remained but the skeleton the place of uda upa or the tomb had been chosen outside the fortress about two miles off at the top of a hill called Mauganamu, situated on the right bank of the lake, and to this spot the body was to be taken. Two palakin of a very primitive kind, hand barrels in fact, were brought to the foot of the mound, and the corpses doubled up so that they were sitting rather than lying, and their garments kept in place by a band of hands which were placed on them. Four warriors took up the litters on their shoulders, and the whole tribe, repeating their funeral chant, followed in procession to the place of sepulture. The captives, still strictly guarded, saw the funeral cortege leave the inner enclosure of the pa, then the chants and cries grew fainter. For about half an hour the funeral procession remained out of sight in the hollow valley, and then came in sight again, winding up the mountainside. The distance gave a fantastic effect to the undulating movement of this long serpentine column. The tribe stopped at an elevation of about eight hundred feet, on the summit of Maunganamu where the burial place of Karatiti had been prepared. An ordinary Maori would have had nothing but a hole and a heap of earth, but a powerful and formidable chief destined to speedy deification was honored with a tomb worthy of his exploits. The Udaupa had been fenced round, and posts surmounted with faces painted in red oak ur stood near the grave where the bodies were to lie. The relatives had not forgotten that the Wa'ai de Ua, the spirit of the dead, lives on mortal food as the body did in this life therefore 
food was deposited in the enclosure as well as the arms and clothing of the deceased. Nothing was admitted for comfort. The husband and wife were laid side by side, then covered with earth and grass, after another series of laments. Then the procession wound slowly down the mountain, and henceforth none dare ascend the slope of Mauganamu on pain of death, for it was tabooed, like Tanga Arairo, where lie the ashes of a chief killed by an earthquake in 1846. End of Book 3, Chapter 6 Recording by Michael Anthony Petronic Book Three, Chapter Twelve of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Search of the Castaways, or The Children of Captain Grant by Jules Verne. Book Three, Chapter Twelve strangely liberated just as the sun was sinking behind lake tapo behind the peaks of tuahua and puckapapu the captives were conducted back to their prison they were not to leave it again till the tops of the wahidi ranges were lit for the first fires of day they had one night in which to prepare for death Overcome as they were with horror and fatigue, they took their last meal together. We shall need our strength, Glenarvan had said, to look death in the face. We must show these savages how Europeans can die. The meal ended. Lady Helena repeated the evening prayer aloud. Her companions, bareheaded, repeated it after her. Who does not turn his thoughts toward God in the hour of death? This done, the prisoners embraced each other. Mary Grant and Helena, in a corner of the hut, lay down on a mat. Sleep, which keeps all sorrow in abeyance, soon weighed down their eyelids. They slept in each other's arms, overcome by exhaustion and prolonged watching. Then Glenarvan, taking his friends aside, said, My dear friends, our lives and the lives of these poor women are in God's hands. If it is decreed that we die tomorrow, let us die bravely, like Christian men, ready to appear without terror before the Supreme Judge. God, who reads our hearts, knows that we had a noble end in view. If death awaits us instead of success, it is his will. Stern as the decree may seem, I will not repine. But death here means not death only. It means torture, insult, perhaps. And here are two ladies. Glenarvan's voice, firm till now, faltered. He was silent a moment. And having overcome his emotion, he said, addressing the young captain, John, you have promised Mary what I promised Lady Helena. What is your plan? I believe, said John, that in the sight of God, I have a right to fulfill that promise. Yes, John, but we are unarmed. No, replied John, showing him a dagger. I snatched it from Kara Tate when he fell at your feet. My lord, whichever of us survives, the other will fulfill the wish of Lady Helena and Mary Grant. After these words were said, a profound silence ensued. At last, the Major said, My friends, keep that to the last moment. I am not an advocate of irremediable measures. I did not speak for ourselves, said Glenarvan. Be it as it may, we can face death. Had we been alone, I should ere now have cried, My friends, let us make an effort, let us attack these wretches, but with these poor girls. At this moment John raised the mat and counted twenty-five natives keeping guard on the Weratua. 
A great fire had been lighted, and its lurid glow threw into strong relief the irregular outlines of the paw. Some of the savages were sitting round the brazier, the others standing motionless, their black outlines relieved against the clear background of flame, but they all kept watchful guard on the hut confided to their care. It has been said that between a vigilant jailer and a prisoner who wishes to escape, the chances are in favor of the prisoner. The fact is, the interest of one is keener than that of the other. The jailer may forget that he is on guard. The prisoner never forgets that he is guarded. The captive thinks oftener of escaping than the jailer of preventing his flight. And hence we hear of frequent and wonderful escapes. But in the present instance, hatred and revenge were the jailers, not an indifferent warder. The prisoners were not bound, but it was because bonds were useless when five and twenty-five men were watching the only egress from the Weratua. This house, with its back to the rock which closed the fortress, was only accessible by a long, narrow promontory which joined it in front to the plateau in which the paw was erected. On its two other sides rose pointed rocks which jutted out over an abyss a hundred feet deep. On that side, descent was impossible, and had it been possible, bottom was shut in by the enormous rock. The only outlet was the regular door of the Weratua, and the Maoris guarded the promontory which united it to the Pa like a drawbridge. All escape was thus hopeless and Glenarvan, having tried the walls for the twentieth time, was compelled to acknowledge that it was so. The hours of this night, wretched as they were, slipped away. Thick darkness had settled on the mountain. Neither moon nor stars pierced the gloom. Some gust of wind whistled by the sides of the paw, and the post of the house creaked. The fire outside revived with the puffs of wind, and the flames sent fitful gleams into the interior of the Weratua. The group of prisoners was lit up for a moment. They were absorbed in their last thoughts, and a death-like silence reigned in the hut. It might have been about four o'clock in the morning when the Major's attention was called to a slight noise which seemed to come from the foundation of the post in the wall of the hut which abutted the rock. McNabbs was at first indifferent, but finding the noise continued, he listened. Then his curiosity was aroused, and he put his ear to the ground. It sounded as if someone was scraping or hollowing out the ground outside. As soon as he was sure of it, he crept over to Glenarvan and John Mangles, and startling them from the melancholy thoughts, led them to the end of the hut. Listen, said he, motioning them to stoop. The scratching became more and more audible. They could hear the little stones grate on a hard body and roll away. Some animal in his burrow, said John Mangles. Glenarvan struck his forehead. Who knows, said he, it might be a man. Animal or man, answered the Major, I will soon find out. Wilson and Olbinett joined their companions and all united to dig through the wall. John with his dagger, the others with stones taken from the ground or with their nails, while Mulrady stretched along the ground, watched the native guard through a crevice of the matting. Those savages sitting motionless around the fire suspected nothing of what was going on twenty feet off. The soil was light and friable, and below lay a bed of silicious tufa. Therefore, even without tools, the aperture deepened quickly. It soon became evident that a man or men clinging to the sides of the paw were cutting a passage into its exterior wall. What could be the object? Did they know of the existence of the prisoners, or was it some private enterprise that led to the undertaking? 
The prisoners redoubled their efforts. Their fingers bled, but still they worked on. After a half an hour, they had gone three feet deep. They perceived by the increased sharpness of the sounds that only a thin layer of earth prevented immediate communication. Some minutes more passed, and the Major withdrew his hand from the stroke of a sharp blade. He suppressed a cry. John Mangles, inserting the blade of his poniard, avoided the knife which now protruded above the soil, but seized the hand that wielded it. It was the hand of a woman or child, a European. On neither side had a word been uttered. It was evidently the cue of both sides to be silent. Is it Robert? whispered Glenarvan. But softly as the name was breathed, Mary Grant, already awakened by the sounds in the hut, slipped over toward Glenarvan, and seizing the hand, all stained with earth, she covered it with kisses. My darling Robert, said she, never doubting, it is you, it is you. Yes, little sister, said he, it is I am here to save you all, but be very silent. Brave lad, repeated Glenarvan. Watch the savages outside, said Robert. Mulrady, whose attention was distracted for a moment by the appearance of the boy, resumed his post. It is all right, said he. There are only four awake. The rest are asleep. A minute after, the hole was enlarged, and Robert passed from the arms of his sister to those of Lady Helena. Round his body was rolled a long coil of flax rope. My child, my child, murmured Lady Helena, the savages did not kill you. No, madam, said he. I do not know how it happened, but in the scuffle I got away. I jumped the barrier. For two days I hid in the bushes to try and see you. While the tribe were busy with the chief's funeral, I came and reconnoitered this side of the path. I saw that I could get to you. I stole this knife and rope out of the desert hut. The tufts of bush and the branches made me a ladder but I found a kind of grotto already hollowed out in the rock under this hut. I had only to bore some feet in the soft earth, and here I am. Twenty noiseless kisses were his reward. Let us be off, said he in a decided tone. Is Paganel below? asked Glenarvan. Monsieur Paganel, replied the boy amazed. Uh, yes, is he waiting for us? No, my lord, but is he not here? inquired Robert. No, Robert, answered Mary Grant. Why, have you not seen him? asked Glenarvan. Did you lose each other in the confusion? Did you not get away together? No, my lord, said Robert, taken aback by the disappearance of his friend Paganel. We'll lose no more time, said the Major. Wherever Paganel is, he cannot be in worse plight than ourselves. Let us go. Truly, the moments were precious. They had to fly. The escape was not very difficult except the twenty feet of perpendicular fall outside the grotto. After the, that, the slope was practicable to the foot of the mountain. From this point, the prisoners could soon gain the lower valleys, while the Maoris, if they perceived the flight of the prisoners, would have to make a long round to catch them, being unaware of the gallery between the Waratua and the outer rock. The escape was commenced, and every precaution was taken. The captive passed one by one through the narrow passage into the grotto, and John Mangles, before leaving the hut, disposed of all the evidence of their work, and in his turn, slipped through the opening and let down over it the mats of the house so that the entrance to the gallery was quite concealed the next thing was to descend the vertical wall to the slope below and this would have been impracticable but that robert had brought the flax rope which was now unrolled and fixed to a projecting point of rock the end hanging over John Mangles, before his friends trusted themselves to this flax rope, tried it. He did not think it very strong, 
and it was of importance not to risk themselves imprudently as a fall would be fatal. This rope, said he, will only bear the weight of two persons. Therefore, let us go in rotation. Lord and Lady Glenarvan first, when they arrive at the bottom, three pulls at the rope will be a signal to us to follow. I will go first, said Robert. I discovered a deep hollow at the foot of the slope where those who come down can conceal themselves and wait for the rest. Go, my boy, said Glenarvan, pressing Robert's hand. Robert disappeared through the opening out of the grotto. A minute later, the three poles at the cord informed them the boy had alighted safely. Glenarvan and Lady Helena immediately ventured out of the grotto. The darkness was still very great, though some grayish streaks were already visible on the eastern summits. The biting cold of morning revived the poor young lady. She felt stronger and commenced her perilous descent. Glenarvan first, then Lady Helena let themselves down along the rope, till they came to the spot where the perpendicular wall met the top of the slope. Then Glenarvan going first, and supporting his wife, began to descend backward. He felt for the tufts and grass and shrubs able to afford a foothold, tried them, and then placed Lady Helena's foot on them. Some birds suddenly awakened flew away, uttering feeble cries, and the fugitives trembled when a stone loosened from his bed rolled to the foot of the mountain. They had reached halfway down the slope when a voice was heard from the opening of the grotto. Stop, whispered John Mangles. Glenarvan, holding with one hand to a tuft of tetragonia, with the other holding his wife, waited with breathless anxiety. Wilson had had an alarm. Having heard some unusual noise outside the Weratua, he went back into the hut and watched the Maoris from behind the mat. At a sign from him, John stopped Glenarvan. One of the warriors on guard, startled by an unusual sound, rose and drew nearer to the Weratua. He stood still for about two paces from the hut and listened with his head bent forward. He remained in that attitude for a minute that seemed an hour, his ear intent, his eye peering into the darkness. Then shaking his head like one who sees he is mistaken, he went back to his companions, took an armful of dead wood and threw it into the smoldering fire which immediately revived. His face was lighted up by the flame and was free from any look of doubt, and after having glanced to where the first light of dawn whitened the eastern sky, stretched himself near the fire to warm his stiffened limb. All's well, whispered Wilson. John signaled to Glenarvan to resume his descent. Glenarvan let himself gently down the slope Soon, Lady Helena and he landed on the narrow track where Robert waited for them. The rope was shaken three times, and in his turn, John Mangles, preceding Mary Grant, followed in the dangerous route. He arrived safely, rejoined Lord and Lady Glenarvan in the hollow mentioned by Robert. Five minutes after, all the fugitives had safely escaped from the Weratua, left their retreat, and keeping away from the inhabited shores of the lakes, they plunged by narrow paths into the recesses of the mountains. They walked quickly, trying to avoid the points where they might be seen from the paw. They were quite silent and glided among the bushes like shadows. Whither? Mm. Where chance led them, but at any rate, they were free. Toward five o'clock, the day began to dawn. Bluish clouds marbled the upper stratum of clouds. The misty summits began to pierce the morning mist. The orb of day was soon to appear. 
and instead of giving them the signal for their execution would on the contrary announce their flight. It was in, of vital importance that the, before the decisive moment arrived they should put themselves beyond the reach of the savages so as to put them off their track. But their progress was slow for the paths were steep. Lady Glenarvan climbed the sl slopes supported not to say carried by Glenarvan and Mary Grant leaned on the arm of John Mangles. Robert radiant with joy triumphant at his success led the march and the two sailors brought up the rear another half an hour and the glorious sun would rise out of the mist of the horizon for half an hour the fugitives walked on as chance led them paganel was not there to take the lead he was now the object of their anxiety and whose absence was a black shadow between them and their happiness. But they bore steadily eastward as much as possible and faced the gorgeous morning light. Soon they had reached a height of five hundred feet above Lake Tapo, and the cold of the morning, increased by the altitude, was very keen. Dim outlines of hills and mountains rose behind one another, but Glenarvan only thought how best to get lost among them, time enough by and by to see about escaping from the labyrinth. At last the sun appeared and sent his first rays on their path. Suddenly a terrific yell from a hundred throats rent the air. It came from the Pa, whose direction Glenarvan did not know. Besides, a thick veil of fog which spread at his feet prevented any distinct view of the valleys below. But the fugitives could not doubt that their escape had been discovered, and now the question was, would they be able to elude pursuit? Had they been seen? Would not their track betray them? And at this moment the fog in the valley lifted and enveloped them for a moment in a damp mist and at three hundred feet below they perceived the swarming mass of frantic natives. While they looked, they were seen. Renewed howls broke forth, mingled with the barking of dogs, and the whole tribe, after vainly trying to scale the rock of Weratua, rushed out of the paw, and hastened by the shortest paths in pursuit of the prisoners who were flying from their vengeance. End of Book 3, Chapter 12book three chapter thirteen of in search of the castaways this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by lucy lafaro in search of the castaways or the children of captain grant by jules verne book three chapter thirteen the sacred mountain the summit of the mountain was still a hundred feet above them. The fugitives were anxious to reach it, that they might continue their flight on the eastern slope, out of the view of their pursuers. They hoped then to find some practicable ridge that would allow of a passage to the neighbouring peaks that were thrown together in an orographic maze, to which poor Paganel's genius would doubtless have found the clue. They hastened up the slope, spurred on by the loud cries that drew nearer and nearer the avenging crowd had already reached the foot of the mountain courage my friends cried glenarvan urging his companions by voice and look in less than five minutes they were at the top of the mountain and then they turned to judge of their position and decide on a route that would baffle their pursuers from their elevated position they could see over Lake Torpo, which stretched toward the west in its setting of picturesque mountains. On the north the peaks of Pirongia, on the south the burning crater of Tongariro, but eastward nothing but the rocky barrier of peaks and ridges that formed the Wahiti Ranges, 
the great chain whose unbroken links stretch from the east cape to cook's straits they had no alternative but to descend the opposite slope and enter the narrow gorges uncertain whether any outlet existed glenarvan could not prolong the halt for a moment wearied as they might be they must fly or be discovered let us go down he cried before our passage is cut off but just as the ladies had risen with a despairing effort mcnabs stopped them and said glenarvan it is useless look and then they all perceived the inexplicable change that had taken place in the movements of the maoris their pursuit had suddenly stopped the ascent of the mountain had ceased by an imperious command the natives had paused in their career and surged like the sea waves against an opposing rock all the crowd thirsting for blood stood at the foot of the mountain yelling and gesticulating brandishing guns and hatchets but not advancing a foot their dogs rooted to the spot like themselves barked with rage what stayed them what occult power controlled these savages the fugitives looked without understanding fearing lest the charm that enchained kay komu's tribe should be broken suddenly john mangles uttered an exclamation which attracted the attention of his companions he pointed to a little enclosure on the summit of the cone the tomb of kara tete said robert are you sure robert said glenarvan yes my lord it is the tomb i recognize it robert was right fifty feet above at the extreme peak of the mountain freshly painted posts formed a small palisaded enclosure and glenarvan too was convinced that it was the chief's burial place the chances of their flight had led them to the crest of manganamu glenarvan followed by the rest climbed to the foot of the tomb a large opening covered with mats led into it glenarvan was about to invade the sanctity of udupa when he reeled backward a savage said he in the tomb inquired the major yes mcnabs no matter go in glenarvan the major robert and john mangles entered there sat a maori wrapped in a large flax mat the darkness of the adupa preventing them from distinguishing his features he was very quiet and was eating his breakfast quite coolly glenarvan was about to speak to him when the native forestalled him by saying gaily and in good english sit down my lord breakfast is ready it was paganel at the sound of his voice they all rushed into the adupa and he was cordially embraced by all paganel was found again he was their salvation they wanted to question him to know how and why he was here on the summit of monganamu but glenarvan stopped this misplaced curiosity the savages said he the savages said paganel shrugging his shoulders i have a contempt for those people come and look at them they all followed paganel out of the adupa the maoris were still in the same position round the base of the mountain uttering fearful cries shout yell till your lungs are gone stupid wretches said paganel i dare you to come here but why said glenarvan because the chief is buried here and the tomb protects us because the mountain is tabooed tabooed yes my friends and that is why i took refuge here as the malefactors used to flee to the sanctuaries in the middle ages god be praised said lady helena lifting her hands to heaven the fugitives were not yet out of danger but they had a moment's respite which was very welcome in their exhausted state glenarvan was too much overcome to speak and the major nodded his head with an air of perfect content 
"'And now, my friends,' said Paganel, "'if these brutes think to exercise their patience on us, "'they are mistaken. "'In two days we shall be out of their reach.' "'By flight,' said Glenarvan. "'But how?' "'That I do not know,' answered Paganel. "'But we shall manage it.' "'And now everybody wanted to know about their friend's adventures.' They were puzzled by the reserve of a man generally so talkative. On this occasion, they had to drag the words out of his mouth. Usually, he was a ready storyteller. Now, he gave only evasive answers to the questions of the rest. Paganel is another man, thought McNabbs. His face was really altered. He wrapped himself closely in his great flax mat, and seemed to deprecate observation. Everyone noticed his embarrassment, when he was the subject of conversation, though nobody appeared to remark it. When other topics were under discussion, Paganel resumed his usual gaiety. Of his adventures, all that could be extracted from him at this time was as follows. After the murder of Karatete, Paganel took advantage, like Robert, of the commotion among the natives, and got out of the enclosure. But, less fortunate than young Grant, he walked straight into a Maori camp, where he met a tall, intelligent-looking chief, evidently of higher rank than all the warriors of his tribe. The chief spoke excellent English, and he saluted the newcomer by rubbing the end of his nose against the end of the geographer's nose. Paganel wondered whether he was to consider himself a prisoner or not. But perceiving that he could not stir without the polite escort of the chief, he soon made up his mind on that point. This chief, Hihi, or Sunbeam, was not a bad fellow. Paganel's spectacles and telescope seemed to give him a great idea of Paganel's importance, and he manifested great attachment to him, not only by kindness, but by a strong flax rope, especially at night. This lasted for three days. To the inquiry whether he was well treated, he said, Yes and no, without further answer. He was a prisoner, and except that he expected immediate execution, his state seemed to him no better than that in which he had left his unfortunate friends. One night, however, he managed to break his rope and escape. He had seen from afar the burial of the chief, and knew that he was buried on the top of Monganamu, and he was well acquainted with the fact that the mountain would be therefore tabooed. He resolved to take refuge there, being unwilling to leave the region where his companions were in durance. He succeeded in his dangerous attempt and had arrived the previous night at the tomb of Karatete, and there proposed to recruit his strength, while he waited in the hope that his friends might, by divine mercy, find the means of escape. Such was Paganel's story. Did he designedly conceal some incident of his captivity? More than once his embarrassment led them to that conclusion. But however that might be, he was heartily congratulated on all sides. And then the present emergency came on for serious discussion. The natives dare not climb Monganamu, but they, of course, calculated that hunger and thirst would restore them their prey. It was only a question of time and patience, is one of the virtues of all savages. Glenarvan was fully alive to the difficulty, but made up his mind to watch for an opportunity, or make one. First of all, he made a thorough survey of Monganamu, their present fortress, not for the purpose of defence, but of escape. The Major, John, Robert, Paganel and himself made an exact map of the mountain. They noted the direction, outlet, and inclination of the paths, the ridge, a mile in length, 
which united Manganamu to the Wahiti chain, had a downward inclination. Its slope, narrow and jagged though it was, appeared the only practicable route. If they made good their escape at all, if they could do this without observation, under cover of night, they might possibly reach the deep valleys of the range and put the Maoris off the scent. But there were dangers in this route. The last part of it was within pistol shot of natives posted on the lower slopes. Already, when they ventured on the exposed part of the crest, they were saluted with a hail of shot which did not reach them. Some gun wads, carried by the wind, fell beside them. They were made of printed paper, which Paganel picked up out of curiosity, and with some trouble deciphered. That is a good idea, my friends. Do you know what those creatures use for wads? No, Paganel, said Glenarvan. Pages of the Bible! If that is the use they make of the holy book, I pity the missionaries. It will be rather difficult to establish a Maori library. And what text of scripture did they aim at us? A message from God himself, exclaimed John Mangles, who was in the act of reading the scorched fragment of paper. It bids us hope in him, added the young captain, firm in the faith of his Scottish convictions. Read it, John, said Glenarvan. And John read what the powder had left visible. I will deliver him, for he hath trusted in me. My friends, said Glenarvan, we must carry these words of hope to our dear brave ladies. The sound will bring comfort to their hearts. Glenarvan and his companions hastened up the steep path to the cone and went toward the tomb. As they climbed, they were astonished to perceive every few moments a kind of vibration in the soil. It was not a movement like earthquake, but that peculiar tremor that affects the metal of a boiler under high pressure. It was clear the mountain was the outer covering of a body of vapour, the product of subterranean fires. This phenomenon, of course, excited no surprise in those that had just travelled among the hot springs of the Waikato. They knew that the central region of the Ika Namani is essentially volcanic. It is a sieve whose interstices furnish a passage for the earth's vapours in the shape of boiling geysers and sulphur taras. Paganel, who had already noticed this, called the attention of his friends to the volcanic nature of the mountain. The peak of Monganamu was only one of the many cones which bristle on this part of the island. It was a volcano of the future. A slight mechanical change would produce a crater of eruption in these slopes, which consisted merely of whitish siliceous tufa. That may be, said Glenarvan. But we are in no more danger here than standing by the boiler of the Duncan. This solid crust is like sheet iron. I agree with you, added the Major. But, however good a boiler may be, it bursts at last after too long service. McNabs, said Paganel, I have no fancy for staying on the cone. When Providence points out a way, I will go at once. I wish, remarked John, that Monganamu could carry us himself, with all the motive power that he has inside. It is too bad that millions of horsepower should lie under our feet unavailable for our needs. Our Duncan could carry us to the end of the world with the thousandth part of it. The recollections of the Duncan, evoked by John Mangles, turned Glenarvan's thoughts into their saddest channel. For desperate as his own case was, he often forgot it, in vain regret at the fate of his crew. His mind still dwelt on it when he reached the summit of Monganamu, 
and met his companions in misfortune. Lady Helena, when she saw Glenarvan, came forward to meet him. "'Dear Edward,' said she, "'you have made up your mind. Are we to hope or fear?' "'Hope, my dear Helena,' said Glenarvan. "'The natives will never set foot on the mountain, and we shall have time to devise a plan of escape.' More than that, madam, God himself has encouraged us to hope. And so saying, John Mangles handed to Lady Helena the fragment of paper on which was legible the sacred words, and these young women, whose trusting hearts were always open to observe providential interpositions, read in these words an indisputable sign of salvation. "'And now let us go to a duper cried Paganel, in his gayest mood. "'It is our castle, our dining-room, our study. "'None can meddle with us there. "'Ladies, allow me to do the honours of this charming abode.' "'They followed Paganel, and when the savages saw them profaning anew the tabooed burial-place, "'they renewed their fire and their fearful yells, the one as loud as the other. "'But fortunately... The balls fell short of our friends, though the cries reached them. Lady Helena, Mary Grant, and their companions were quite relieved to find that the Maoris were more dominated by superstition than by anger, and they entered the monument. It was a little palisade made of red painted posts, symbolic figures tattooed on the wood, set forth the rank and achievements of the deceased. Strings of amulets made of shells or cut stones hung from one part to another. In the interior the ground was carpeted with green leaves, and in the middle a slight mound betokened the place of the newly made grave. There lay the chief's weapons, his guns loaded and capped, his spear, his splendid axe of green jade, with a supply of powder and ball for the happy hunting grounds. "'Quite an arsenal,' said Paganel of which we shall make a better use. What ideas they have! Fancy carrying arms in the other world. Well, said the Major, but these are English firearms. No doubt, replied Glenarvan, and it is a very unwise practice to give firearms to savages. They turn them against the invaders naturally enough, but at any rate they will be very valuable to us. Yes, said Paganel, but what is more useful still is the food and water provided for Karatete. Things have been handsomely done for the deceased chief. The amount of provisions denoted their esteem for the departed. There was food enough to sustain ten persons for fifteen days, or the dead man for ever. The vegetable elements consisted of edible ferns, sweet potatoes, the convolvulus batatus, which was indigenous, and the potato, which had been imported long before by the Europeans. Large jars contained pure water, and a dozen baskets artistically plaited contained tablets of an unknown green gum. The fugitives were therefore provided for some days against hunger and thirst, and they needed no persuasion to begin their attack on the deceased chief's stores. Glenarvan brought out the necessary quantity and put them into Albinitz's hands. The steward, who never could forget his routine ideas, even in the most exceptional circumstances, thought the meal a slender one. He did not know how to prepare the roots, and, besides, had no fire. But Paganel soon solved the difficulty by recommending him to bury his fern roots and sweet potatoes in the soil. The temperature of the surface stratum was very high, and a thermometer plunged into the soil would have marked from 160 to 170 degrees. In fact, Albinet narrowly missed being scalded, for just as he had scooped a hole for the roots, a jet of vapour sprang up and with a whistling sound rose six feet above the ground. The steward fell back in terror. "'Shut off steam!' cried the Major running to close the hole with the loose drift, while Paganel, pondering on the singular phenomenon, muttered to himself, 
Let me see. Ha, ha, why not? Are you hurt? inquired McNabs of Albinet. No, Major, said the steward, but I did not expect. That Providence would send you fire, interrupted Paganel in a jovial tone. First the larder of Karatete, and then a fire out of the ground. Upon my word, this mountain is a paradise. I propose that we found a colony, and cultivate the soil and settle here for life. We shall be the Robinsons of Monganamu. We should want for nothing. If it is solid ground, said John Mangles. Well, it is not a thing of yesterday, said Paganel. It has stood against the internal fire for many a day, and will do so till we leave it at any rate. Breakfast is ready, announced Obinet, with as much dignity as if he was in Malcolm Castle. Without delay, the fugitives sat down near the palisade and began one of the many meals with which Providence had supplied them in critical circumstances. Nobody was inclined to be fastidious, but opinions were divided as regarded the edible fern. Some thought the flavour sweet and agreeable. Others pronounced it leathery, insipid, and resembling the taste of gum. The sweet potatoes, cooked in the burning soil, were excellent. The geographer remarked that Karatete was not badly off after all. And now that their hunger was appeased, it was time to decide on their plan of escape. "'So soon!' exclaimed Paganel in a piteous tone. "'Would you quit the home of delight so soon?' "'But, Monsieur Paganel,' interposed Lady Helena, "'if this be Capua, you dare not intend to imitate Hannibal.' "'Madam, I dare not contradict you, "'and if discussion is the order of the day, let it proceed.' First, said Glenarvan, "'I think we ought to start before we are driven to it by hunger. "'We are revived now, and ought to take advantage of it. "'Tonight,' We will try to reach the eastern valleys by crossing the cordon of natives under cover of the darkness. Excellent, answered Paganel, if the Maoris allow us to pass. And if not, asked John Mangles, then we will use our great resources, said Paganel. But we have great resources, inquired the Major. More than we can use, replied Paganel without any further explanation. And then they waited for the night. The natives had not stirred. Their numbers seemed even greater, perhaps owing to the influx of the stragglers of the tribe. Fires lighted at intervals formed a girdle of flame round the base of the mountain, so that when darkness fell, Monganamu appeared to rise out of a great brazier, and to hide its head in the thick darkness. Five hundred feet below, they could hear the hum and the cries of the enemy's camp. At nine o'clock, the darkness being very intense, Glenarvan and John Mangles went out to reconnoitre, before embarking the whole party on this critical journey. They made the descent noiselessly, and after about ten minutes, arrived on the narrow ridge that crossed the natives' lines fifty feet above the camp. All went well so far. The Maoris, stretched beside the fires, did not appear to observe the two fugitives. But in an instant a double fusillade burst forth from both sides of the ridge. Back! exclaimed Glenarvan. Those wretches have the eyes of cats and the guns of riflemen. And they turned, and once more climbed the steep slope of the mountain, and then hastened to their friends, who had been alarmed at the firing. Glenarvan's hat was pierced by two balls, and they concluded that it was out of the question to venture again on the ridge between two lines of marksmen. "'Wait till tomorrow, said Paganel, and, as we cannot elude their vigilance, let me try my hand on them.' The night was cold, but happily Karatete had been furnished with his best night gear, 
and the party wrapped themselves each in a warm flax mantle, and, protected by native superstition, slept quietly inside the enclosure on the warm ground, still violating with the violence of the internal ebullition. End of section 58 Book 3, Chapter 14 of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Search of the Castaways, or the Children of Captain Grant, by Jules Verne. Book 3, Chapter 14 A Bold Stratagem. Next day, February 17th. The sun's first rays awoke the sleepers of the Maganamu. The Maoris had long since been astir, coming and going at the foot of the mountain, without leaving their line of observation. Furious clamour broke out when they saw the Europeans leave the sacred place they had profaned. Each of the party glanced first at the neighbouring mountains, and at the deep valleys still drowned in mist, and over Lake Tapo, which the morning breeze ruffled slightly and then all clustered round paganel eager to hear his project paganel soon satisfied their curiosity my friends said he my plan has one great recommendation if it does not accomplish all that i anticipate we shall be no worse off than we are at present but it must it will succeed and what is it asked mcnabs it is this replied paganel the superstition of the natives have made this mountain a refuge for us, and we must take advantage of their superstition to escape. If I can persuade Kaikamo that we have expired our profanation, that the wrath of the deity has fallen on us, in a word, that we have died a terrible death, do you think he will leave the plateau of Maganamu to return to his village? Not a doubt of it, said Glenarvan. And what is this horrible death you refer to? asked Lady Helena. "'The death of the sacrilegious, my friends,' replied Paganel. "'The avenging flames are under our feet. Let us open a way for them.' "'What? Make a volcano?' cried John Mangles. "'Yes, an impromptu volcano, whose fury we can regulate. There are plenty of vapours ready to hand, and subterranean fires ready to issue forth. We can have an eruption ready to order.' "'An excellent idea, Paganel, well conceived,' said the Major. "'You understand,' replied the geographer, "'we are to pretend to fall victims to the flame of the Maori Pluto, "'and to disappear spiritually into the tomb of Caratet, "'and stay there three, four, even five days if necessary, "'that is to say, till the savages are convinced that we have perished "'and abandon their watch.' "'But,' said Mrs. Grant. Suppose they wish to be sure of our punishment, and climb up here to see. No, my dear Mary, returned Paganel, they will not do that. The mountain is tabooed, and if it devoured its sacrilegious intruders, it would be only more inviolably tabooed. It is really a very clever plan, said Glenarvan. There is only one chance against it, that is, if the savages prolong their watch at the foot of Maganamu, we may run short of provisions." but if we play our game well, there is not much fear of that. "'And when shall we try this last chance?' asked Lady Helena. "'Tonight,' rejoined Paganel, "'when the darkness is the deepest.' "'Agreed,' said McNabbs. "'Paganel, you are a genius, and I, who seldom get up an enthusiasm, I answer for the success of your plan. Oh, those villains! They shall have a miracle that will put off their conversion for another century. I hope the missionaries will forgive us.' The project of Paganel was therefore adopted, and certainly with the superstitious ideas of the Maoris, there seemed good ground for hope. But brilliant as the idea might be, the difficulty was in the modus operandi. The volcano might devour the bold schemers, who offered it a crater. Could they control and direct the eruption when they had succeeded in letting loose its vapours and flames and lava streams? the entire cone might be engulfed. It was meddling with a phenomenon of which nature herself has the absolute monopoly. Paganel had thought of all this, 
but he intended to act prudently and without pushing things to extremes. An appearance would be enough to dupe the Maoris, and there was no need for the terrible realities of an eruption. How long that day seemed! Each one of the party inwardly counted the hours. All was made ready for flight. The Ajupa provisions were divided and formed very portable packets. Some mats and firearms completed their light equipment, all of which they took from the tomb of the chief. It is needless to say that their preparations were made within the enclosure, and that they were unseen by the savages. At six o'clock the stewards served up a refreshing meal. Where or when they would eat in the valleys of the ranges no one could foretell, so that they had to take in supplies for the future. The principal dish was composed of half a dozen rats, caught by Wilson and stewed. Lady Helena and Mary Grant obstinately refused to taste this game, which is highly esteemed by the natives, but the men enjoyed it like the real Maoris. The meat was excellent and savoury, and the six devourers were devoured down to the bones. The evening twilight came on. The sun went down in a stormy-looking bank of clouds. A few flashes of lightning glanced across the horizon, and distant thunder pealed through the darkened sky. Paganel welcomed the storm, which was a valuable aid to his plans, and completed his programme. The savages are superstitiously affected by the great phenomena of nature. The New Zealanders think that thunder is the angry voice of Noe Atua, and lightning the fierce gleam of his eyes. Thus their deity was coming personally to chastise the violators of the taboo. At eight o'clock the summit of the Maganuma was lost in portentous darkness. The sky would supply a black background for the blaze which Paganel was about to throw on it. The Maoris could no longer see their prisoners, and this was the moment for action. Speed was necessary. Glenarvan, Paganel, McNabbs, Robert, the steward, and the two sailors all lent a hand. The spot for the crater was chosen, thirty paces from Karatet's tomb. It was important to keep the Ojupa intact, for if it disappeared the taboo of the mountain would be nullified. At the spot mentioned Paganel had noticed an enormous block of stone, round which the vapours played with a certain degree of intensity. This block covered a small natural crater hollowed in the cone, and by its own weight prevented the egress of the subterranean fire. If they could move it from its socket, the vapours and the lava would issue by the disencumbered opening. The workers used as levers some posts taken from the interior of the Odupa, and they piled their tools vigorously against the rocky mass. Under their united efforts the stone soon moved. They made a little trench so that it might roll down the inclined plane. As they gradually raised it, the vibrations underfoot became more distinct. Dull roarings of flame and the whistling sound of a furnace ran along under the thin crust. The intrepid laborers, veritable cyclops, handling earth's fires, worked in silence. Soon some fissures and jets of steam warned them that their place was growing dangerous. But a crowning effort moved the mass which rolled down and disappeared. Immediately the thin crust gave way. A column of fire rushed to the sky with loud detonations, while streams of boiling water and lava flowed toward the native camp and the lower valleys. All the cone trembled as if it were about to plunge into a fathomless gulf. Glenarvan and his companions had barely time to get out of the way. They fled to the enclosure of the Adupa, not without having been sprinkled with water at 220 degrees. This water at first spread a smell like soup, which soon changed into a strong odor of sulphur. Then the mud, the lava, the volcanic stones all spouted forth in a torrent. Streams of fire furrowed the sides of Maganamu. The neighboring mountains were lit up by the glare, the dark valleys were also filled with dazzling light. All the savages had risen, howling under the pain inflicted by the burning lava, which was bubbling and foaming in the midst of their camp. Those whom the liquid fire had not touched fled to the surrounding hills, then turned, and gazed in terror at this fearful phenomena, this volcano in which the anger of their deity would swallow up the profane intruders on the sacred mountain. Now and then, when the roar of the eruption became less violent, 
their cry was heard, Taboo! 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 An enormous quantity of vapors, heated stones, and lava was escaping by this crater of Maganamu. It was not a mere geyser like those that girded round Mount Hecla in Iceland. It was itself a Hecla. All this volcanic commotion was confined till then in the envelope of the cone, because the safety valve of Tangariro was enough for its expansion. But when this new issue was afforded, it rushed forth fiercely, and by the laws of equilibrium, the other eruptions in the island must on that night have lost their usual intensity. An hour after this volcano burst upon the world, broad streams of lava were running down its sides. Legions of rats came out of their holes and fled from the scene. All night long, and fanned by the tempest in the upper sky, the crater never ceased to pour forth its torrents with a violence that alarmed Glenarvan. The eruption was breaking away the edges of the opening. The prisoners, hidden behind the enclosure of stakes, watched with the fearful progress of the phenomenon. Morning came. The fury of the volcano had not slackened. Thick yellowish fumes were mixed with the flames. The lava torrents wound their serpentine course in every direction. Glenarvan watched with a beating heart, looking from all the interstices of the palisaded enclosure, and observed the movements in the native camp. The Maoris had fled to the neighboring ledges out of the reach of the volcano. Some corpses which lay at the foot of the cone were charred by the fire. Further off towards the Pa, the lava had reached a group of twenty huts, which were still smoking. The Maoris, forming here and there groups, contemplated the canopied summit of Manganamu with religious awe. Kaikomo approached in the midst of his warriors, and Glenarvan recognized him. The chief advanced to the foot of the hill, on the side untouched by the lava, but he did not ascend the first ledge. Standing there with his arms stretched out like an exerciser, he made some grimaces, whose meaning was obvious to the prisoner. As Paganel had foreseen, Kaikumo launched on the avenging mountain a more rigorous taboo. Soon after the natives left their positions, and followed the winding paths that led toward the Pa. "'They are going!' exclaimed Glenarvan. "'They have left their post. God be praised! Our stratagem has succeeded! My dear Lady Helena, my brave friends, we are all dead and buried. But this evening, when night comes, we shall rise and leave our tombs, and fly these barbarous tribes!' It would be difficult to conceive of the joy that pervaded the Odupa. Hope had regained the mastery in all hearts. The intrepid travellers forgot the past, forgot the future, to enjoy the present delight. And yet the task before them was not an easy one, to gain some European outpost in the midst of this unknown country. But Kai Kumo, once off their track, they thought themselves safe from all the savages in New Zealand. A whole day had to elapse before they could make a start, and they employed it in arranging a plan of flight. Paganel had treasured up his map of New Zealand, and on it could trace out the best roads. After discussion, the fugitives resolved to make for the Bay of Plenty towards the east. The region was unknown, but apparently desert. The travellers, who from their past experience had learned to make light of physical difficulties, feared nothing but meeting Maoris. At any cost they wanted to avoid them and gain the east coast, where the missionaries had several stations. That part of the country had hitherto escaped the horrors of war, and the natives were not in the habit of scouring the country. As to the distance that separated Lake Taupo from the Bay of Plenty, they calculated it about a hundred miles. Ten days' march at ten miles a day could be done, not without fatigue, but none of the party gave that a thought. If they could only reach the mission stations, they could rest there while waiting for a favorable opportunity to get to Auckland, for that was the point they desired to reach. This question settled, they resumed their watch of the native proceedings, and continued doing so till evening fell. Not a solitary native remained at the foot of the mountain, and when darkness set in over the Tapu valleys, not a fire indicated the presence of the Maoris at the base. The road was free. 
At nine o'clock, the night being unusually dark, Glenarvan gave the orders to start. His companion and he, armed and equipped at the expense of Caratet, began cautiously to descend the slopes of Maganamu, John Mangles and Wilson leading the way, eyes and ears on the alert. They stopped at the slightest sound. They started at every passing cloud. They slid rather than walked down the spur, that their figures might be lost in the dark mass of the mountain. At two hundred feet below the summit, John Mangles and his sailors reached the dangerous ridge that had been so obstinately defended by the natives. If, by ill luck, the Maoris, more cunning than the fugitives, had only pretended to retreat, if they were not really duped by the volcanic phenomenon, this was the spot where their presence would be betrayed. Glenarvan could not but shudder, in spite of his confidence and in spite of the jokes of Paganel. The fate of the whole party would hang in the balance for the ten minutes required to pass along that ridge. He felt the beating of Lady Helena's heart as she clung to his arm. He had no thought of turning back, neither had John. The young captain, followed closely by the whole party, and protected by the intense darkness, crept along the ridge, stopping when some loose stones rolled to the bottom. If the savages were still in the ambush below, these unusual sounds might provoke from both sides a dangerous fusillade. But speed was impossible in their serpent-like progress down this sloping crest. When John Mangles had reached the lowest point, he was scarcely twenty-five feet from the plateau, where the natives were encamped the night before. And then the ridge rose again, pretty steeply, toward a wood for about a quarter of a mile. All this lower part was crossed without molestation, and they commenced the ascent in silence. The clump of bush was invisible, though they knew it was there, and but for the possibility of an ambush, Glenarvan counted on being safe when the party arrived at that point. But he observed that after this point they were no longer protected by the taboo. The ascending ridge belonged not to the Maganamu, but to the mountain system of the eastern side of Lake Tapo, so that they had not only pistol shots, but hand-to-hand -hand fighting to fear. For ten minutes the little band ascended by insensible degrees, toward the higher tableland. John could not discern the dark wood, but he knew it ought to be within two hundred feet. Suddenly he stopped, almost retreated. He fancied he heard something in the darkness. His stoppage interrupted the march of those behind. He remained motionless long enough to alarm his companions. They waited with unspeakable anxiety, wondering if they were doomed to retrace their steps and return to the summit of Maganamu. But John, finding that the noise was not repeated, resumed the ascent of the narrow path of the ridge. Soon they perceived the shadowy outline of the wood showing faintly through the darkness. A few more steps, and they were hid from the sight in the thick foliage of the trees. End of Book 3, Chapter 14。Book 3, Chapter 15 of In Search of the Castaways。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Search of the Castaways or the Children of Captain Grant by Jules Verne. Book 3. CHAPTER Fifteen, FROM PERIL TO SAFETY The night favoured their escape, and prudence urged them to lose no time in getting away from the fatal neighbourhood of Lake Taupo. Paganel took the post of leader, and his wonderful instinct shone out anew in this difficult mountain journey. His nyctalopia was a great advantage, his cat-like sight enabling him to distinguish the smallest object in the deepest gloom. For three hours they walked on without halting along the far-reaching slope of the eastern side. Paganel kept a little to the southeast, in order to make use of a narrow passage between the Kaimawana and the Wahiti ranges, through which the road from Hawke's Bay to Auckland passes. Once through that gorge, his plan was to keep off the road, and under the shelter of the high ranges, march to the coast across the inhabited regions of the province. At nine o'clock in the morning they had made twelve miles in twelve hours. The courageous women could not be pressed further, and besides, the locality was suitable for camping the fugitives had reached the pass that separates the two chains. 
Paganel, map in hand, made a loop toward the northeast, and at ten o'clock the little party reached a sort of redan, formed by a projecting rock. The provisions were brought out, and justice was done to their meal. Mary Grant and the Major, who had not thought highly of the edible fern till then, now ate of it heartily. The halt lasted till two o'clock in the afternoon, then they resumed their journey, and in the evening they stopped eight miles from the mountains, and required no persuasion to sleep in the open air. Next day was one of serious difficulties. Their route lay across this wondrous region of volcanic lakes, geysers, and sulfataras, which extended to the east of the Wahiti ranges. It is a country more pleasant for the eye to ramble over than for the limbs. Every quarter of a mile they had to turn aside or go around for some obstacle, and thus incurred great fatigue. But what a strange sight met their eyes! What infinite variety nature lavishes on her great panoramas! On this vast expanse of twenty miles square, the subterranean forces had a field for the display of all their varied effects. Salt springs, of singular transparency, peopled by myriads of insects, sprang up from thickets of tea-tree scrub. They diffused a powerful odor of burnt powder, and scattered on the ground a white sediment like dazzling snow. The limpid waters were nearly at boiling point, while some neighboring springs spread out like sheets of glass. Gigantic tree-ferns grew beside them, in conditions analogous to those of the Silurian vegetation. On every side jets of water rose like park fountains, out of a sea of vapor, some of them continuous, others intermittent, as if a capricious Pluto controlled their movements. They rose like an amphitheatre on natural terraces, their waters gradually flowed together under folds of white smoke, and corroding the edges of the semi-transparent steps of this gigantic staircase. They fed whole lakes with their boiling torrents. Farther still, beyond the hot springs and tumultuous geysers, came the sulfateras. The ground looked as if covered with large pustules. These were slumbering craters full of cracks and fissures from which rose various gases. The air was saturated with the acrid and unpleasant odor of sulphur acid. The ground was encrusted with sulphur and crystalline concretions. All this incalculable wealth had been accumulating for centuries, and if the sulphur beds of Sicily should ever be exhausted, it is here, in this little-known district of New Zealand, that supplies must be sought. The fatigue in travelling in such a country as this will be best understood. Camping was very difficult, and the sportsmen of the party shot nothing worthy of Albanet's skill, so that they had generally to contend themselves with fern and sweet potato, a poor diet which was scarcely sufficient to recruit the exhausted strength of the little party, who were all anxious to escape from this barren region. But four days at least must elapse before they could hope to leave it. On February 23rd, at a distance of fifty miles from Monganamu, Glenarvan called a halt, and camped at the foot of a nameless mountain, marked on Paganel's map. The wooded plains stretched away from sight, and great forests appeared on the horizon. That day McNabbs and Robert killed three kiwis, which filled the chief place on their table. Not for long, however, for in a few moments they were all consumed from the beaks to the claws. At dessert, between the potatoes and sweet potatoes, Paganel moved a resolution which was carried with enthusiasm. He proposed to give the name of Glenarvan to this unnamed mountain, which rose three thousand feet high, and then was lost in the clouds, and he printed carefully on his map the name of the Scottish nobleman. It would be idle to narrate all the monotonous and uninteresting details of the rest of the journey. Only two or three occurrences of any importance took place on the way from the lakes to the Pacific Ocean. The march was all day long across forests and plains. John took observance of the sun and stars. Neither heat nor rain increased the discomfort of the journey, but the travellers were so reduced by the trials they had undergone, that they made very slow progress, and they longed to arrive at the mission station. They still chatted, but the conversation had ceased to be general. The little party broke up into groups, attracted to each other, not by narrow sympathies, but by a more personal communion of ideas. Glenarvan generally walked alone. His mind seemed to recur to his unfortunate crew, as he drew nearer to the sea. He apparently lost sight of the dangers which lay before them on their way to Auckland, in the thought of his massacred men, the horrible picture haunted him. Harry Grant was never spoken of. They were no longer in a position to make any effort on his behalf. If his name was uttered at all, it was between his daughter and John Mangles. John had never reminded Mary of what she had said to him on that last night at Ware Atoa. He was too wise to take advantage of a word spoken in a moment of despair. When he mentioned Captain Grant, John always spoke of further search. 
he assured Mary that Glenarvan would re-embark in the enterprise. He persistently returned to the fact that the authenticity of the document was indisputable, and that therefore Harry Grant was somewhere to be found, and that they would find him if they had to try all over the world. Mary drank in his words, and she and John, united by the same thought, cherished the same hope. Often Lady Helena joined in the conversation, but she did not participate in their illusions, though she refrained from chilling their enthusiasm. McNabbs, Robert, Wilson, and Mulrady kept up their hunting parties, without going far from the rest, and each one furnished his quota of game. Paganel, arrayed in his flax mat, kept himself aloof, in a silent and pensive mood. And yet it is only justice to say, in spite of the general rule that, in the midst of trials, dangers, fatigues, and privations, the most amiable dispositions become ruffled and embittered, all our travellers were united, devoted, ready to die for one another. On the 25th of February their progress was stopped by a river which answered to the Wakari on Paganel's map, and was easily forded. For two days plains of low scrub succeeded each other without interruption. Half the distance from Lake Taupo to the coast had been traversed without accident, though not without fatigue. The scene changed to immense and interminable forests, which reminded them of Australia, but here the cowry took the place of the eucalyptus. Although their enthusiasm had been incessantly called forth during their four months' journey, Glenarvan and his companions were compelled to admire and wonder at these gigantic pines, worthy rivals of the cedars of Lebanon, and the mammoth trees of California. The cowries measured a hundred feet high, before the ramification of the branches. They grew in isolated clumps, and the forest was not composed of trees, but of innumerable groups of trees, which spread their green canopies in the air two hundred feet from the ground. Some of these pines, still young, about a hundred years old, resembled the red pine of Europe. They had a dark crown surmounted by a dark conical shoot. Their older brethren, five or six hundred years of age, formed great green pavilions supported on the inextricable network of their branches. These patriarchs of the New Zealand forest measured fifty yards in circumference, and the united arms of all the travellers could not embrace the giant trunk. For three days the little party made their way under these vast arches, over a clayey soil which the foot of man had never trod. They knew this by the quantity of resinous gum that lay in heaps at the foot of the trees, which would have lasted for native exportation many years. The sportsmen found whole convoys of the kiwi, which are scarce in districts frequented by the Maoris. The native dogs drive them away to the shelter of these inaccessible forests. They were an abundant source of nourishing food to our travellers. Paganel also had the good fortune to espy, in a thicket, a pair of gigantic birds. His instinct as a naturalist was awakened. He called his companions, in spite of their fatigue, the Major, Robert, and he set off on the track of these animals. His curiosity was excusable, for he had recognized, or thought he had recognized, these birds as moas, belonging to the species of dinornis, which many naturalists class with the extinct birds. This, if Paganel was right, would confirm the opinion of Dr. Hochstetter and other travellers on the present existence of the wingless giants of New Zealand. These moas, which Paganel was chasing, the contemporaries of the megatherium and the pterodactyls, must have been eighteen feet high. They were huge ostriches, timid, too, for they fled with extreme rapidity. But no shot could stay their course. After a few minutes of chase, these fleet-footed moas disappeared among the tall trees, and the sportsmen lost their powder and their plans. That evening, March 1st, Glenarvan and his companions, emerging at last from the immense cowrie forest, camped at the foot of Mount Ikirangi, whose summit rose five thousand five hundred feet in the air. At this point they had travelled a hundred miles from Nonganamu, and the shore was still thirty miles away. John Mangles had calculated on accomplishing the whole journey in ten days, but he did not foresee the physical difficulties of the country. On the whole, owing to the circuits, the obstacles, and the imperfect observations, the journey had been extended by fully one-fifth, and now that they had reached Mount Ikirangi they were quite worn out. Two long days of walking were still to be accomplished, during which all their activity and vigilance would be required, for their way was through a district often frequented by the natives. The little party conquered their weariness, and set out next morning at daybreak. Between Mount Ikarangui, which was left to the right, and Mount Hardy, whose summit rose on the left to a height of thirty-seven hundred feet, the journey was very trying, for about ten miles the bush was a tangle of supplejack, a kind of flexible rope, appropriately called stifling creeper, that caught the feet at every step. 
For two days they had to cut their way with an axe through this thousand-headed hydra. Hunting became impossible, and the sportsmen failed in their accustomed tribute. The provisions were almost exhausted, and there was no means of renewing them. Their thirst was increasing by fatigue, and there was no water wherewith to quench it. The sufferings of Glenarvan and his party became terrible, and for the first time their moral energy threatened to give way. They no longer walked, they dragged themselves along, soulless bodies, animated only by the instinct of self-preservation which survives every other feeling, and in this melancholy plight they reached Point Lawton on the shores of the Pacific. Here they saw several deserted huts, the ruins of a village lately destroyed by the war, abandoned fields, and everywhere signs of pillage and incendiary fires. They were toiling painfully along the shore, when they saw, at a distance of about a mile, a band of natives, who rushed toward them brandishing their weapons. Glenarvan, hemmed in by the sea, could not fly, and summoning all his remaining strength he was about to meet the attack, when John Mangles cried, A boat! A boat! And there, twenty paces off, a canoe with six oars lay on the beach. To launch it, jump in, and fly from the dangerous shore was only a minute's work. John Mangles, McNabbs, Wilson, and Mulrady took the oars. Glenarvan the helm, the two women, Robert and Olbinett, stretched themselves beside him. In ten minutes the canoe was a quarter of a mile from the shore. The sea was calm, the fugitives were silent. But John, who did not want to get too far from land, was about to give the order to go up the coast, when he suddenly stopped rowing. He saw three canoes coming out from behind Point Lawton, and evidently about to give chase. "'Out to sea! Out to sea!' he exclaimed. "'Better to drown if we must!' The canoe went fast under her four rowers. For half an hour she kept her distance, but the poor, exhausted fellows grew weaker, and the three pursuing boats began to gain sensibly on them. At this moment scarcely two miles lay between them. It was impossible to avoid the attack of the natives, who were already preparing to fire their long guns. What was Glenarvan about? Standing up in the helm, he was looking toward the horizon for some chimerical help. What did he hope for? What did he wish? Had he a presentiment? In a moment his eyes gleamed, his hand pointed out to the distance. "'A ship! A ship!' he cried. "'My friends! Row! Row hard!' Not one of the rowers turned his head. Not an oar-stroke must be lost. Paganel alone rose, and turned his telescope to the point indicated. "'Yes,' he said, "'a ship! A steamer! They are under full steam! They are coming to us! Found now, brave comrades!' The fugitives summoned new energy, and for another half-hour, keeping their distance, they rowed with hasty strokes. The steamer came nearer and nearer. They made out her two masts, bare of sails, and the great volumes of black smoke. Glenarvan, handing the tiller to Robert, seized Paganel's glass, and watched the movements of the steamer. John Mangles and his companions were lost in wonder when they saw Glenarvan's features contract and grow pale, and the glass drop from his hands. One word explained it. "'The Duncan!' exclaimed Glenarvan. "'The Duncan and the convicts!' "'The Duncan!' cried John, letting go his oar and rising. "'Yes, death on all sides,' murmured Glenarvan, crushed by despair. It was indeed the yacht, and they could not mistake her, the yacht and her bandit crew. The Major could scarcely restrain himself from cursing their destiny. The canoe was meantime standing still. Where should they go? Whither fly? What choice was there between the convicts and the savages? A shot was fired from the nearest of the native boats, and the ball struck Wilson's oar. A few strokes then carried the canoe nearer to the Duncan. The yacht was coming down at full speed, and was not more than half a mile off. John Mangles, between two enemies, did not know what to advise, whither to fly. The two poor ladies on their knees prayed in their agony. The savages kept up a running fire, and shots were raining round the canoe, when suddenly a loud report was heard, and a ball from the yacht's cannon passed over their heads, and now the boat remained motionless between the Duncan and the native canoes. John Mangles, frenzied with despair, seized his axe. He was about to scuttle the boat and sink it with his unfortunate companions, when a cry from Robert arrested his arm. "'Tom Austin! Tom Austin!' the loud shouted. "'He is on board! I see him! He knows us! He is waving his hat!' The axe hung useless in John's hand. A second ball whistled over his head, and cut in two the nearest of the three native boats, while a loud hurrah burst forth on board the Duncan. The savages took flight, fled, and regained the shore. "'Come on, Tom, come on!' cried John Mangles in a joyous voice. And a few minutes after, the ten fugitives, how they knew not, were all safe on board the Duncan. 
End of Book Three, Chapter Fifteen. Book Three, Chapter Sixteen of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Elmbain. In Search of the Castaways, or The Children of Captain Grant, by Jules Verne. Book Three, Chapter Sixteen. Why the Duncan went to New Zealand. It would be vain to attempt to depict the feelings of Glenarvan and his friends when the songs of the old Scotia fell on their ears. The moment they set foot on the deck of Duncan, the piper blew his bagpipes and commenced the national pibroch of the Malcolm clan, while loud hurrahs rent the air. Glenarvan and his whole party, even the Major himself, were crying and embracing each other. They were delirious with joy. The geographer was absolutely mad. He frisked about, telescope in hand, pointing it at the last canoe approaching the shore. But at the sight of Glenarvan and his companions, with their clothing in rags and thin, haggard faces, bearing marks of horrible sufferings, the crew ceased their noisy demonstrations. These were spectres who had returned, not the bright, adventurous travellers who had left the yacht three months before, so full of hope. Chance, and chance only, had brought them back to the deck of the yacht, the yacht they never thought to see again. And in what a state of exhaustion and feebleness! But before thinking of fatigue, or attending to the imperious demands of hunger and thirst, Glenarvan questioned Tom Austin about his being on this coast. Why had the Duncan come to the eastern coast of New Zealand? How was it not in the hands of Ben Joyce? By what providential fatality had God brought them in the track of the fugitives? Why? How? And for what purpose? Tom was stormed with questions on all sides. The old sailor did not know which to listen to first, and at last resolved to hear nobody but Glenarvan, and to answer nobody but him. But the convicts, inquired Glenarvan, what did you do with them? The convicts, replied Tom, with the air of a man who does not in the least understand what he is being asked. Yes, the wretches who attacked this yacht. What yacht? Your honours? Why, of course, Tom, the Duncan, and Ben Joyce who came on board. I don't know this Ben Joyce, and have never seen him. Never seen him? exclaimed Paganel, stupefied at the old sailor's replies. Then pray tell me, Tom, how is it that the Duncan is cruising at this moment on the coast of New Zealand? But if Glenarvan and his friends were totally at a loss to understand the bewilderment of the old sailor, what was their amazement when he replied in a calm voice? Why, the Duncan is cruising here by your honor's orders. By my orders? cried Glenarvan. Yes, my lord. I only acted in obedience to the instructions sent in your letter of January 14th. My letter? My letter? exclaimed Glenarvan. The ten travellers pressed closer around Tom Austin, devour him with their eyes. The letter dated from Snowy River had reached the Duncan then. Let us come to explanations, pray, for it seems to me I am dreaming. You received a letter, Tom? Yes, a letter from your honour. At Melbourne? At Melbourne, just as our repairs were completed. And this letter? Was not written by you, but bore your signature, my lord. Just so. My letter was brought by a convict named Ben Joyce. No, by a sailor named Ayrton, a quartermaster on the Britannia. Yes, yes, Ayrton or Ben Joyce, one and the same individual. Well, and what were the contents of this letter? It contained orders to leave Melbourne without delay and go and cruise on the eastern coast of Australia, said Glenarvan with such vehemence that the old sailor was somewhat disconcerted. Of Australia, repeated Tom, opening his eyes. No, but New Zealand. Australia, Tom, Australia, they all cried with one voice. Austin's head began to feel in a whirl. Glenarvan spoke with such assurance that he thought, after all, he must have made a mistake in reading the letter. Could a faithful, exact old servant like himself have been guilty of such a thing? 
He turned red and looked quite disturbed. "'Never mind, Tom,' said Lady Helena. "'God so willed it.' "'But no, madam, pardon me,' replied old Tom. "'No, it is impossible. I was not mistaken. Ayrton read the letter as I did, and it was he, on the contrary, who wished to bring me to the Australian coast.' "'Ayrton?' cried Glenarvan. "'Yes, Ayrton himself. He insisted it was a mistake, that you meant to order me to Twofold Bay.' "'Have you the letter still, Tom?' asked the Major, extremely interested in this mystery. "'Yes, Mr. McNabbs,' replied Alston. "'I'll go and fetch it.' He ran at once to his cabin in the forecastle. During his momentary absence, they gazed at each other in silence, all but the Major, who crossed his arms and said, "'Well now, Paganel, you must own this would be going a little too far.' "'What?' growled Paganel, looking like a gigantic note of interrogation, with his spectacles on his forehead and his stooping back. Austin returned directly with a letter written by Paganel and signed by Glenarvan. "'Will you honor read it?' he said, handing it to him. Glenarvan took the letter and read as follows. "'Order to Tom Austin to put out to sea without delay, and to take the Duncan by latitude 37 degrees to the eastern coast of New Zealand.' "'New Zealand?' cried Paganel, leaping up. And he seized the letter from Glenarvan, rubbed his eyes, pushed down his spectacles on his nose, and read it for himself. "'New Zealand,' he repeated, in an indescribable tone, letting the order slip between his fingers. That same moment he felt a hand laid on his shoulder, and turning around, found himself face to face with the Major, who said in a grave tone, "'Well, my good Paganel, after all, it is a lucky thing you did not send the Duncan to Cochin, China.' This pleasantry finished the poor geographer. The crew burst out into loud Homeric laughter. Paganel ran about like a madman, seized his head with both hands, and tore his hair. He neither knew what he was doing, nor what he wanted to do. He rushed down the poop stairs mechanically, and paced the deck, nodding to himself and going straight before without aim or object, till he reached the forecastle. There his feet got entangled in a coil of rope. He stumbled and fell, accidentally catching hold of a rope with both hands in his fall. Suddenly a tremendous explosion was heard. The forecastle gun had drawn off, riding the quiet calm of the waves with a volley of a small shot. The unfortunate Paganel had caught hold of the cord of a loaded gun. The geographer was thrown down the forecastle ladder and disappeared below. A cry of terror succeeded the surprise produced by the explosion. Everybody thought something terrible must have happened. The sailors rushed between the decks and lifted up Paganel, almost bent double. The geographer uttered no sound. They carried his long body into the poop. His companions were in despair. The major, who was always the surgeon on great occasions, began to strip the unfortunate that he might dress his wounds. But he had scarcely put his hands on the dying man, when he started up as if touched by an electrical machine. "'Never! Never!' he exclaimed, and pulled his ragged coat tightly round him, he began buttoning it up in a strangely excited manner. "'But Paganel,' began the Major, "'no, I tell you! I must examine! You shall not examine!' "'You may perhaps have broken,' continued Mr. McNabbs. "'Yes,' continued Paganel, getting up on his long legs. "'But what I have broken, the carpenter can mend.' "'What is it, then?' "'There!' Bursts of laughter from the crew greeted the speech. Paganel's friends were quite reassured about him now. They were satisfied that he had come off safe and sound from his adventure with the forecastle gun. "'At any rate,' thought the Major, "'the geographer is wonderfully bashful.' But now Paganel was recovered a little. He had to reply to a question he could not escape. "'Now, Paganel,' said Glenarvan, "'tell us frankly about it. I own that your blunder was providential.' It is sure and certain that but for you the Duncan would have fallen into the hands of the convicts. But for you we should have been recaptured by the Maoris. But for my sake, tell me but by what supernatural aberration of mind you were induced to write New Zealand instead of Australia. Well, upon my oath, said Paganel, it is 
but the same instant his eyes fell on Mary and Robert Grant, and he stopped short, and then went on. "'What would you have me say, my dear Glenarvan? I am mad. I am an idiot, an incorrigible fellow, and I shall live and die the most terrible absent man. I can't change my skin.' "'Unless you get flayed alive.' "'Get flayed alive?' cried the geographer, with a furious look. "'Is that a personal allusion?' An "'Allusion to what?' asked McNabbs quietly. This was all that passed. The mystery of the Duncan's presence on the coast was explained, and all that the travellers thought about now was how to get back to their comfortable cabins and to have breakfast. However, Glenarvan and John Mangles stayed behind with Tom Austin after the others had retired. They wished to put some further questions to him. "'Now then, old Austin,' said Glenarvan, "'tell me, "'Didn't it strike you as strange to be ordered to go and cruise on the coast of New Zealand?' "'Yes, Your Honour,' replied Tom. "'I was very much surprised. "'But it is not my custom to discuss any orders I receive, and I obeyed. "'Could I do otherwise? "'If some catastrophe had occurred, through not carrying out your injunctions to the letter, "'should I not have been to blame? "'Would you have acted differently, Captain?' "'No, Tom,' replied John Mangles. "'But what did you think?' asked Glenarvan. "'I thought, Your Honour, that in the interest of Harry Grant, "'it was necessary to go where I was told to go. "'I thought that in consequence of fresh arrangements, "'you were to sail over to New Zealand, "'and that I was to wait for you on the east coast of the island. "'Moreover, on leaving Melbourne, "'I kept our destination a secret, "'and the crew only knew it when we were right out at sea, "'and the Australian continent was finally out of sight.' "'But one circumstance occurred which greatly perplexed me.' "'What was it, Tom?' asked Glenarvan. "'Just this, that when the quartermaster of the Britannia heard our destination, "'Ayrton!' cried Glenarvan. "'Then he is on board?' "'Yes, Your Honour. "'Ayrton here?' repeated Glenarvan, looking at John Mangles. "'God has so willed,' said the young captain. "'In an instant, like lightning, Ayrton's conduct,' his long-planned treachery, Glenarvan's wound, Mulrady's assassination, the sufferings of the expedition in the marshes of the Snowy River, the whole past life of the miscreant flashed before the eyes of the two men. And now, by the strangest concourse of events, the convict was in their power. "'Where is he?' asked Glenarvan eagerly. "'In a cabin in the forecastle and under guard. "'Why was he imprisoned?' "'because when Ayrton heard the vessel was going to New Zealand, "'he was in a fury, "'because he tried to force me to alter the course of the ship, "'because he threatened me, "'and last of all, because he incited my men to mutiny. "'I saw clearly he was a dangerous individual, "'and I must take precautions against him. "'And since then?' "'Since then he has remained in his cabin "'without attempting to go out. "'That's well, Tom.' Just at this moment, Glenarvan and John Mangles were summoned to the saloon where breakfast, which they so sorely needed, was awaiting them. They seated themselves at the table, and spoke no more of Ayrton. But after the meal was over, and the guests were refreshed and invigorated, and they all went upon deck, Glenarvan acquainted them with the fact of the quartermaster's presence on board, and at the same time announced his intention of having him brought before him. "'May I beg to be excused from being present at his examination?' said Lady Helena. "'I confess, dear Edward, it would be extremely painful for me to see the wretched man.' "'He must be confronted with us, Helena,' replied Lord Glenarvan. "'I beg you will stay. "'Ben Joyce must see all his victims face to face.' Lady Helena yielded to his wish. Mary Grant sat beside her, near Glenarvan. All the others formed a group around them, the whole party that had been compromised so seriously by the treachery of the convict. The crew of the yacht, without understanding the gravity of the situation, kept profound silence. "'Bring Ayrton here,' said Glenarvan. End of Book 3, Chapter 16
Book Three, Chapter Seventeen of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Elmang in Copenhagen, Denmark. In Search of the Castaways, or The Children of Captain Grant by Jules Verne. Book Three, Chapter Seventeen. Ayrton's obstinacy. Ayrton came. He crossed the deck with a confident tread, and mounted the steps to the poop. His eyes were gloomy, his teeth set, his fists clenched convulsively. His appearance betrayed neither effrontery nor timidity. When he found himself in the presence of Lord Glenarvan, he folded his arms and awaited the questions calmly and silently. Ayrton, said Glenarvan, here we are then, you and us, on this very Duncan that you wish to deliver into the hands of the convicts of Ben Joyce. The lips of the quartermaster trembled slightly, and a quick flush suffused his impassive features. Not the flush of remorse, but of shame at failure. On this yacht, which he thought he was to command as master, he was a prisoner, and his fate was about to be decided in a few seconds. However, he made no reply. Glenarvan waited patiently, but Ayrton persisted in keeping absolute silence. "'Speak, Ayrton. What have you to say?' resumed Glenarvan. Ayrton hesitated, the wrinkles in his forehead deepened, and at length he said in a calm voice, "'I have nothing to say, my lord. I have been fool enough to allow myself to be caught. Act as you please.' Then he turned his eye away toward the coast which lay in the west and affected profound indifference to what was passing around him. One would have thought him a stranger to the whole affair. But Glenarvan was determined to be patient. Powerful motives urged him to find out certain details concerning the mysterious life of Ayrton, especially those which related to Harry Grant and the Britannia. He therefore resumed his interrogations, speaking with extreme gentleness, and firmly restraining his violent irritation against him. I think, Ayrton, he went on, that you will not refuse to reply to certain questions that I wish to put to you. And, first of all, ought I call you Ayrton or Ben Joyce? Are you or are you not the quartermaster of the Britannia? Ayrton remained impassive, gazing at the coast, deaf to every question. Glenarvan's eyes kindled, as he said again, Will you tell me how you left Britannia, and why you are in Australia? the same silence, the same impassibility. Listen to me, Ayrton, continued Glenarvan. It is to your interest to speak. Frankness is the only resource left to you, and it may stand you in good stead. For the last time I ask you, will you reply to my questions? Ayrton turned his head toward Glenarvan and looked into his eyes. My lord, he said, it is not for me to answer. Justice may witness against me, but I am not going to witness against myself. Proof will be easy, said Glenarvan. Easy, my lord, repeated Ayrton in a mocking tone. Your honor makes a rather a bold assertion there, it seems to me. For my own part, I venture to affirm that the best judge in the temple would be puzzled to what to make of me. Who will say why I came to Australia, when Captain Grant is not there to tell? Who will prove that I am Ben Joyce, placarded by the police, when the police have never had me in their hands and my companions are at liberty? Who can damage me except yourself, by bringing forward a single crime against me, or even a blamable action? Who will affirm that I intended to take possession of this ship and deliver it into the hands of the convicts? No one, I tell you, no one. You have your suspicions, but you need certainties to condemn a man, and certainties you have none. Until there is proof to the contrary, I am Ayrton, quartermaster of the Britannia. Ayrton had become animated while he was speaking, but soon relapsed into his former indifference. He, no doubt, expected that his reply would close the examination, but Glenarvan commenced again and said, Ayrton, I am not a crown prosecutor charged with your indictment. That is no business of mine. It is important that our respective situations should be clearly defined. I am not asking you anything that would compromise you. That is for justice to do. But you know what I am searching for, 
and a single word may put me on the track I have lost. Will you speak? Ayrton shook his head like a man determined to be silent. Will you tell me where Captain Grant is? said Glenarvan. No, my lord, replied Ayrton. Will you tell me where the Britannia was wrecked? No, neither the one or the other. Ayrton, said Glenarvan in almost beseeching tones, if you know where Harry Grant is, will you at least tell his poor children who are waiting for you to speak the word? Ayrton hesitated. His features contracted, and he muttered in a low voice, I cannot, my lord. Then he added with vehemence, as if reproaching himself for a momentary weakness, No, I will not speak. Have me hanged if you choose. Hanged! exclaimed Glenarvan, overcome by a sudden feeling of anger. But immediately mastering himself, he added in a grave voice, Ayrton, there is neither judge nor executioner here. At the first port we touch at, you will be given into the hands of English authorities. That is what I demand, was the quartermaster's reply. Then he turned away and quietly walked back to his cabin, which served as his prison. Two sailors kept guard at the door, with orders to watch his slightest movement. The witnesses of this examination retired from the scene, indignant and despairing. As Glenarvan could make no way against Ayrton's obstinacy, what was to be done now? Plainly no course remained but to carry out the plan formed at Eden, of returning to Europe and giving up for this time this unsuccessful enterprise for the traces of the Britannia seemed irrevocably lost, and the document did not appear to allow any fresh interpretation. On the 37th parallel there was not even another country, and the Duncan had only to turn and go back. After Glenarvan had consulted his friends, he talked over the question of returning, more particularly with the captain. John examined the coal bunkers, and found there was only enough to last fifteen days longer at the outside. It was necessary, therefore, to put in at the nearest port for a fresh supply. John proposed that he should steer for the Bay of Talcahuano, where the Duncan had once before been revictualled before she commenced her voyage of circumnavigation. It was a direct route across, and lay exactly along the thirty-seventh parallel. From thence the yacht, being amply provisioned, might go south, double Cape Horn, and get back to Scotland by the Atlantic route. This plan was adopted, and orders were given to the engineer to get up the steam. Half an hour afterward, the big head of the yacht was turned towards Talcohano, over a sea worthy of being called the Pacific. And at 6 p.m. the last mountains of New Zealand had disappeared in a warm, hazy mist on the horizon. The return voyage was fairly commenced. A sad voyage, for the courageous searching party to come back to the port without bringing home Harry Grant with them. The crew, so joyous at departure and so hopeful, were coming back to Europe defeated and discouraged. There was not one among the brave fellows whose heart did not swell at the thought of seeing his own country once more. And yet, there was not one among them either who would not have been willing to brave the perils of the sea for a long time still, if they could but find Captain Grant. Consequently, the hurrahs which greeted the return of Captain Glenarvan to the yacht soon gave place to dejection. Instead of the close intercourse which had formerly existed among the passengers, and the lively conversations which had cheered the voyage, each one kept apart from the others in the solitude of his own cabin, and it was seldom that any one appeared on the deck of the Duncan. Paganel, who generally shared in an exaggerated form the feelings of those about him, whether painful or joyous, a man who could have invented hope if necessary. Even Paganel was gloomy and taciturn. He was seldom visible. His natural loquacity and French vivacity gave place to silence and dejection. He seemed even more downhearted than his companions. If Glenarvan spoke at all of renewing the search, he shook his head like a man who has given up all hope, and whose convictions concerning the fate of the shipwrecked men appeared settled. It was quite evident he believed them irrevocably lost. And yet there was a man on board who could have spoken the decisive word, and refused to break the silence. 
This was Ayrton. There was no doubt the fellow knew, if not the present whereabouts of the captain, at least the place of the shipwreck. But it was evident that were Grant found, he would witness against him. Hence his persistent silence, which gave rise to great indignation on board, especially among the crew, who would have liked to deal summarily with him. Glenarvan repeatedly renewed his attempts with the quartermaster, but promises and threats were alike useless. Ayrton's obstinacy was so great and so inexplicable that the Major began to believe he had nothing to reveal. His opinion was shared, moreover, by the geographer, as it corroborated with his own notion about Harry Grant. But if Ayrton knew nothing, why did he not confess his ignorance? It could not be turned against him. His silence increased the difficulty of forming any new plan. Was the presence of the quartermaster on the Australian continent a proof of Harry Grant's being there? It was settled that they must get this information out of Ayrton. Lady Helena, seeing her husband's ill success, asked his permission to try her powers against the obstinacy of the quartermaster. When a man had failed, a woman perhaps, with her gentler influence, might succeed. Is there not a constant repetition going on of the story of the fable where the storm, blow as it will, cannot tear the cloak from the shoulders of the traveller, while the first warm rays of sunshine make him throw it off immediately? Glenarvan, knowing his young wife's good sense, allowed her to act as she pleased. The same day, the 5th of March, Ayrton was conducted to Lady Helena's saloon. Mary Grant was to be present at the interview, for the influence of the young girl might be considerable, and Lady Helena would not lose any chance of success. For a whole hour the two ladies were closeted with the quartermaster, but nothing transpired about the interview. What had been said, what arguments they used to win the secret from the convicts, or what questions were asked, remained unknown. But when they left Ayrton, they did not seem to have succeeded, as the expression on their faces denoted discouragement. In consequence of this, when the quartermaster was being taken back to his cabin, the sailors met him with violent menaces. He took no notice, except by shrugging his shoulders, which so increased their rage, that John Mangles and Glenarvan had to interfere, and could only repress it with difficulty. But Lady Helena would not own herself vanquished. She resolved to struggle to the last with this pitiless man, and went the next day herself to his cabin to avoid exposing him again to the vindictiveness of the crew. The good and gentle Scotch woman stayed alone with the convict leader for two long hours. Glenarvan, in a state of extreme nervous anxiety, remained outside the cabin, alternately resolved to exhaust completely this last chance of success, alternately resolved to rush in and snatch his wife from so painful a situation. But this time, when Lady Helena reappeared, her look was full of hope. Had she succeeded in extracting the secret, and awakening in that adamant heart a last faint touch of pity? McNabbs, who first saw her, could not restrain a gesture of incredulity. However, the report soon spread among the sailors that the quartermaster had yielded to the persuasions of Lady Helena. The effect was electrical. The entire crew assembled on deck far quicker than Tom Austin's whistle could have brought them together. Glenarvan had hastened up to his wife and eagerly asked, "'Has he spoken?' "'No,' replied Lady Helena. "'But he has yielded to my entreaties and wishes to see you.' "'Ah, oh, dear Helena, you have succeeded!' "'I hope so, Edward.' "'Have you made him any promise that I must ratify?' "'Only one, that you will do all in your power to mitigate his punishment.' "'Very well, dear Helena. Let Ayrton come immediately.' Lady Helena retired to her cabin with Mary Grant, and the quartermaster was brought into the saloon where Lord Glenarvan was expecting him. End of chapter 17 of The Castaways Read by Maria Elmling Book 3, Chapter 18 of In Search of the Castaways this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Search of the Castaways, or the Children of Captain Grant, by Jules Verne. Book 3, Chapter 18. A Discouraging Confession. As soon as the quartermaster was brought into the presence of Lord Glenarvan, his keepers withdrew. "'You want to speak to me, Ayrton?' said Glenarvan. "'Yes, my lord,' replied the quartermaster. "'Did you wish for a private interview?' "'Yes, but I think if Major McNabbs and Mr. Paganel were present, it would be better.' "'For whom?' "'For myself.' Ayrton spoke quite calmly and firmly. Glenarvan looked at him for an instant and then sent to summon McNabbs and Paganel, who came at once. "'We are all ready to listen to you,' said Glenarvan, when his two friends had taken their place at the saloon table. Ayrton collected himself for an instant, and then said, "'My lord, it is usual for witnesses to be present at every contract or transaction between two parties. That is why I desire the presence of Messrs. Paganel and McNabbs, for it is, properly speaking, a bargain which I propose to make. Glenarvan, accustomed to Ayrton's ways, exhibited no surprise, though any bargaining between this man and himself seemed strange. "'What is the bargain?' he said. "'This,' replied Ayrton, "'you wish to obtain from me certain facts which may be useful to you. I wish to obtain from you certain advantages which would be valuable to me. It is giving for giving, my lord. Do you agree to this or not?' "'What are the facts?' asked Paganel eagerly. "'No,' said Glenarvan. "'What are the advantages?' Ayrton bowed in token that he understood Glenarvan's distinction. "'These,' he said, "'are the advantages I ask. "'It is still your intention, I suppose, "'to deliver me up to the English authorities?' "'Yes, Ayrton, it is only justice.' "'I don't say it is not,' replied the quartermaster quietly. "'Then, of course, you would never consent to set me at liberty.' Glenarvan hesitated before replying to a question so plainly put. On the answer he gave, perhaps the fate of Harry Grant might depend. However, a feeling of duty towards human justice compelled him to say, "'No, Ayrton, I cannot set you at liberty.' "'I do not ask it,' said the quartermaster proudly. "'Then what is it you want?' "'A middle place, my lord, between the gibbet that awaits me and the liberty which you cannot grant me.' "'And that is?' to allow me to be left on one of the uninhabited islands of the pacific with such things as are absolute necessaries i will manage as best i can and i will repent if i have time glenarvan quite unprepared for such a proposal looked at his two friends in silence but after a brief reflection he replied ayrton if i agree to your request will you tell me all i have an interest in knowing yes my lord that is to say, all I know about Captain Grant and the Britannia. The whole truth? The whole. But what guarantee have I? Oh, I see what you are uneasy about. You need a guarantee from me for the truth of a criminal. That's natural. But what can you have under the circumstances? There is no help for it. You must either take my offer or leave it. I will trust you, Ayrton, said Glenarvan simply. And you do right, my lord. Besides, if I deceive you, vengeance is in your own power. How? You can come and take me again from where you left me, and I shall have no means of getting away from the island. Ayrton had an answer for everything. He anticipated the difficulties, and furnished unanswerable arguments against himself. It was evident he intended to affect perfect good faith in the business. It was impossible to show more complete confidence. And yet he was prepared to go still further in disinterestedness. My lord and gentlemen, he added, I wish to convince you of the fact that I am playing cards on the table. I have no wish to deceive you, and I am going to give you a fresh proof of my sincerity in this matter. I deal frankly with you, because I reckon on your honor. Speak, Ayrton, said Glenarvan. My lord, I have not your promise yet to accede to my proposal, and yet I do not scruple to tell you that I know very little about Harry Grant." "'Very little?' exclaimed Glenarvan. "'Yes, my lord. The details I am in a position to give you relate to myself. They are entirely personal, and will not do much to help you recover the lost traces of Captain Grant.' Keen disappointment was depicted on the faces of Glenarvan and the Major. They thought the quartermaster in possession of an important secret, and he declared that his communications would be very nearly barren. 
Paganel's countenance remained unmoved. Somehow or other, this avowal of Ayrton, and surrender of himself, so to speak, unconditionally, singularly touched his auditors, especially when the quartermaster added, "'So I tell you beforehand, the bargain will be more to my profit than yours.' "'It does not signify,' replied Glenarvan. "'I accept your proposal, Ayrton. I give you my word to land you on one of the islands of the Pacific Ocean.' "'All right, my lord,' replied the quartermaster." Was this strange man glad of this decision? One might have doubted it, for his impassive countenance betokened no emotion whatever. It seemed as if he were acting for someone else rather than himself. "'I am ready to answer,' he said. "'We have no questions to put to you,' said Glenarvan. "'Tell us all you know, Ayrton, and begin by declaring who are you.' "'Gentlemen,' replied Ayrton, "'I am really Tom Ayrton, the quartermaster of the Britannia.' I left Glasgow on Harry Grant's ship on the 12th of March, 1861. For fourteen months I cruised with him in the Pacific, in search of an advantageous spot for founding a Scotch colony. Harry Grant was the man to carry out grand projects, but serious disputes often arose between us. His temper and mine could not agree. I cannot bend, and with Harry Grant, when once his resolution is taken, any resistance is impossible, my lord." He has an iron will, both for himself and others. But, in spite of that, I dared to rebel, and I tried to get the crew to join me, and to take possession of the vessel. Whether I was to blame or not is of no consequence. Be that as it may, Harry Grant had no scruples, and on the 8th of April, 1862, he left me behind on the west coast of Australia. "'Of Australia?' said the Major, interrupting Ireton in his narrative. Then, of course, you had quitted the Britannia before she touched at Callio, which was her last date. Yes, replied the quartermaster, for the Britannia did not touch there while I was on board. And how I came to speak of Callio, at Paddy O'Moore's farm, was that I learned the circumstances from your recital. Go on, Ayrton, said Glenarvan. I found myself abandoned on a nearly desert coast, but only forty miles from the penal settlement at Perth, the capital of Western Australia. As I was wandering there, along the shore, I met a band of convicts who had just escaped, and I joined myself to them. You will dispense, my lord, with any account of my life for two years and a half. This much, however, I must tell you, that I became the leader of the gang, under the name of Ben Joyce. In September 1864, I introduced myself at the Irish farm, where I engaged myself as a servant in my real name, Ireton. I waited there, till I should get some chance of seizing a ship. This was my one idea. Two months afterwards the Duncan arrived. During your visit to the farm you related Captain Grant's history, and I learned then, facts of which I was not previously aware, that the Britannia had touched at Caleo, and that her latest news was dated June 1862, two months after my disembarkation, and also about the document and the loss of the ship somewhere along the 37th parallel. And lastly, the strong reasons you had for supposing Harry Grant was on the Australian continent. Without the least hesitation, I determined to appropriate the Duncan, a matchless vessel, able to outdistance the swiftest ships in the British Navy. But serious injuries had to be repaired. I therefore let it go to Melbourne, and joined myself to you in my true character as quartermaster, offering to guide you to the scene of the shipwreck, fictitiously placed by me on the east coast of Australia. It was in this way followed, or sometimes preceded by my gang of convicts. I directed your expedition towards the province of Victoria. My men committed a bootless crime at Camden Bridge, since the Duncan, if brought to the coast, could not escape me, and with the yacht once mine, I was master of the ocean. I led you in this way, unsuspectingly, as far as the snowy river. The horses and bullocks dropped dead one by one, poisoned by the gastrolobium. I dragged the wagon into the marshes, where it got half buried, at my instance, but you know the rest, my lord, and you may be sure that, but for the blunder of Mr. Paganel, I should now have commanded the Duncan. Such is my history, gentlemen. My disclosures, unfortunately, cannot put you on the track of Harry Grant, and you perceive that you have made but a poor bargain by coming to my terms. The quartermaster said no more but crossed his arms in his usual fashion and waited. Glenarvan and his friends kept silence. 
they felt that this strange criminal had spoken the whole truth. He had only missed his coveted prize, the Duncan, through a cause independent of his will. His accomplices had gone to Twofold Bay, and was proved by the convict blouse found by Glenarvan. Faithful to the orders of their chief, they had kept watch on the yacht, and at length, weary of waiting, had returned to the old haunt of robbers and incendiaries in the country parts of New South Wales. The Major put the first question, his object being to verify the dates of the Britannia. "'You are sure, then,' he said, "'that it was on the 8th of April you were left on the west coast of Australia?' "'On that very day,' replied Ayrton. "'And do you know what projects Harry Grant had in view at that time?' "'In an indefinite way, I do.' "'Say all you can, Ayrton,' said Glenarvan. "'The least indication may set us in the right course.' "'I only know this much, my lord,' replied the quartermaster, "'that Captain Grant intended to visit New Zealand. "'Now, as this part of the programme was not carried out while I was on board, "'it is not impossible that on leaving Kaleo the Britannia went to reconnoitre New Zealand.' This would agree with the date assigned by the document to the shipwreck, the 27th of June, 1862. Clearly, said Paganel, but, objected Glenarvan, there is nothing in the fragmentary words in the document that could apply to New Zealand. That I cannot answer, said the quartermaster. Well, Ayrton, said Glenarvan, you have kept your word, and I will keep mine. We have to decide now on what island of the Pacific Ocean you are to be left. It matters little, my lord, replied Ayrton. Return to your cabin, said Glenarvan, and wait our decision. The quartermaster withdrew, guarded by the two sailors. That villain might have been a man, said the major. Yes, returned Glenarvan. He is a strong, clear-headed fellow. Why was it that he must needs turn his powers to such an evil account? But Harry Grant, I must fear, he is irrevocably lost, poor children. Who can tell them where their father is? I can, replied Paganel. Yes, I can. One could not help remarking that the geographer, so loquacious and impatient usually, had scarcely spoken during Ayrton's examination. He listened without opening his mouth, but this speech of his now was worth many others, and it made Glenarvan spring to his feet, crying out, "'You, Paganel, you know where Captain Grant is?' "'Yes, as far as can be known.' "'How do you know?' "'From that infernal document.' "'Ah,' said the Major, in a tone of the most profound incredulity. "'Hear me first, and shrug your shoulders afterwards,' said Paganel. "'I did not speak sooner, because you would not have believed me.' Besides, it was useless, and I only speak to-day because Ayrton's opinion just supports my own. "'Then it is New Zealand?' asked Glenarvan. "'Listen and judge,' replied Paganel. "'It is not without reason, or rather, I had a reason for making the blunder which has saved our lives. When I was in the very act of writing the letter to Glenarvan's dictation, the word Zealand was swimming in my brain. This is why. You remember we were in the wagon.' McNabs had just apprised Lady Helena about the convicts. He had given her the number of the Australian and the New Zealand Gazette, which contained the account of the catastrophe at Camden Bridge. Now, just as I was writing, the newspaper was lying on the ground, folded in such a manner that only two syllables of the title were visible. These two syllables were Aland. What a sudden light flashed on my mind! Aland was one of the words in the English document one that hitherto we had translated a terre, and which must have been the termination of a proper noun, Zealand. Indeed, said Glenarvan. Yes, continued Paganel, with profound conviction. This meaning had escaped me, and you know why? Because my wits were exercised naturally on the French document, as it was most complete, and in that this important word was wanting. Oh, no! said the Major. Your imagination goes too far, Paganel, and you forget your former deductions. Go on, Major, I am ready to answer to you. Well, then, what do you make of your word Ostra? What it was at first. It merely means southern countries. Well, and this syllable Indi, which was first the root of the Indians, and second the root of the word Indigenes. Well, the third and last time, 
replied Paganel. It will be the first syllable of the word indigence. And countin, cried McNabbs, does that still mean continent? No, since New Zealand is only an island. What then? asked Glenarvan. My dear lord, replied Paganel, I am going to translate the document according to my third interpretation, and you shall judge. I only make two observations beforehand. First, forget as much as possible preceding interpretations, and divest your mind of all preconceived notions. Second, certain parts may appear to you strained, and it is possible that I translate them badly, but they are of no importance, among others. The word agony, which chokes me, but I cannot find any other explanation. Besides, my interpretation was founded on the French document, and don't forget, it was written by an Englishman, who could not be familiar with the idioms of the French language. Now then, having said this much, I will begin. And slowly articulating each syllable, he repeated the following sentences. Le 27 juin 1862, le 3 mai Britannia de Glasgow, assombré, après une longue agonie dans les mers australes sur les côtes de la Nouvelle-Zélande. In English, Zealand. Deux matelots et le capitaine Grant ont pu y aborder. Là, continuellement en proie à une cruelle indigence, ils ont jeté ce document par de longitude et 37 degrés 11 de latitude. Venez à leur secours où ils sont perdus. On the 27th of June, 1865, the three-mast vessel Britannia of Glasgow has foundered after a long agony in the southern seas on the coast of New Zealand. Two sailors and Captain Grant have succeeded in landing continually a prey to cruel indigence. They have thrown this document into the sea in blank longitude and thirty-seven degrees, eleven minutes latitude. Come to their help, or they are lost. Paganel stopped. His interpretation was admissible, but precisely because it appeared as likely as the preceding, it might be as false. Glenarvan and the Major did not then try and discuss it. However, since no traces of the Britannia had yet been met with, either on the Pantagonian or Australian coasts, at the points where these countries are crossed by the 37th parallel, the chances were in favor of New Zealand. Now, Paganel, said Glenarvan, will you tell me why you have kept this interpretation secret for nearly two months? Because I did not wish to buoy you up again with vain hopes. Besides, we were going to Auckland, to the very spot indicated by the latitude of the document. But since then, when we were dragged out of the route, why did you not speak? Because, however just the interpretation, it could do nothing for the deliverance of the captain. Why not, Paganel? Because, admitting that the captain was wrecked on the New Zealand coast, now that two years have passed, and he has not reappeared, he must have perished by shipwreck, or by the New Zealanders. Then you are of the opinion, said Glenarvan, that, that the vestiges of the wreck might be found, but that the survivors of the Britannia have, beyond doubt, perished. Keep all this silent, friends, said Glenarvan, and let me choose a fitting moment to communicate these sad tidings to Captain Grant's children. End of Book 3, Chapter 18「Book 3, Chapter 19 of In Search of the Castaways」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Search of the Castaways or the Children of Captain Grant by Jules Verne Book 3, Chapter 19 A Cry in the Night the crew soon heard that no light had been thrown on the situation of Captain Grant by the revelations of Ayrton, and it caused profound disappointment among them, for they had counted on the quartermaster, and the quartermaster knew nothing which could put the Duncan on the right track. The yacht, therefore, continued her course. They had yet to select the island for Ayrton's banishment. Paganel and John Mangles consulted the charts on board, and exactly on the thirty-seventh parallel found a little isle marked by the name of Maria Teresa, a sunken rock in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, three thousand and five hundred miles from the American coast, and one thousand and five hundred miles from New Zealand, 
the nearest land on the north was the archipelago of Pomato, under the protectorate of France. On the south there was nothing but the eternal ice-belt of the polar sea. No ship would come to reconnoitre this solitary isle. No echoes from the world would ever reach it. The storm-birds only would rest a while on it during their long flight, and in many charts the rock was not even marked. If ever complete isolation was to be found on earth, it was on this little out-of-the-way island. Ayrton was informed of its situation, and expressed his willingness to live there apart from his fellows. The head of the vessel was in consequence turned toward it immediately. Two days later, at two o'clock, the man on watch signaled land on the horizon. This was Maria Teresa, a low, elongated island, scarcely raised above the waves, and looking like an enormous whale. It was still thirty miles distant from the yacht, whose stern was rapidly cutting her way over the water at the rate of sixteen knots an hour. Gradually the form of the island grew more distinct on the horizon. The orb of day, sinking in the west, threw up its peculiar outlines in sharp relief. A few peaks of no great elevation stood out here and there, tipped with sunlight. At five o'clock John Mangles could discern a light smoke rising from it. "'Is it a volcano?' he asked of Paganel, who was gazing at this new land through his telescope. "'I don't know what to think,' replied the geographer. "'Maria Teresa is a spot little known, nevertheless. It would not be surprising if its origin were due to some submarine upheaval, and consequently it may be volcanic.' "'But in that case,' said Glenarvan, "'is there not reason to fear that if an eruption produced it, an eruption may carry it away. That is not possible, replied Paganel. We know of its existence for several centuries, which is our security. When the Isle Julia emerged from the Mediterranean, it did not remain long above the waves, and disappeared a few months after its birth. Very good, said Glenarvan. Do you think, John, we can get there tonight? No, your honor. I must not risk the Duncan in the dark for I am unacquainted with the coast. I will keep under steam, but go very slowly, and tomorrow, at daybreak, we can send off a boat. At eight o'clock in the evening, Maria Teresa, though five miles to leeward, appeared only an elongated shadow, scarcely visible. The Duncan was always getting nearer. At nine o'clock, a bright glare became visible, and flames shot up through the darkness. The light was steady and continued. That confirms the supposition of a volcano, said Paganel, observing it attentively. Yet, replied John Mangles, at this distance we ought to hear the noise, which always accompanies an eruption, and the east wind brings no sound whatever to our ear. That's true, said Paganel. It is a volcano that blazes but does not speak. The gleam seems intermittent, too, sometimes, like that of a lighthouse. "'You are right,' said John Mangles, "'and yet we are not on a lighted coast.' "'Ah!' he exclaimed, "'another fire! "'On the shore this time! "'Look! "'It moves! "'It has changed its place!' "'John was not mistaken. "'A fresh fire had appeared, "'which seemed to die out now and then, "'and suddenly flare up again. "'Is the island inhabited, then?' said Glenarvan. "'By savages, evidently,' replied Paganel. But in that case we cannot leave the quartermaster there. No, replied the major, he would be too bad a gift even to bestow on savages. We must find some other uninhabited island, said Glenarvan, who could not help smiling at the delicacy of McNabbs. I promised Ayrton his life, and I mean to keep my promise. At all events, don't let us trust them, added Paganel. The New Zealanders have the barbarous custom of deceiving ships by moving lights, like the records on the Cornish coast in former times. Now the natives of Maria Theresa may have heard of this proceeding. Keep her off a point, called out John to the man at the helm. Tomorrow at sunrise we shall know what we are about. At eleven o'clock the passengers and John Mangles retired to their cabins. In the forepart of the yacht, the man on watch was pacing the deck, while aft, 
there was no one but the man at the wheel. At this moment Mary Grant and Robert came on the poop. The two children of the captain, leaning over the rail, gazed sadly at the phosphorescent waves and the luminous wake of the Duncan. Mary was thinking of her brother's future, and Robert of his sister's. Their father was uppermost in the minds of both. Was this idolized parent still in existence? Must they give him up? But no, for what would life be without him? What would become of them without him? What would have become of them already, but for Lord Glenarvan and Lady Helena? The young boy, old above his years through trouble, divined the thoughts that troubled his sister, and taking her hand in his own, said, Mary, we must never despair. Remember the lessons our father gave us. Keep your courage up, and no matter what befalls you, let us show this obstinate courage which can rise above everything. Up to this time, sister, you have been working for me. It is my turn now, and I will work for you. Dear Robert, replied the young girl. I must tell you something, resumed Robert. You mustn't be vexed, Mary. Why should I be vexed, my child? And you will let me do it. What do you mean, said Mary, getting uneasy? Sister, I am going to be a sailor. You are going to leave me, cried the young girl, pressing her brother's hand. Yes, sister, I want to be a sailor like my father and Captain John. Mary, dear Mary, Captain John has not lost all hope. He says, You have confidence in his devotion to us, and so have I. He is going to make a grand sailor out of me some day. He has promised me he will. And then we are going to look for our father together. Tell me, your willing sister mine, what our father would have done for us. It is our duty, mine at least, to do for him. My life has one purpose, to which it should be entirely consecrated. That is to search, and never cease searching for my father, who would never have given us up. Ah, Mary, how good our father was! And so noble, so generous! added Mary. Do you know, Robert, he was already a glory to our country, and that he would have been numbered among our great men, if fate had not arrested his course? Yes, I know it, said Robert. Mary put her arm around the boy, and hugged him fondly, as he felt her tears fall on his forehead. Mary, Mary, he cried, it doesn't matter what our friends say. I still hope, and will always hope. A man like my father doesn't die till he has finished his work. Mary Grant could not reply. Sobs choked her voice. A thousand feelings struggled in her breast at the news that fresh attempts were about to be made to recover Harry Grant, and that the devotion of the captain was so unbounded. And does Mr. John still hope? she asked. Yes, replied Robert. He is a brother that will never forsake us, never. I will be a sailor. You'll say yes, won't you, sister? And let me join him in looking for my father. I am sure you are willing. Yes, I am willing, said Mary. But the separation, she murmured. You will not be alone, Mary, I know that. My friend John told me so. Lady Helena will not let you leave her. You are a woman. You can and should accept her kindness. To refuse would be ungrateful. But a man, my father has said a hundred times, must make his own way. But what will become of our own dear home in Dundee, so full of memories? We will keep it, little sister. All that is settled and settled so well by our friend John, and also by Lord Glenarvan. He is to keep you at Malcolm Castle, as if you were his daughter. My lord told my friend John so and he told me, You will be at home there, and have someone to speak to about our father, while you are waiting till John and I bring him back to you some day. Ah, what a grand day that will be, exclaimed Robert, his face glowing with enthusiasm. My boy, my brother, replied Mary, how happy my father would be if he could hear you, how much you are like him, dear Robert, like our dear, dear father. When you grow up, you'll be just himself. I hope I may, said Robert, 
blushing with filial and sacred pride. "'But how shall we requite Lord and Lady Glenarvan?' said Mary Grant. "'Oh, that will not be difficult,' replied Robert, with boyish confidence. "'We will love and revere them, and we will tell them so, and we will give them plenty of kisses, and some day, when we can get the chance, we will die for them.' "'We will live for them, on the contrary,' replied the young girl, covering her brother's forehead with kisses. "'They will like that better, and so shall I.' The two children then relapsed into silence, gazing out into the dark night, and giving way to long reveries, interrupted occasionally by a question or remark from one to the other. A long swell undulated the surface of the calm sea, and the screw turned up a luminous furrow in the darkness. A strange and altogether supernatural incident now occurred. The brother and sister, by some of those magnetic communications which link souls mysteriously together, were the subjects at the same time and the same instant of the same hallucination. Out of the midst of these waves, with their alterations of light and shadow, a deep plaintive voice sent up a cry, the tones of which thrilled through every fibre of their being. Come, come, were the words which fell on their ears. They both started up and leaned over the railing, and peered into the gloom with questioning eyes. Mary, you heard that, you heard that, cried Robert. But they saw nothing but the long shadow that stretched before them. Robert, said Mary, pale with emotion, I thought, yes, I thought, as you did, that we must both be ill with fever, Robert. A second time the cry reached them, and this time the illusion was so great that they both exclaimed simultaneously, My father, my father! It was too much for Mary. Overcome with emotion, she fell fainting into Robert's arms. Help! shouted Robert. My sister, my father, help! help! The man at the wheel darted forward to lift up the girl. The sailors on watch ran to assist, and John Mangles, Lady Helena, and Glenarvan were hastily roused from sleep. My sister is dying, and my father is there! exclaimed Robert, pointing to the waves. They were wholly at a loss to understand him. Yes, he repeated, my father is there! I heard my father's voice. Mary heard it, too. Just at this moment, Mary Grant, recovering consciousness, but wandering and excited, called out, My father, my father is there. And the poor girl started up, and leaning over the side of the yacht, wanted to throw herself into the sea. My lord, Lady Helena, she exclaimed, clasping her hands, I tell you, my father is there. I can declare that I heard his voice come out of the waves like a wail, as if it were a last adieu. The young girl went off again into convulsions and spasms, which became so violent that she had to be carried to her cabin, where Lady Helen lavished every care on her. Robert kept on repeating, My father, my father is there, I am sure of it, my lord. The spectators of this painful scene saw, that the captain's children were laboring under an hallucination. But how were they to be undeceived? Glenarvan made an attempt, however. He took Robert's hand and said, You say you heard your father's voice, my dear boy? Yes, my lord. There, in the middle of the waves, he cried out, Come, come. And did you recognize his voice? Yes, I recognized it immediately. Yes. Yes, I can swear to it. My sister heard it, and recognized it as well. How could we both be deceived? My lord, do let us go to my father's help. A boat, a boat. Glenarvan saw it was impossible to undeceive the poor boy, but he tried once more by saying to the man at the wheel, Hopkins, you were at the wheel, were you not, when Miss Mary was so strangely attacked? Yes, your honor, replied Hopkins. And you heard nothing and saw nothing? Nothing. Now, Robert, see. If it had been Hopkins' father, returned the boy, with indomitable energy, Hopkins would not say he had heard nothing. 
It was my father, my lord, my father. Sobs choked his voice. He became pale and silent, and presently fell down insensible like his sister. Glenarvan had him carried to his bed, where he lay in a deep swoon. Poor orphans, said John Mangles, it is a terrible trial they have to bear. Yes, said Glenarvan, excessive grief has produced the same hallucination in both of them, and at the same time. In both of them, muttered Paganel, that's strange, and pure science would say inadmissible. He leaned over the side of the vessel and listened attentively, making a sign to the rest to keep still. But profound silence reigned around. Paganel shouted his loudest. No response came. It's strange, repeated the geographer, going back to his cabin. Close sympathy in thought and grief does not suffice to explain this phenomenon. Next day, March the 4th, at 5 a.m., at dawn, the passengers, including Mary and Robert, who would not stay behind, were all assembled on the poop, each one eager to examine the land that they had only caught a glimpse of the night before. The yacht was coasting along the island at the distance of about a mile, and its smallest details could be seen by the eye. Suddenly Robert gave a loud cry and exclaimed he could see two men running about and gesticulating, and the third was waving a flag. The Union Jack, said John Mangles, who had caught up a spyglass. True enough, said Paganel, turning sharply round toward Robert. My lord, said Robert, trembling with emotion, if you don't want me to swim to the shore, let a boat be lowered. Oh, my lord, I implore you to let me be the first to land. No one dared to speak. What? On this little isle, crossed by the thirty-seventh parallel, there were three men, shipwrecked Englishmen. Instantaneously everyone thought of the voice heard by Robert and Mary the preceding night. The children were right, perhaps, in the affirmation. The sound of the voice might have reached them, but this voice, was it their father's? No, alas, most assuredly no. And as they thought of the dreadful disappointment that awaited them, they trembled, lest this new trial should crush them completely. But who could stop them from going on shore? Lord Glenarvan had not the heart to do it. Lower a boat, he called out. Another minute, and the boat was ready. The two children of Captain Grant, Glenarvan, John Mangles, and Pagano rushed into it, and six sailors who rowed so vigorously that they were presently almost close to the shore. At ten fathoms distance, a piercing cry broke from Mary's lips. My father, she exclaimed. A man was standing on the beach between two others. His tall, powerful form, and his physiognomy, with its mingled expression of boldness and gentleness, bore a resemblance both to Mary and Robert. This was indeed the man the children had so often described. Their hearts had not deceived them. This was their father, Captain Grant. The captain had heard Mary's cry, for he held out his arms, and fell flat on the sand, as if struck by a thunderbolt. End of Book 3 Chapter 19book three chapter twenty of in search of the castaways this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by maria elmang in copenhagen denmark in search of the castaways or the children of captain grant by Jules Verne, book three chapter twenty captain grant's story joy does not kill for both father and children recovered before they had reached the yard. The scene which followed, who can describe? Language fails. The whole crew wept aloud at the sight of these three clasped together in a close, silent embrace. The moment Harry Grant came on deck, he knelt down reverently. The pious Scotchman's first act on touching the yacht, which to him was the soil of his native land, was to return thanks to the God of his deliverance. Then, 
turning to lady helena and lord Glenarvan, and his companions he thanked them in broken words for his heart was too full to speak during the short passage from the isle to the yacht his children had given him a brief sketch of the duncan's history what an immense debt he owed to this noble lady and her friends from lord Glenarvan down to the lowest sailor on board how all had struggled and suffered for him harry grant expressed his gratitude with such simplicity and nobleness his mainly face suffused with pure and sweet emotion that the whole crew felt amply recompensed for the trials they had undergone even the impassable major himself felt the tear steal down his cheek in spite of all his self-command while the good simple paganel cried like a child who does not care who sees his tears harry grant could not take his eyes off his daughter he thought her beautiful charming and he not only said so to himself but repeated it out loud and appealed to lady helena for confirmation of his opinion as if to convince himself that he was not blinded by his paternal affection his boy too came in for admiration how he has grown he is a man was his delighted exclamation and he covered the two children so dear to him with the kisses he had been heaping up for them during his two years of absence robert then presented all his friends successively and found means always to vary the formula of introduction though he had to say the same thing about each the fact was each and all had been perfect in the children's eyes john mangles blushed like a child when his turn came and his voice trembled as he spoke to mary's father lady helena gave captain grant a narrative of the voyage and made him proud of his son and daughter she told him of the young hero's exploits and how the lad had already paid back part of the paternal debt to lord glenarvan john mangles sang mary's praises in such terms that harry grant acting on a hint from lady helena put his daughter's hand into that of the brave young captain and turning to the lord and lady glenarvan said my lord and you madam also give your blessing to our children when everything had been said and re-said over and over again glenarvan informed harry grant about ayrton grant confirmed the quartermaster's confession as far as his disembarkation on the coast of australia was concerned he is an intelligent intrepid man he added whose passions have led him astray may reflection and repentance bring him to a better mind but before ayrton was transferred harry grant wished to do the honors of his rock to his friends he invited them to visit his wooden house and dine with him in robinson crusoe fashion glenarvan and his friends accepted the invitation most willingly robert and mary were eagerly longing to see the solitary house where their father had so often wept at the thought of them a boat was manned and the captain and his two children lord and lady glenarvan the major john mangles and paganel landed on the shores of the island a few hours sufficed to explore the whole domain of harry grant it was in fact the summit of a submarine mountain a plateau composed of basaltic rocks and volcanic debris during the geological epoch of the earth this mountain had gradually emerged from the depth of the pacific through the action of the subterranean fires but for ages back the volcano had been a peaceful mountain and the filled up crater an island rising out of the liquid plain then soil formed the vegetable kingdom took possession of this new land several whalers landed domestic animals there in passing goats and pigs which multiplied and ran wild and the three kingdoms of nature were now displayed on this island sunk in mid-ocean when the survivors of the shipwrecked britannia took refuge there the hand of man began to organize the efforts of nature in two years and a half harry grant and his two sailors had metamorphosed the island several acres of well-cultivated land were stocked with vegetables of excellent quality the house was shaded by luxuriant gum trees the magnificent ocean stretched before the windows sparkling in the sunlight harry grant had the table placed beneath the grand trees and all the guests seated themselves a hind quarter of a goat nado bread several barrels of milk two or three roots of wild endive and pure fresh water composed the simple repast worthy of the shepherds of acadia paganel was enchanted his old fancies about robinson crusoe revived in full force 
"'He is not at all to be pitied, that scoundrel Ayrton,' he exclaimed enthusiastically. "'This little isle is just a paradise.' "'Yes,' replied Harry Grant. "'A paradise to these poor shipwrecked fellows that heaven had pity on. "'But I am sorry that Maria Therese was not an extensive and fertile island, "'with a river instead of a stream, and a port instead of a tiny bay exposed to the open sea.' "'And why, Captain?' asked Glenarvan. "'because I should have made in it the foundation of the colony "'with which I mean to dower Scotland.' "'Ah, Captain Grant, you have not given up the project, then, "'which made you so popular in your old country?' "'No, my lord. "'And God has only saved me through your efforts "'that I might accomplish my task. "'My poor brothers in old Caledonia, "'all who are needy, must have a refuge provided for them "'in another land against their misery. "'And my dear country must have a colony of her own.' for herself alone, somewhere in these seas, where she may find that independence and comfort she so lacks in Europe. "'Ah, that is very true, Captain Grant,' said Lady Helena. "'This is a grand project of yours, and worthy of a noble heart. But this little isle—' "'No, madam. It is a rock only fit at the most to support a few settlers. Well, what we need is a vast country, whose virgin soil abounds in untouched shores of wealth.' replied the captain. "'Well, captain,' exclaimed Glenarvan, "'the future is ours, and this country we will seek for together.' And the two brave Scotchmen joined hands in a hearty grip, and so sealed the compact. A general wish was expressed to hear, while they were on the island, the account of the shipwreck of the Britannia, and of the two years spent by the survivors in this very place. Harry Grant was delighted to gratify their curiosity, and commenced his narration forthwith. "'My story,' he said, "'is that of all the Robinson Crusoes cast upon an island, "'with only God and themselves to rely on, "'and feeling it a duty to struggle for life with the elements.' "'It was during the night of the 26th or the 27th of June, 1862, "'that the Britannia, disabled by six days' storm, "'struck against the rocks of Maria Theresa.' The sea was mountains high, and lifeboats were useless. My unfortunate crew all perished, except Bob Lears and Joe Bell, who with myself managed to reach shore after twenty unsuccessful attempts. The land which received us was only an uninhabited island, two miles broad and five long, with about thirty trees in the interior, a few meadows, and a brook of fresh water, which fortunately never dried up. Alone with my sailors, in this corner of the globe I did not despair. I put my trust in God, and accustomed myself to struggle resolutely for existence. Bob and Joe, my brave companions in misfortune, my friends, seconded me energetically. We began like the fictitious Robinson Crusoe of Defoe, our model, by collecting the planks of the ship, the tools, a little powder and firearms, and a bag of precious seeds. The first few days were painful enough, but hunting and fishing soon afforded us a sure supply of food, for wild goats were in abundance in the interior of the island, and marine animals abounded on the coast. By degrees we fell into regular ways and habits of life. I had saved my instruments from the wreck, and knew exactly the position of the island. I found we were out of the route of vessels, and could not be rescued unless by some providential chance. I accepted our trying lot composedly, always thinking, however, of my dear ones, remembering them every day in my prayers, though never hoping to see them again. However, we toiled on resolutely, and before long several acres of land were sown with the seed of the Britannia. Potatoes, endive, sorrel, and other vegetables besides, gave wholesome variety to our daily fare. We caught some young kids, which soon grew quite tame. We had milk and butter. The nardu, which grew abundantly in dried-up creeks, supplied us with tolerable substantial bread, and we had no longer any fears for our material life. We had built a log hut with the debris of the Britannia, and this was covered over with a sailcloth, carefully tarred over, and beneath this secure shelter the rainy season passed comfortably. Many a plan was discussed here, and many a dream indulged in the brightest of which is this day realized. 
I had at first the idea of trying to brave the perils of the ocean in a canoe made out of the spars of the ship. But 1,500 miles lay between us and the nearest coast. That is to say, the island of the archipelago of Pomo too. No boat could have stood so long a voyage, and I therefore relinquished my scheme, and looked for no deliverance except from a divine hand. Ah, oh, my poor children, how often we have stood on the top of the rocks, and watched the few vessels passing in the distance far out at sea. During the whole period of our exile, only two or three vessels appeared on the horizon, and those only to disappear again immediately. Two years and a half were spent in this manner. We gave up hoping, but yet did not despair. At last, early yesterday morning, when I was standing on the highest peak of the island, I noticed a light smoke rising in the west. It increased, and soon a ship appeared in sight. It seemed to be coming towards us. But would it not rather steer clear of an island where there was no harbour? Ah, oh, what a day of agony that was! My heart was almost bursting. My comrades kindled a fire in one of the peaks. Night came on, but no signal came from the yacht. Deliverance was there, however. Were we to see it vanish from our eyes? I hesitated no longer. The darkness was growing deeper. The ship might double the island during the night. I jumped into the sea and attempted to make my way toward it. Hope trebled my strength. I cleft the waves with superhuman vigor, and had got so near the yacht that I was scarcely thirty phantoms off when it tacked about. This provoked me to the despairing cry which only my two children heard. It was no illusion. Then I came back to the shore, exhausted and overcome with emotion and fatigue. My two sailors received me half dead. It was a horrible night, this last we spent on the island, and we believed ourselves abandoned forever, when day dawned, and there was the yacht sailing nearly alongside, under easy steam. Your boat was lowered. We were saved! And, oh, wonder of divine goodness, my children, my beloved children, were there holding out their arms to me. Robert and Mary almost smothered their father with kisses and caresses as he, as he ended his narrative. It was now for the first time that the captain heard that he owed his deliverance to the somewhat hieroglyphical document which he had placed in a bottle and confined to the mercy of the ocean. But what were Jacques Paganel's thoughts during Captain Grant's recital? The worthy geographer was turning over in his brain for the thousandth time the words of the document. He pondered his three successive interpretations, all of which had proved false. How had this island, called Maria Theresa, been indicated in the papers originally? At last Paganel could contain himself no longer, and seizing Harry Grant's hand, he exclaimed, Captain! Will you tell me at last what really was in your indecipherable document? A general curiosity was excited by this question of the geographer, for the enigma, which had been for nine months a mystery, was about to be explained. Well, Captain, repeated Paganel, do you remember the precise words of the document? Exactly, replied Harry Grant, and not a day has passed without my recalling to memory words with which our last hopes were linked. "'And what are they, Captain?' asked Glenarvan. "'Speak, for our amour propre is wounded to the quick.' "'I'm ready to satisfy you,' replied Harry Grant. "'But, you know, to multiply the chances of safety, "'I had enclosed three documents in the bottle, in three different languages. "'Which is it you wish to hear?' "'They're not identical, then?' cried Paganel. "'Yes, they are, almost to a word. "'Well, then, let us have the French document.' replied Glenarvan. That is the one that is most respected by the waves, and the one on which our interpretations have been mostly founded. My lord, I will give it to you word for word, replied Captain Grant. Le 27 juin 1862, le trois mat Britannia de Glasgow s'est perdu à quinze cents lieues de la Patagonie dans l'hémisphère austral. Par terre, terre, deux matelots et la capitaine Grand ont atteint l'île Tabor. « Oh !» exclaimed Paganel. « Là !» continued Harry Grant. « Continuellement, en proie à une cruelle indigence, ils ont jeté ce document par 153 
degré de longitude et 37 degrés 11 minutes de latitude. Venez à leur secours où ils sont perdus. At the name of Tabor, Paganel had started up hastily, and now being unable to restrain himself any longer, he called out, How can it be Isle Tabor? Why, this is Maria Theresa. Undoubtedly, Monsieur Paganel, replied Harry Grant. It is Maria Theresa on English and German charts, but is named Tabor on the French ones. At this moment, a vigorous thump on Paganel's shoulder almost bent him double. Truth obliged us to say that it was the Major that dealt the blow, though strangely contrary to his usual strict politeness. Geographer, said McNabbs, in a tone of the most supreme contempt. But Paganel had not even felt the Major's hand. What was that compared to the geographical blow which had stunned him? He had been gradually getting nearer the truth. However, as he learned from Captain Grant, he had almost entirely deciphered the indecipherable document. Names Patagonia, Australia, New Zealand had appeared to him in turn with absolute certainty. Contin, at first continent, had gradually reached its true meaning, continuel. Indi had successively signified Indies, Indigenous, and at last the right word was found, Indigens. But one mutilated word, abol, had baffled the geographer's sagacity. Paganel had persisted in making it the root of the verb aborder, and it turned out to be a proper name, the French name of the Isle de Bois, the isle which had been a refuge for the shipwrecked sailors of the Britannia. It was difficult to avoid falling into the error, however, for on the English planispheres of the Duncan, the little isle was marked Maria Theresa. No matter, cried Paganel, tearing his hair. I ought not to have forgotten its double appellation. It is an unpardonable mistake, one unworthy of a secretary to the Geographical Society. I am disgraced. Come, come, Monsieur Paganel, said Lady Helena. Moderate your grief. No, madame, no. I am a mere ass. And not even a learned one, added the Major, by way of consolation. When the meal was over, Herogrand put everything in order in his house. He took nothing away, wishing the guilty to inherit the riches of the innocent. He then returned to the vessel, and, as Glenarvan had determined to start the same day, he gave immediate orders for the disembarkation of the quartermaster. Ayrton was brought up on the poop, and found himself face to face with Harry Grant. "'It is I, Ayrton,' said Grant. "'Yes, it is you, Captain,' replied Ayrton, without the least sign of surprise at Harry Grant's recovery. "'Well, I am not sorry to see you again in good health.' "'It seems, Ayrton, that I made a mistake in landing you on an inhabited coast.' "'It seems so, Captain.' "'You are going to take my place on this uninhabited island. "'May heaven give you repentance.' "'Amen,' said Ayrton calmly. "'Glenarvan then addressed the quartermaster. "'It is still your wish, then, Ayrton, to be left behind?' "'Yes, my lord.' "'An isle to ball meets your wishes?' "'Perfectly.' "'Now then, listen to my last words, Ayrton. "'You will be cut off here from all the world, "'and no communication with your fellows is possible. "'Miracles are rare, and you will not be able to quit this isle. "'You will be alone, with no eye upon you but that of God, "'who reads the deepest secrets of the heart. "'But you will be neither lost nor forsaken as Captain Grant was. "'Unworthy as you are of anyone's remembrance, "'you will not be dropped out of recollection. "'I know where you are, Ayrton.' I know where to find you. I shall never forget. God keep your honor, was all Ayrton's reply. These were the final words exchanged between Glenarvan and the quartermaster. The boat was ready, and Ayrton got into it. John Mangles had previously conveyed to the island several cases of preserved food, beside clothing and tools and firearms, and a supply of powder and shot. The quartermaster could commence a new life of honest labor, Nothing was lacking, not even books. Among others, the Bible, so dear to English hearts. The parting hour had come. The crew and all the passengers were assembled on deck. More than one felt his heart swell with emotion. Mary Grant and Helena could not restrain their feelings. Must it be done? said the young wife to her husband. Must the poor man be left here? He must, Helena, replied Lord Glenarvan. It is an expiation of his crimes. 
At that moment the boat, in charge of John Mangles, turned away. Ayrton, who remained standing, and still unmoved, took off his cap and bowed gravely. Glenarvan uncovered, and all the crew followed his example, as if in presence of a man who was about to die, and the boat went off in profound silence. On reaching land, Ayrton jumped on the sandy shore, and the boat returned to the yacht. It was then four o'clock in the afternoon, and from the poop the passengers could see the quartermaster gazing at the ship, standing with folded arms on a rock, motionless as a statue. "'Shall we set sail, my lord?' asked John Mangles. "'Yes, John,' replied Glenarvan, hastily, more moved than he cared to show. "'Go on!' shouted John to the engineer. The steam hissed and puffed out. The screw began to stir the waves, and by eight o'clock the last peaks of Isle Tabor disappeared in the shadows of the night. End of Book 3, Chapter 20「Book Three, Chapter Twenty One of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Search of the Castaways or the Children of Captain Grant by Jules Verne. Book Three, Chapter Twenty One Paganel's Last Entanglement. On the 19th of March, eleven days after leaving the island, the Duncan sighted the American coast, and next day dropped anchor in the bay of Talcahuano. They had come back again after a voyage of five months, during which, and keeping strictly along the 37th parallel, they had gone round the world. The passengers in this memorable expedition, unprecedented in the annals of the Travelers' Club, had visited Chile, the Pampas, the Argentine Republic, the Atlantic, the island of Tristan da Cunha, the Indian Ocean, Amsterdam Island, Australia, New Zealand, Isle Tabor, and the Pacific. Their search had not been fruitless, for they were bringing back the survivors of the shipwrecked Britannia. No one of the brave Scots who set out as the summons of their chief, but could answer to their names, all were returning to their old Scotia. As soon as the Duncan had reprovisioned, he, she sailed along the coast of Patagonia, doubled Cape Horn, and made a swift run up the Atlantic Ocean. No voyage could be more devoid of incident. The yacht was simply carrying home a cargo of happiness. There was no secret now on board, not even John Mangles' attachment to Mary Grant. Yes, there was one mystery still, which greatly excited McNabb's curiosity. Why was it that Paganel remained always hermetically fastened up in his clothes, with a big comfort around his throat, and up to his very ears? The Major was burning with desire to know the reason of this singular fashion. But in spite of interrogations, allusions, and suspicions on the part of McNabb's, Paganel would not unbutton. Not even when the Duncan crossed the line, and the heat was so great that the seams of the deck were melting. "'He is so distraught that he thinks he is at St. Petersburg,' said the Major, when he saw the geographer wrapped in an immense greatcoat, as if the mercury had been frozen in the thermometer. At last, on the ninth of May, fifty-three days from the time of leaving Tocahuano, John Mangles sighted the lights of Cape Clear. The yacht entered St. George's Channel, crossed the Irish Sea, and on the 10th of May reached the Firth of Clyde. At 11 o'clock she dropped anchor off Dunbarton, and at 2 p.m. the passengers arrived at Malcolm Castle amid the enthusiastic cheering of the Highlanders. As fate would have it then, Harry Grant and his two companions were saved. John Mangles wedded Mary Grant in the old cathedral of St. Mungo, and Mr. Paxton, the same clergyman who had prayed nine months before for the deliverance of the father, now blessed the marriage of his daughter and his deliverer. Robert was to become a sailor like Harry Grant and John Mangles, 
and take part with them in the captain's grand projects, under the auspices of Lord Glenarvan. But fate also decreed that Paganel was not to die a bachelor. Probably so. The fact was, the learned geographer, after his heroic exploits, could not escape celebrity. His blunders made quite a furor among the fashionables of Scotland, and he was overwhelmed with courtesies. It was then that an amiable lady, about thirty years of age, in fact, a cousin of McNabb's, a little eccentric herself, but good and still charming, fell in love with the geographer's oddities, and offered him her hand. Forty thousand pounds went with it, but that was not mentioned. Paganel was far from being insensible to the sentiments of Miss Arabella, but yet he did not dare to speak. It was the major who was the medium of communication between these two souls, evidently made for each other. He even told Paganel that his marriage was the last freak he would be able to allow himself. Paganel was in a great state of embarrassment, but strangely enough could not make up his mind to speak the fatal word. "'Does not Miss Arabella please you, then?' asked McNabbs. "'Oh, Major, she is charming,' exclaimed Paganel. "'A thousand times too charming. "'And if I must tell you all, she would please me better if she were less so. "'I wish she had a defect.' "'Be easy on that score,' replied the Major. "'She has, and more than one. "'The most perfect woman in the world has always her quota. "'So, Paganel, it is settled then, I suppose.' I dare not. Come now, my learned friend, what makes you hesitate? I am unworthy of Miss Arabella, was the invariable reply of the geographer, and to this he would stick. At last, one day, being fairly driven in a corner by the intractable major, he ended by confiding to him, under the seal of secrecy, a certain peculiarity which would facilitate his apprehension should the police ever be on his track. "'Bah!' said the Major. "'It is really as I tell you,' replied Paganel. "'What does it matter, my worthy friend?' "'Do you think so, Major? "'It only makes you more uncommon. "'It adds to your personal merits. "'It is the very thing to make you the non-parallel husband that Arabella dreams about.' And the Major, with imperturbable gravity, left Paganel in a state of the utmost disquietude. A short conversation ensued between McNabbs and Miss Arabella. A fortnight afterwards, the marriage was celebrated in grand style in the chapel of Malcolm Castle. Paganel looked magnificent, but closely buttoned up, and Miss Arabella was arrayed in splendor. And this secret of the geographer would have been forever buried in oblivion, if the Major had not mentioned it to Glenarvan, and he could not hide it from Lady Helena, who gave a hint to Mrs. Mangles. To make a long story short, it got in the end to Mr. Albinet's ears, and soon came noised abroad. Jack Spaganel, during his three days' captivity among the Maoris, had been tattooed from the feet to the shoulders, and he bore on his chest a heraldic kiwi with outspread wings, which was biting at his heart. This was the only adventure of his grand voyage that Paganel could never get over, and he always bore a grudge to New Zealand on account of it. It was for this reason, too, that, notwithstanding solicitation and regrets, he never would return to France. He dreaded, lest he should expose the whole geographical society in his person to the jests of caricaturists and low newspapers, by their secretary coming back tattooed. The return of the captain to Scotland was a national event, and Harry Grant was soon the most popular man in old Caledonia. His son, Robert, became a sailor like himself, and Captain Mangles, and under the patronage of Lord Glenarvan, they resumed the project of founding a Scotch colony in the southern seas. End of Book 3, Chapter 21 And This is also the end of in Search of the Castaways by Jules Verne.